Okay, good morning everyone, members in the room and those joining us online. Welcome to this meeting of South Cambridgeshire District Council's Planning Committee. My name is Councillor Henry Batchelor. I'm usually the Vice Chair of this committee, but given the regular Chair, Councillor Pippa Halings, uh, sent apologies today, I'll be stepping in and acting as Chair for this meeting. What that does mean is we do need to adopt a Vice Chair for, the, for this particular meeting. So I've asked Councillor Fain if he would mind and he's agreed. So I just wanted to get committee's agreement that it was okay for Councillor Fain to act as Vice Chair. Agreed. Agreed. Councillor Fain, congratulations on the promotion. <laughs> if you'd like to make your way up to the top table. Uh, whilst Councillor Fain's getting ready, I'm going to run through a few brief housekeeping uh, announcements. Firstly, can everyone in the room note that everything on your desk, including your laptop screen, is likely to be broadcast at some point? The camera follows the microphone um, after it is switched on, so councillors and officers are requested to wait a couple of seconds before speaking to allow the camera to catch up with the mic. If the fire alarm sounds at any point, please do leave the chamber and make your way down the stairs. Do not use the lift. The safe assembly point is next to the marketing suite, halfway along the business park. Can those participating in the meeting via the live stream indicate you wish to speak via the chat column? Please do not use the chat column for any other purpose other than registering to speak. Please make sure your device is fully charged and that you switch your microphone off unless you're invited to do so otherwise. Please ensure you've switched off or silenced any other devices you have so that they do not interrupt proceedings. Uh, as requested yesterday by email, please use a headset if possible when speaking and hold the microphone close to your mouth. When you're invited to address the meeting, please make sure your microphone is switched on. And after you've finished addressing the meeting, please make sure your microphone is switched off. Uh, members in the room, please note that if we do need to vote on any item, we should, we should do so via the microphones in front of us. Only those members present in the chamber can vote or propose or second motions. Uh, committee members present in the chamber, we're now going to do a roll call. So I'll, I will invite each of you to introduce yourselves. After I call your name, please switch on your mic, wait a couple of seconds and introduce yourselves. Uh, so as mentioned earlier, my name is Councillor Henry Batchelor. I'm one of the members for Linton and I am the regular vice chair of this committee. I would now ask Councillor Peter Fain to introduce himself. Peter Fain, Shelford Ward. Thank you very much. Councillor Dr. Martin Kahn. Ma Martin Kahn, Eastern and Impington and Oxford Park Ward. Thank you. Councillor Joyce Hales. Councillor Joyce Hales, Melbourne Ward. Thank you. Councillor Jeff Harvey. Yeah, Councillor Jeff Harvey, I'm the member for Borsham Ward. Thank you. Councillor Dr. Timmy Hawkins. Good morning, everyone. Mike. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Timmy Hawkins, member for Caldicott Ward. Thank you very much. Councillor Judith Ripeth. Good morning. Um, Councillor Judith Griffith, member for Milton and Water Beach Ward. Thank you. Councillor Deborah Roberts. Good morning, Chairman. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Deborah Roberts and I'm the District Councillor for the Foxton Ward. Thank you very much. Councillor Heather Williams, please. Morning, all. Heather Williams and I represent the Mordens Ward. Thank you. And Councillor Dr Richard Williams. Morning, Chair. Um, I'm Richard Williams. I'm the member for the Whittlesford Ward. Thank you. Last but not least, Councillor Eileen Wilson, please. Um, good morning. Eileen Wilson, a member for Cotton Ward. Thank you very much. So the meeting is core eight, so we can proceed. Um, we also have two officers supporting us in the room. To my left, we have Stephen Kelly, who's the Joint Director of Planning. Stephen, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Good morning, everyone. Yes, uh, um, Director of Planning. Plan. I might have a team, team of um, officers, officers on board. board. Thank you very Thank you much. Very much. And, and we have supporting us from a legal please. standpoint, Mr. Stephen Reed. Morning, Chair. Morning, members. Thank you very much. And we also have joining us online our Democratic Services Officer who will be clerking the meeting today, Lawrence Damari Homan. Lawrence? Good morning, everyone. Yep, Lawrence Damari Homan, Democratic Services Officer. Thank you very much. Uh, members, if at any point you need to leave the meeting, uh, do indicate that so it can be recorded in the minutes, please. Um, we'll be breaking regularly as possible, given where we are in the agenda. But if any member feels they need a break sooner, do just put your hand up and I'll do my best to accommodate. Okay, members, we should have the main agenda pack. Sorry, Councillor Roberts, please. 
Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, as we're expecting probably that this is going to be a long meeting, can I have your permission not to wear my mask during the meeting because uh, my lungs are a bit winter, uh, winter affected at the moment. I've brought my inhaler, so if I start coughing, I'll, I'll do something about it. But um, it's a long time probably, and I won't be able to keep up with it. Um, I will wear them when I go out of the room and in the building. Thank you. No, that's fine. Thank you. I'd rather no one kills over during the meeting, so that's absolutely fine. Uh, members, we should, you should all have the main thick agenda pack that will be sent out. Uh, but also a number of supplements, which I believe Lauren, um, not Lauren, sorry, Aaron has just handed out hard copies of. Um, do, do all members have all the relevant bits of documentation? Councillor Hales, you're shaking your head. No, um, Aaron, do we have any more paper copies of the supplements for Councillor Hales? Uh, uh, no, Chair, but we can get more, more copies printed okay. out. Okay, Lawrence, if you're listening, would it be possible to print some out and bring them for Councillor Hales, please? Yes, Chair, I will get on that right away for you. Thank you very much. Um, members, before we start the meeting, um, given the extraordinary nature of this, uh, the two applications we're looking at today, um, I would like to um, essentially formalise the structure of the meeting. And also, given the fact that we, there is a lot of public interest in this, I would also like to uh, initially propose a motion regarding public speakers. Given the fact we usually only have one public speaker, um, but as I said, this is a very sensitive application, so I feel it's probably more appropriate if we allow every member of public that has registered to speak that chance to speak. Um, I think that is the best way forward. Um, so that is a proposal I'd like to make to the committee to see if that's agreeable. Um, would someone like to second that? Councillor Roberts? Members, are we all in agreement for that? Great, thank you very much. Um, also, members, in terms of trying to formalise a structure for today, um, Again, I would like to make a proposal that we structure it in this way. So we have the officer's introduction of the report, first of all, which will be roughly around 20 minutes. We'll then, at that point, have questions of clarity for the planning officer and then also any, um, any supporting officers that we have with us, i.e. drainage, environment agency, etc. Uh, we then go to public speakers, and after that we then go to the debate, which, members, I think you may have seen from an email a couple of days ago, has been grouped for ease. So it be grouped into four different groupings. Um, in the report, it will be sections one and two, then three, then four, five, six, and finally seven to 10. Again, that is just for ease of trying to run the meeting in a fluid way. So again, I would like to make that proposal. I didn't know if anyone would like to second that, Councillor Hawkins. Members, are we generally in agreement for that? Agreed, thank you very much. Okay, we'll move on to the agenda then. So we start with item two. Apologies for absence, please. Lawrence. Yes, Chair. Uh, only apology for absence today is from the usual Chair, Councillor Pippa Halings, and Councillor Joyce Hales has kindly stepped in to substitute in her stead. Great, thank you very much, and welcome, Councillor Hales. Um, agenda item three, declarations of interest. Uh, members, does anyone have any declarations of interest they wish to declare at this point? I don't see any, but of course, if any, anyone becomes aware of any, please do raise that during the meeting. <clears throat> okay, members, we're about to move into the substantive items on the agenda. Um, we start with item number four, which is on page one of our agenda. It's an application for North Stowe Phase 3A, Rampton Road, Long Stanton, Cambridgeshire. The proposal is for, amongst other things, 4,000 homes, two primary schools, a local centre, uh, community retail and associated services, food, drink, community leisure, residential uses and other accommodation, and a raft of other things which will take me too long to read. So <laughs> I will skip over that. Uh, the applicant is Homes England. We have a raft of key material considerations in front of us. The reason it is in front of us today is because the proposal is a very large scale development and it's of strategic importance to the district. Um, the presenting officer is Mr. Paul Ricketts, but before I invite Paul to introduce the report, I believe Mr. Kelly would like to say a few words before we jump in. Uh, thank you, Chair. And um, uh, I'll, be, I'll be very brief. It was really just to highlight the um, availability to members today of uh, technical resources that are not in the room, uh, including 
uh, from my planning team, uh, Mr. Ricketts, Mr. Huntington, uh, and uh, Ms. Brown, and uh, Ms. Kelly. Uh, the um, Environment Agency, uh, Highways Officers, uh, the Education Service, uh, the Lead Local Flood Authority, uh, the Sustainability Officer, and the Housing Officer uh, are available to you online. We're also uh, joined by um, the Council's uh, uh, legal advisors, obviously Mr. Reid, but also um, uh, our advisor from Denton's uh, in respect of um, uh, planning law matters. Thank you, Chair. With that, I'll hand over to Mr. Ricketts. Thank you very much. Paul, good morning. Good morning, uh, Chair. Uh, good morning, members of the planning committee and ladies and gentlemen. I've got a set back so I don't do my <laughs> screen sure. too much. Before you start, actually, can I just make a request to Councillors Handley and Mr Ian Rawls? Would you mind switching your cameras off, please? We'd just like to see Mr Ricketts at this stage. Ian Rawls, are you able to switch off your camera, please? Nothing personal, we'd just uh, like to see the presenting officer. Thank you very much. Sorry, Paul, back over to you. All right, no, lovely. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to open up uh, my screen and hopefully have a PowerPoint on here. Let's see what we've got. Yeah, here we are. Is that coming up for people? Yes, we can see. All right, excellent. Okay. Now, thank you, Chair. You, you've already, and so Stephen set up the um, what the application is for and how it's going to be structured. There are a few things that I will be saying just really to set the scene in terms of the Proposal. I won't read out the full description of proposal, as you say, it is rather lengthy. Um, it's an application that's been subject to environmental impact assessment, and that environmental statement has been assessed uh, thoroughly by officers. And we've been involved with third party and statutory consultees regarding these matters. Uh, this is just an aerial photo so showing the, um, the rest of the site of phase 3A. Phase 3A, I'm just going to go through some of the, the site description and, and surroundings. I won't read the entire thing, but um, nonetheless, it's a site that comprises 210 hectares of land that mostly consists of the southern part of the former Oakington airfield and barracks and the proposed access route. The proposed access route, which is referred to as the Southern Access Road S East, connects the southeast next centre of the application site to Dry Drayton Road. The, the Phase 3A application site is largely bounded to the north by North So Phase 2, to the east by the Cambridgeshire Guided Busway, and to the south by the village of Oakington, and to the west by arable farmland. Sorry, yeah, just a second. Sorry to interrupt. Okay. Yeah. Um, sorry, Chair, it's just... Um, is it possible for the uh, cursor to be changed and indicate exactly what it is it's referring to, please? Yeah, I think if you can activate the laser pointer feature, that would be handy for us. Right. Can you see my cursor at all? We, we can. But it's, not, all? it's not hugely clear. I mean, if you could change to a... There is a laser pointer function. Now you're, you, now you're reaching my... Uh, I think I'm going to get some assistance here. <laughs> I'm going to get some assistance. Oh, oh. Right. Well, I see there's technical support coming, so... Yes, technical so we'll, we'll give you a second. Current slide, yeah, lovely. I'm not sure I'm right click. Right click. Pointer options. Laser pointer. Wonderful. Okay. <laughs> much better. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Right. So where am I now? Um, we have here, in terms of the, the key elements of, of, of the site, you've got Long Stanton here the village here, military lake in here, which is going to be retained with a centre around it. The Oakington just here and phase two is just here. OK, uh, where am I now? I need to now go to the next. Yeah, next slide, sorry. Um, can you see that now? So. Yeah, so it's generally flat land occupied by the former military airfield and a mixture of open grassland, arable land and fields interspersed with wooden belts, woodland belts, sorry, and groups of trees and small watercourses. The lake known as the military pond is located in the southwest part of the site. The North Stowe 
phase two access road known as Southern Access Road traverses approximately north south across the southwestern part of phase 3A. Okay, that's the east road or the west road, sorry. Um, part of the former airfield perimeter road within phase 3A is currently used as a hall road as part of phase two. Let's get phase two, it's in here. What I want to do now is just go to the description of the proposal. Can I get the? Uh... Sorry about this. I'm trying to get rid of the laser now, so I can get back to the the pr the printer. Sorry about this. I'm just trying to navigate through these different screens. I think it's easier for take it off the slideshow, to be honest. Yeah, it's, if you could please, yeah. OK, um, so we've gone through just a, a brief description of the of the application site. This uh, application completes the main site of, so I'm going to go now to the description of proposal. The planning application for North So completes the main site of Oakington Barracks, which was originally identified in the North So Era Action Plan and Early Development Plan documents. The application proposes a further 4,000 dwellings, which would total 9,000 dwellings being delivered on the main former barracks site. A further one, th sorry, the applicant is, is homes doing housing must develop on phase three, 3B, which is subject to a later report uh, in this same agenda. It is considered that proposal comprises sustainable development having regard to paragraph 11 of the National Planning Policy Framework and is therefore recommended subject to necessary safeguarding conditions and the prior signing of the Section 106 agreements. The application proposes up to 4,000 homes in the mix to be agreed with a range of additional works and facilities being proposed to support the creation of a new town. The additional works include the creation of a local centre and mixed use employment zones which support the town centre in phase two. These secondary mixed use zones are located around the perimeter of the local centre along the central boulevard up to the military lake and other anticipated key activity nodes. The total potential capacity for these uses at ground floor in the secondary zones is approximately 13,000 square meters. Two primary schools are proposed, both with three forms of entry and with the appropriate level of sports pitches. The approximate locations of the proposed schools are shown on the parameter plans. If I just go to the to plans as long as I can navigate to this other screen. Yeah, let's get to that. So, so then, yeah, there is. Yeah. Sorry, just going through the. Uh, the plans, yeah, want the space. Navigate with your arrow keys. Oh, with the arrow keys. Okay, okay, thank you. All right, thanks. So the we've got two. Just one for you. The the location of the of the primary schools. Um. Yeah, detailed sighting and design would be determined in conjunction with the County Council's own planning processes. Included in the proposals would be 67 hectares of open space broken down as follows. Outdoor, sp outdoor sport, 13 and a half hectares. Formal children's play space, just over four hectares. Other children's play space, just under four and a half hectares. Allotment and community orchards, just over four hectares. And informal open space, 41 
hectares. Included within the normal, sorry, included in the informal open space are proposals to retain the military lake. I'm using that to, that's my money, that's my transcript to see. Oh, yeah. yeah, sorry. Um, including the informal, informal open space, a proposal to retain the military lake and lake and include a new lake capable of supporting outdoor swimming on the position of the former runway, initially named as the runway lake. The total area of these lakes and water bodies is estimated at just over three hectares. Three buildings are proposed to support the use of formal open space for sport and recreation. It's Eastern Sports Hub, change in social facilities, the Western Sports Hub, storage and toilet facility, and the Northern Sports Hub, change in facility. To the south, a new link road is proposed, known as the Southern Access Road East. If we just come to here. Yeah. Um, between the application site to the south of Oakington, which would also connect to the Southern Access Road west the proposals are set out in three parameter plans building heights movement and access open space and land use land use is one that you're seeing right now then you've got movement and access and then you have the building heights the application is accompanied by the following supporting information which is listed within paragraph 37 of the main report so i won't be reading through that the parameter plans set alongside the design access statement and development principles seek to establish the overall principles underpinning the proposed development whilst allowing sufficient flexibility to enable the subsequent reserve matters application to respond to the detailed considerations associated with each element of the proposals this allows for the general disposition of land uses across the site, layout of routes and infrastructure and key development parameters such as building heights to be assessed and determined at the outline application stage. Within the site, there are four cantilevered pillboxes, which are grade two listed. These World War Two pillboxes are present on the periphery of the former airfield, which occupies much of phase 3A. The southern northern, the southern narrow portion of the site includes Oakington Brick, which flow, Brook, sorry, which flows through this part of the site in a northeasterly direction. The village of Oakington is located to the south of phase 3A and is separated from the site by tree cover and hedgerows around the site periphery. Beyond this, towards the southwest lies farmland and the A14. The A14 it's a key strategic road and joins the M11 motorway two kilometres further to the south. Oakland Business Park is adjacent to the southeastern site boundary. Land to the east and northeast of Phase 3A is bounded by the Cambridge Guided Busway, beyond which lies farmland. Beckbrook is located to the east of the Guided Busway. Phase 2 is located to the north of phase 3A. And this area includes a number of vacant buildings associated with the former Oakland and Barracks, together with graze land and fallow land, awaiting redevelopment, a water tower, and arable farmland further to the northeast. Land to the west of 3A is bordered by the B1050, sorry, B1050, yeah, which runs in north south direction and connects with the A14, approximately 500 metres south of the site. An electricity substation is located adjacent to the B1050 and 40 metres away from the site. Bar farm and, far and cottages are located approximately 400 metres north of the site boundary and adjacent to the B1050. The village of Long Stanton borders the northern section of Phase 3A as well as Phase 2. Other heritage assets in the area include the village pump, All Saints Church and St Michael's Church and the manor, together with the important village setting between Long Stanton, All Saints and Long Stanton St Michael's. In Oakington, Parkland setting of Wetwick Hall is an important heritage asset. Long Stanton and Oakington also contain conservation areas. 
There are a number of public rights of way within the site, which include links between Rampton Drift and Long Stanton to the southwest, to Rampton in the northeast. The right of way, this right of way crosses the Cambridgeshire Guide Busway by an upgrade crossing and also links Rampton to Histon and a footpath running adjacent to Cottenham Load. The byway routes through this phase two site and is currently closed due to construction of the primary road and secondary school, but it's due to reopen in spring 2022. A shared footway cycleway crosses over the, the guide bus route to the south at Westwick. This cycleway forms part of the National Cycle Network Route 51, which leads to Cambridge to the south and Huntington by Over and Swavesey to the north. There is a public byway which routes south of Long Stanton and runs south towards Bar Hill. It's not a, this does not provide a crossing over the A14. The byway links byway link to the northwest via Bridleway, routing along Over Road and Ramper Road, accesses Swavesey and the Ouse, and the Ouse Valley Way to the northwest. The eastern section of Ramper Road from the Over Road Junction towards Utton Strove is marked as part of a long distance footpath where there is no provision for pedestrians. Section one. The principle of development is established through paragraph 11 of the National Planning Policy Framework, which addresses the issue of the presumption in favour of sustainable development in decision making. It seeks to ensure the promotion and delivery of sustainable development, which covers economic, social and environmental objectives. The application proposal is required to meet the up to date development plan policies of the era, which in this instance is the SCDC local plan and the, and the NAAP. Relevant policies for the local plan is S6, the Development Strategy 2031, which states that major site allocations from the South Cambridgeshire Local Development Framework 2007 to 2010, together with the Era Action Plan for North Stowe, except as amended by policy SS5, are carried forward as part of the development plan to 2031 or until such time as the developments are complete. Policy SS5 is a North Stowe extension which states that the reserve land identified in the North, Air, North Stowe Air Action Plan is allocated as an extension to the site of the new town of North Stowe. It will help provide the 10,000 homes allocated in the Air Action Plan at an appropriate density and design and will not increase the overall number of homes. NAAP Policy NS1, the vision for North Stowe, sets out that North Stowe will be a sustainable and vibrant new community that is inclusive and diverse with its own distinctive local identity, which is founded on best practice urban design principles, drawing on the traditions of Fen Edge market towns, which encourages the high quality traditions and, in, and innovation that are characteristic of the Cambridge sub-region. NAAP Policy NS2, the development principle, sets out to deliver the 10,000 homes and other uses in a distinctive town character well uh, an IAP policy NS3 the site for North Stowe defines the boundaries of the site the site is an established part of the development plan and the council's growth strategy and has been for a number of years it is noted that third party comments have been received related to the principle of development and seeking the reconsideration of the allocation and its return to previous master plans which are based on lower numbers of housing to be delivered on North Stowe the current proposal is, however, consistent with the adopted local plan and the current North Stowe Area Action Plan. The proposals are, are seen by office to be in accordance with local plan policies as set out above, and as such, the principle of development is considered to be acceptable. The three submitted parameter, param, parameter plans are based on the, upon the following top, topics, movement and access, open space and land use, and building heights. Its purpose is the purpose for this mission is to detail the key elements of the development proposals and to show how they respond to the environmental constraints of the site and the assessment of the site set out in the environmental statement. Local plan policy NH1, conservation area and green separation at Longston, at Longstanton, states that areas of countryside within the conservation area at Longstanton will form part of the green separation between Longstanton and North Stowe. Other relevant policies are NS4, NS12, NS13, and NS25. Objective C2A of the NAAP is to create an appropriate setting for the new town, minimizing any adverse visual or landscape impact on the surrounding area, 
include the setting and character of the surrounding settlements, in particular the closest villages of Longstanton, Oakington and Westwick, and their conservation areas as well as more distant neighbours at Rampton, Willingham, Over and Bar Hill. The applicant submitted a design and access statement in support of the application proposals. It sets out an illustrative master plan and landscape strategy and establishes a framework of key design principles and is intended for formal endorsement as part of the outline consent. The key defining principles of the design for phase 3A are as follows. A, reflecting site's history by using the alignment of the main airfield, runway and historical routes such as Mill Road to structure the master plan. Marking the site with key gateways and open spaces, creating a strong sense of transition and arrival into the town and towards the town centre in phase two. C, creating confident development edges that achieve a clear distinction between countryside and town. D, retaining appropriate landscape green space between the new development and existing settlement edge of Oakington. E, retaining the ridge and furrow landscape with long, within Longstanton Conservation Area. Facilitating local distinctive buildings and landscape with a sense of place and character that is recognisable from the local context. G, establishing a network of green and blue routes and spaces which draws the wider landscape through the development, safeguards the existing tree belts, creates formal and informal spaces for recreation, encouraged biodiversity and, and enables sustainable drainage. H, introduces a local centre with a neighbourhood park, shops, community facilities and employment in the most accessible and visible location complementing the town centre in phase two. I, creating distinct character areas and variation building forms, heights and densities across this large site. J, incorporating significant existing views and vistas and creating new ones. K, arranging housing to create strong frontages and positive overlooking of streets and open spaces. L, creating a highly permeable movement network which integrates phase 3A with the rest of the town and surrounding area, and promotes active and sustainable travel choices, walking, cycling, public transport. M, promoting innovation, flexibility in car parking provision to accommodate future changes in travel patterns and car ownership. And N, establishing a robust but flexible framework to enable the development to mitigate and adapt to climate change through location, form, orientation, and design of buildings and spaces. Key to phase 3A in the overall North Star development is its relationship to Long Stanton and seeks to reflect the principles established in the phase, phases one and two outline permissions and the, and the requirements of North Star Air Action Plan policies NS4 and NS13. In particular, it seeks to ensure that historic landscapes are protected, that uses are open land uses that protect privacy and amenity with views of St. Michael's Church maintained. Continuing the principles that were established in phase two, the Long Stanton Ridge and furrow fields, which lie at the northwestern edge of phase 3A, will be protected. This will enhance the views of St. Michael's Church from the site. Adjacent to this will be an area of sports pitches, which will be adjacent to the south, to, sorry, to the western primary school sorry, to the site of Western Primary School. Alongside Long Stanton Road, the existing tree belt will be maintained and enhanced. On the basis of this evaluation, it is considered that the relationship of the development with the Long Stanton Conservation Area and St. Michael's Church are considered to be acceptable and in accordance with the relevant policies NS4 and NS13 of the North Zoe Era Action Plan. In regards its relationship to Oakington, this is based on green separation defined by tree groups to shield views, but also through a green corridor, which will aid to the sense of openness. The use of active open space is outlined as supporting and retaining the separate identity of Oakington, whilst ensuring that routes and access are created to facilities and services in the new town. Aspirations for greater separation appear to have arisen as a result oh, of... Paul, sorry oh. again to interrupt. Sorry yeah. to interrupt, Paul. I mean, we, we, we do have this verbatim in our reports. Okay. So I, I think we should assume that we have read the report. There's no need to read it out word for word. I appreciate the enthusiasm, but uh, <laughs> I think assume that we, we have read it. Then, if there's any any other any other highlights on any of the other sections, I think it'd be good to draw our attention to it. But um, to save yourself more than anyone yeah. the time of reading it, I think you can assume that we have read the, the report. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I think what I'll, I'll do then is. Um, 
it moving the way in the sense in terms of the section that we were talking about as as, as key is going through that that first section then i don't think there's if we've read it and we've accepted it key things in terms of transport is that we've had a look at the detailed transport assessment and seeing that in terms of its impact they are acceptable there there's been concern i think in terms of the um i think there's a trigger in southern access road east in terms of and the junction with dry rating sorry dry drayton road let's go through this yes yeah, and it's the concern that Oakington parish council had regarding the previous scheme which had a project junction to the southern access to southern access road it is the detailed design of this junction is still underway and opportunities to optimize routine choices of motorists so as to avoid local roads is still to be explored in either event properties of popular villas on dry and road on dry drayton road to the south of oakington would be affected by a new road layout girton parish council has also commented on nomenclature of the sar the name relates to the geographical relationship to the application site with the approved southern access road west further to the west the SAR will be smaller in scale, likely to be a single carriage road with siphoning infrastructure and other associated works. It is considered that this would create an easier and more convenient route to Cambridge than travelling through the villages of Oakington and Girton. The TA sets out, sorry, the transport assessment sets out measures to discourage traffic travelling through Oakington. There's also a trigger in terms of occupation for dwellings prior to this road being looked at and designed some like 3,000 and some like 3,000 dwellings and that could be some like 10, 15 years. So it could be that when we review this matter, it's something that may not be necessary in the in the long run. And this is what we're hoping for in terms of modal shifts. The delivery of this R will be secured by planning condition 17 Southern Access Road East. Just going to just go through. Yeah, based upon an assessment of the estimate of the submitted environmental statement and transport assessment and associated proposed mitigation measures and taking all other comments into account, it is considered that the developments provide an appropriate provision to encourage future residents to use modes of transport other than the car and subject to monitoring will satisfactorily mitigate the impact of the development on the surrounding villages and roads in accordance with the NPPF and policy T12 of the local plan. I'm going to fly through the employment assessment. As we said, we, it's something that the members have had a chance to read through. Key thing on the employment is that this is about job numbers rather than just a land provision. We're talking about 20 hectares of employment land, but really this is about how many jobs that we can create and deliver. That's through NAP, NAP policy NS8 and D4. The affordable housing. And there's a local centre that will be will be provided, which will identify the number and scale of local centres across North So and the role these play in the wider town. That's policy NAAP, policy NS6. The proposals for local centre are considered to contribute towards meeting the aims and objectives of NAAP policy NS6 by delivering a local centre close to the local busway within reasonable walking distance for local residents. which will meet day to day needs of local residents for convenient shopping and service provision will also act as a focus for small scale local employment complemented by the provision of outdoor space and appropriate design principles. The local centre should also assist in supporting community development activities across 3A. As regard housing delivery, the scheme will deliver a mix of units and provide 40% affordable housing. The mix is to be agreed. It will be at a density of 40 dwellings per hectare overall and meets the policy requirements of housing mix and the different kinds of housing that we will require. Policy H9 requires at least 30% of the dwellings to be one to two bedrooms, 30% at least to be three bedrooms, and at least 30% to be four, over four bedrooms. That's, market, that's the market housing mix for, for market homes. 
there's a 10% flexibility allowance included in any of these categories taking account of local circumstances. There will be housing provision for older people and a housing delivery statement will be provided as part of the scheme. The affordable housing statement seeks to deliver 40% and that's 50% affordable rent, 20% shared ownership, 10% discount market sale and 20% rent to buy. These tenures fall within the, def the definition of affordable housing as defined in the National Planning Policy Framework and has been accepted by the Council's Joint Housing Development Officer. The proposed affordable housing provision will meet the policy target of 40% affordable housing and has an agreed mix of housing tenures in accordance with policy H10, 1A and 1B of the local plan. All the internal and external space standards are accepted to meet the Council's adopted standards. I'm just going to go through now to the key element, which is the conclusion of the scheme. Sorry, everyone, it's just trying to summarise this rather lengthy scheme. Actually, yeah, can... Just to reiterate, we do have a lot of the information you're reading out in front of us, uh, okay. word for word. So if there's any, any highlights of any particular sections you want to draw our attention to, I think that will be a lot more time saving. So, sorry. Okay. Just... Yeah, to... sorry. So I'll just say, yeah, so... Um, okay, sorry, recommending... sorry again, Paul. I think Mr. Kelly wants to come in. Okay, pick up. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think to, to, assist the, to assist the committee, um, really, and uh, I'm conscious that we've, we've got public speakers here who also will, will, will want to comment. Um, perhaps if I could just uh, helpfully um, uh, move, move things on uh, for, for your benefit. Um, clearly what Mr Ricketts has done is outlined the principles of the development, um, the guiding design principles that are set out uh, in the report, uh, which he has referred to. Uh, and um, reinforce the point around the 40% uh, affordable housing and the, and the housing mix. I think the, um, the report, uh, we, we walked through the three parameter plans that form the cornerstone of the, of the planning commission. Uh, and what the report um, uh, does is highlight uh, the, the key elements in those plans around uh, the current one that you can see on the screen surrounding building height and scale. Um, but the movement framework, uh, and uh, Mr Ricketts has referred to uh, the relationship with um, uh, the Southern Access Relief, uh, Southern Access Road East, but also the existing and indeed nearing completion um, Access Road West, which is currently the main uh, and considered to be likely the main uh, source of access into the site. He's also highlighted the interplay with the um, uh, Phase 2 development uh, immediately adjacent uh, and started to summarise some of the um, infrastructure facilities that are associated with it. I think where the report obviously goes to, and members will be familiar with this, uh, is um, uh, on top of what the proposal is, there are a number of substantive material considerations which are summarised at the beginning, uh, which Mr Ricketts hasn't had a chance yet to cover, but which in the interests of brevity perhaps I can, I can just walk you through uh, um, uh, for your benefit and clearly um, you can see clarifications through the questions if asked. What the report does draw your attention to uh, is um, uh, the environmental assessment uh, and the associated technical appraisals that have been done. And we have today the transport um, uh, team from the County Council who've been closely involved in that. Um, but more significantly, and particularly having regard to the concerns that have been expressed by a number of residents uh, and in the representations, and I'm sure some of the representations you'll hear today, uh, are the um, environmental consequences um, uh, that have been explored and the environmental issues that have been explored as part of the application uh, itself. Um, those elements are covered, uh, and forgive me a second, I'll just refer you to the, they start being um, uh, addressed uh, in the um, assessments on page uh, section seven. Um, uh, although, uh, uh, and boil down towards concerns uh, that are highlighted, not only about conventional, this is page 69, sorry, uh, not only the conventional concerns associated with construction, 
uh, and the impacts on um, that you will all be familiar with around uh, the construction activity and the impact upon local residents through noise, dust, uh, and odour, uh, etc. Um, but more uh, specifically, uh, and, and uh, the heritage, but more specifically the concerns around um, the sensitivities to drainage, uh, the management of water, including the implications uh, for groundwater, uh, which um, the late uh, and uh, late representations, but also the representations that you have uh, received in the PACs uh, refer to, uh, and concerns about the wider um, demands that the development will make uh, on, for example, uh, water abstraction across Greater Cambridge uh, and uh, water, water quality. Now, um, what we have sought to try and do, uh, and, um, uh, and to assist you, I'm just trying to find the page reference number, forgive me, but what we've sought to try and do uh, is to draw those threads together for you uh, in the assessment of the planning balance which takes place uh, on page 114. Uh, and, um, members, simply uh, your role, having considered, and I'm sure uh, you're familiar with the report, but having considered the um, uh, elements of compliance with the development plan that Mr. Ricketts and the report have highlighted, um, but also the uh, environmental and physical consequences of the development, uh, what the report seeks to, to do on page 114 uh, onwards is start to play in the balancing exercise, uh, which is an important part of uh, the pros and cons, one could say, but important part of weighing up the overall merits uh, of this application, having regard to the development plan uh, and uh, the wide range of material considerations that the report highlights. Chair, I think that's probably, um, I'm conscious of uh, wanting to hear from uh, public speakers and from members uh, in terms of clarification but I hope that's helpful to you. That's very helpful. Thank you for that, Stephen. Um, members, as we agreed at the start, we now have an opportunity to ask any questions of clarification for either the case officers or equally any of the, um, of the consultees that we have uh, online joining us today. So, members, obviously, you know, if something does come to us later on in the, in the debate, obviously we can ask it then, but if there's any questions of clarification, at this point now, um, it would be a good chance to ask. So I have one straight away from Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, a, a few questions uh, initially. Just about the affordable housing, what contribution this gives us on the whole of North Stowe? Um, because it's obviously come in parcels, so just want to know where our, our figures are there. Um, the other thing, and looking at the consultation, um, paragraph 95 um, issues been raised about housing heights. Is there anything in, in what's been put forward that would be considered um, out, of, out of policy? Um, there's numerous objections, but one in particular is the one from Girton Parish Council um, about access, the Southern Access Road. If we could just have perhaps some support on why, um, where that conflict is and what's been proposed by themselves. You know, a viewpoint on that. Um, I think I think that's all I've got for now, Chair. There may be more throughout the day. Okay, okay. So we've got three questions there. Um, one on the percentage of social housing over the entirety of North Stoke. We include this application today. A uh, question around housing heights and concerns raised there, and then also some clarity on one of the parish council's comments on the Southern Access Route. Uh, I'm not sure who wants to take those. I think Mr. Kelly is volunteering. Thank you, Chair. If I perhaps just um, uh, deal with the question about affordable housing um, uh, in the first instance. Uh, just for your information, the affordable housing levels are obviously uh, quoted in the report and are 40% on this phase of development. The previous phase two uh, also uh, delivered 40%, but as part of the government's initiative, uh, there was a substantial portion of starter homes as part of the, that in, in accordance with um, uh, the guidance at the time. Phase one provides 20% uh, affordable housing uh, and um, uh, the expiration of uh, the justification for that through viability took place at that time. What that means in numbers terms uh, is uh, phase one should be delivering 300 or so affordable units, phase two uh, 1,400 affordable units 
and a consequence of, in a sense, the, the size of um, uh, phase three, taken together with phase three B, I should, I should say, uh, is in the order of 2,000 units. So um, 3,700 units uh, across the 10,000 units uh, in North Stowe are at this stage envisaged to be um, affordable. Uh, and by my um, O-level maths, that equates to around 37%. Um, I think uh, the question around um, building heights and, and, and so on, I think the report does cover the issue in, uh, about the sensitivity of the relationship with Oakington particularly, um, and the staircasing down from three uh, to two stories in the parameter plan, which um, Mr. Ricketts might be able to uh, display. Um, there are elements within the site in the uh, indicative um, uh, parameter plan uh, around particularly the proximity to the military lake, which is suggested to be up to seven stories in height, reflecting the kind of um, uh, fundamental, uh, important role that that uh, amenity, but also that feature will play uh, uh, for residents uh, in uh, phase, phase three. I think if I could ask um, uh, someone from the County Highways uh, Department to comment in relation to the access road issue, that's probably assist you better than me commenting. Thank you. Do we have someone from Highways? Mr. Tuttle? Yes, <laughs> I'm here. Good. Uh, can you good, hear? good to see you. Yes, we can hear you quite faint. I don't know if you can oh, lean any okay. closer is in. That, is that better? Yeah, that's better. Thank you very much. Um, did, you, did you hear the okay. question right. around I'm the southern access route? Yes, the southern access route. Um, yes, so um, the southern access route is intended to take <clears throat> traffic away from the B1040 because we know that the 1040 junction with the A14 uh, may at some point um, reach its capacity. So it gives another outlet for the, um, the North Stowe development traffic to come onto the Dry Drayton Road and then onto the 1307. Um, so that's its intended purpose um, to avoid congestion at the Bar Hill interchange. Now, I understand that the Girton Parish Council query is that they think that maybe some of the traffic will go north into Oakington, turn um, right and then come into Girton and come into Cambridge through the through the village of Girton and onto the Huntingdon Road. As a um, measure to um, prevent this happening. We don't think it will happen because the uh, the distribution we've looked at doesn't indicate that that will be the case. But just in case there was some problems, we have a, um, a pot of money uh, for traffic calming measures or traffic management. I don't like to call it traffic calming um, to actually deter traffic from doing that. Should it be found that traffic does start to move through the villages rather than on the main routes as intended? Councillor Williams, you want to come back? Thank you. Um, I think we're all familiar with traffic calming, but you say traffic management. Could I sort of understand because what you what you mean by that? Because so, there's no point having the money if, if you can't actually do something that's useful. I'm just sort of thinking of, you know, we're dealing with people's characters here and, and they're going to, by essence, want to take the shortest route. I think that, that's your natural instinct. So I'm just wondering how you manage that and deter them from that while also not making it difficult for people that need to use that area. Well, yeah, and that, and that's the precisely the, the reason why I didn't want to call it traffic calming, because whenever people mention traffic calming, everyone always has the sort of um, the vision of humps in the road, which I know aren't popular with residents of villages because when you know larger vehicles go over them there's a tendency to make a noise um it would be environmental enhancements um so it might be sort of horizontal um sort of deflections the um the type sort of give way um bar not barriers but the give way systems that you see in some villages rather than traffic humps um reductions in speed limit um and basically maybe some slight sort of narrowing of roads just to make it clear that this is a village environment and not a through route. Um, and we've worked on some of these schemes before um, and we've implemented them in, in other places and they do they do work. But I didn't want anyone to get the impression we were just going to bolt pumps to the road. It's going to be something more 
holistic than that, something a bit with a bit more thought. Okay, thank you, Jess. Um, count, sorry, question from Councillor Roberts, please. Thank you, Chairman, um, and through you, Chairman, I, I don't want to take up a lot of time at this particular time of the meeting because we've got a lot to get through, but um, the, there's a couple of things that strike me immediately that I'm concerned about. Um, the first one is at page 29, uh, where we talk about um, at paragraph 140, about the strategy about uh, phasing out fossil fuels in a year's time. And then it talks about the most appropriate technology are likely to be. I mean, it seems here that we're having, we're getting rid of all the uh, things that work and they're talking about things vaguely that may or may not work. And I told them, I, to my understanding, and we've got a heat pump in our, in our garden and it doesn't work in the winter. Um, and so these people are going to be frozen stiff as they say up north. Um, and, and I just think it's a bit uh, light in detail of, of exactly how this scheme is going to be heated um, and really a bit unfair to people because um, even a, an air sourced uh, heat pump is a great deal of money. And then secondly, to go on to page 116, um, I'm so disappointed at the lack of real strength there about the environmental impacts. It doesn't seem to focus at all on the concerns that we've all been getting over the last few days um, from um, either parish councils or individuals or, or, or groups. Um, and it just seems to say, yeah, well, everything in the garden is going to be rosy. And there's no, there's no identification here of the things that people have been sending us about their concerns, about the, the impact. It just talks about how it will look, basically. Well, I want to know how it's going to function. Um, you know, the information we've been receiving basically says that there are, since North Stowe, since 2015, there's been a marked decline uh, in the chalk stream systems and the ponds there, and people are very concerned. And yet there's not, not that I can see, there's nothing here that gives me any um, information or satisfaction that um, it's actually even been thought about. Okay, so I think two questions of clarity there. The first was a bit more detail on how the scheme will be heated, which relates to page 29, and a second question of clarity around the functionality of some of the environmental impact suggestions. I'm not sure who would like to take that, Mr Kelly? Chair, yeah, perhaps if I just, if, if, if I start, and colleagues might, might assist, um, uh, and perhaps if I deal with the second point first, which relates to um, uh, the, the issue around the straw, chalk streams, I, I should prefer, obviously, members will have seen in the, uh, in the update sheet uh, an additional seven representations uh, that highlight concerns about that. We've also received, uh, since that, representations from uh, Mr. Colin Hayes, Claire Driver, Helen Alder and Mary Cooper that make fundamentally the same concerns as Councillor Roberts has drawn attention to. Um, I'm sorry if you feel that the report doesn't properly cover that point. The, the um, uh, text uh, should highlight, uh, I, I think, but perhaps um, draw out further the way in which the Planning Authority has approached this issue. We have, as um, I think Councillor Roberts has, has acknowledged, consulted the statutory agencies about this. Uh, and um, uh, because the uh, site is within the development plan, uh, so it's a long-standing site allocation, um, the Environment Agency and others have recognised that they um, have not objected on the basis of uh, the issue about groundwater supplies. Now, the, uh, the, uh, some of the comments have questioned whether or not the local planning authority should have gone further, and in fact, the planning authority have. Uh, and um, you will be aware of the work that we have been doing, uh, we employed Stantec to look at water supply issues associated with the new local plan, but that work also included both substantial engagement with the Water Authority, with Cambridge Water, Anglin Water, and Water Resources East, uh, and um, uh, the feedback from the water companies, and indeed uh, from Anglin Water and others, uh, was that um, the future growth uh, of Cambridge, or Greater Cambridge, uh, can be uh, appropriately accommodated. The Stantec report that accompanied the local plan evidence base 
uh, had regard to uh, and forecast uh, not only future growth in potential demand, but also the series of mitigation measures, both short and long term, uh, that could be put in place uh, to uh, avoid uh, the um, concerns that people have highlighted around continuing growth in abstraction and the environmental consequences, and indeed trying to think about uh, ways in which current abstraction levels could be more effectively managed. Now, some of those measures that they saw in the long term, uh, you may have heard about in terms of uh, future new water supplies in Fens Reservoir uh, uh, that Anglian Water are currently promoting. Uh, some of the shorter term measures included the effects of, for example, increased water metering. Currently, Greater Cambridge only has about 70%, uh, which has been shown to reduce levels of consumption, but also management and leakage control, uh, behaviour change, some of the things such as the policies that we uh, have, but also the conditions that we put into this uh, planning permission to reduce from 140 or so litres per day per person down to 110, um, and a strategy to try and deliver that but also uh, what is termed bulk water transfer, uh, which is about connections to, for example, new trunk water transfer systems that will currently but go past Cambridge, heading south uh, to uh, on the east and west sides of, of South Cambridgeshire, uh, but which are deemed to be capable of providing something to fill in between, for example, a new reservoir coming forward in the mid to late 2030s uh, and uh, the growing demands that are associated with growth. So um, I I'm sorry that the report perhaps didn't go into as much detail as the work that has been going on uh, by uh, the councils uh, with uh, the water providers, uh, but um, uh, I want people to be assured that certainly the concerns that residents have expressed about abstraction are most definitely not being treated flippantly, uh, but they are uh, being dealt with at an appropriate strategic level rather than a site-by-site -site basis. Uh, and on this point, I just want to finish with the government's guidance on um, how uh, water supply, wastewater and water quality uh, should be approached in terms of um, planning applications. Uh, that guidance from the Department of Leveling Up and Housing and Communities uh, from the 22nd of July 2019 makes clear um, the planning for necessary water supply would normally be addressed through uh, strategic policies uh, which can be reflected in water companies' water resources management plans. And we've been pushing into those water resource management work um, to try and exact that. Um, it says, water supply is therefore unlikely to be a consideration for most planning applications, uh, with exceptions that might include large developments and importantly not identified in plans uh, and obviously North Stowe has been identified in plans for, for a number of years, significant works um, required to connect water supply and where a plan requires enhanced efficiency as part of a strategy. Now, we have uh, and the conditions in the permission uh, or in the recommendation seek to deliver that enhanced efficiency. Sorry, that's a long answer. But, um, uh, uh, thank you. And just quickly, if I may come back, and I'm not, um, not criticising um, the planning department here, actually, um, but I am very concerned about what I think I've just heard, which seems to be that the people who are supplying the water are just doing a general all-over plan. Uh, they've got this strategy for development, but it's not going to be focused on particular plans. Well, I'm sorry, I'm here this morning to focus exactly on a particular plan. And I don't think that they, the water people, are doing us any service here because I think there is every likelihood that there's going to be serious problems, and they'll dump the problem on you because they'll say that you gave. Just, just to respond to that, I, th I think the, the um, as I said, the consultations that have taken place, so for example, with the Environment Agency, have encouraged us to engage with Cambridge Water, and we, and we have done that. I think at this point in uh, the process, obviously uh, the contribution that North Stowe or these planning applications will make uh, is uh, significant on one level, but it's not significant in the overall needs of Greater Cambridge, which have to be dealt with at a strategic level, and indeed at a level even above South Cambridgeshire. This is a kind of a regional issue, uh, which is why we've, we've spent so much um, uh, focus on working with 
Water Resources East about the next Water Resources Management Plan, which will inform the investment programs of Cambridge Water uh, and Anglian Water to try and address those, those, those concerns. Okay. Um, questions of clarity, we're back over to Richard, Councillor Richard Williams, please. Uh, <coughs> thank you very much, Chair. Um, I, I've got three questions. Obviously, it's a long application. I'll, I'll, I'll have more to say, but just to start us off. Um, so on three points. Firstly, in terms of housing density, um, we're told, paragraph 317, that the average density here is, is 45 dpH. Could we be told what the density or the average density would therefore be across the whole site of North Stowe? We've got figures for, for this particular phase. Um, but I'd, I'd be interested to know what, what, what that will mean for the development um, overall. One very specific question on foul water, um, and here I'm on paragraph 484. Paragraph 484 references the drainage board's continuing concerns and then goes on to talk about Utton's Drove. Now, I may be missing something, but the only representation from a drainage board I could find in this pack was from the Old West Drainage Board, which didn't refer to Upham's Drove, talked about Reynolds Drain. Now, there is um, an objection in the second application we're looking for, looking at today from the Swavesey Drainage Board, which refers to Upham's Drove. Um, but I'd welcome a bit of clarification on, on which drainage board we're talking about in, in 484 and exactly what the nature of the concerns were, because as I say, I, I couldn't find any drainage board representations relevant to Upham's Drove in, in, in the pack. And then on the, the water point, obviously we'll, we'll, we'll say a lot more about this, um, and um, obviously take on board what, what, what was just discussed, which was partly what I was going to talk about, but um, just on a Point of clarity, the, the Arcadis groundwater note that's on the website um, and that was provided, I think, in August 2021, that suggests that the final water table on the site will be about two to three metres lower than it currently is. Um, now, are those figures that the planning service accepts and recognises, is, is that what you expect? And I'll probably come back to this later in debate. But in terms of condition 39, which talks about monitoring groundwater, it doesn't actually set out for us any detail on what the minimum levels of water would be. Um, it, it all seems to be left to, to a drainage strategy to, to be agreed. So, um, I mean, I think it's a bit of advance notice. This is perhaps more a point for debate. I'm not, re I'm not really happy to leave it. Uh, with that condition in such a vague way and us having no idea as to what the actual limits, the maximum and minimum will be. But, but for the time being, I'd, I'd just like clarity on, on those figures. And are the figures in the Arcadis report what you're accepting and expecting from this development? Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I think yeah, three questions there. The question on the figures in the Arcadis report, um, questions around the housing density across all of North Stone, not just this phase we're looking at today. Um, and clarity around the representations from the drainage boards that is referenced in the report. Mr Kelly, are you going to attempt those? Uh, I shan't uh, on all of them. Uh, I think, um, Councillor Williams, if we can come back and, uh, because we'll need to go away and just confirm the densities across the, the development, we will certainly aim to give you those uh, during the course of the meeting. Uh, in terms of the clarification about the uh, drainage board, um, perhaps I can ask uh, one of my colleagues um, uh, whether they can clarify uh, the nature of that, of, uh, of that comment. I suspect it's referring to the Swavesy uh, IDB's concerns, which, which form part of phase 3B, as you, as you rightly identify, but um, perhaps a colleague can, can, can comment. Uh, in respect to the point about groundwater levels, um, uh, I'm not, the planning authority hasn't challenged the conclusions of the note, it's got no reason to, to do so. Um, but uh, uh, I'm sure we'll discuss that, as you've highlighted, further in the course of the <laughs> meeting, and I'm very conscious that I suspect some of um, other comments will be made ab about that. So is it sensible, Chair, to perhaps defer that to the discussion at that time? Sure. Um, subject to, obviously, my, my view that we 
I think we've recognised the work in that in that um, technical note. And the consultants at Arcadis are also, I think, potentially available to comment uh, if that was the committee's request to clarify their work. Thank you. Thank you. I think that'd be useful indeed. Um, but in the meantime, if we could have um, one of our officers who's online joining us just to clarify the question around the representations from the drainage boards that have been referenced, please. Not sure who that would be precisely, but. Thank you, Councillor Batchelor. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I've been asked to comment on this. The, the IDB did not object to 3A. They made an objection to 3B. So in 3A, it was referred to in the wider context, but their objection was to 3B and not 3A. I think and, and, and the IDB are coming, the IDB are down as a speaker for 3B. OK, was that, um, did that um, answer your question, Councillor? It's the internal drainage board, I think, was being referenced. Potentially. Um, so there is no objection then to, uh, from the Swavesy drainage board about relevant to Upham Stroke here, because it's not going to Upham Stroke. Is that the position? But, the, the, the far water is going to Utton's Drove. Perhaps, perhaps um, Mr. Ireland from the Environment Agency might be able to help out with Utton's Drove. But um, my understanding is that the IDB are not objecting to 3A and, it, and the far water going to Utton's Drove. They're objecting to 3B and the additional far water going from 3B to Utton's Drove. Um, but if Mr. Ireland is, is on, on, the, on the call, he might be able to help out. Thank you, Arden. Morning, Mr. Ireland. Hopefully, you can clarify this for as uh, quickly as possible. Certainly, thank you, Chair, and, and thanks, Mike, as well. Um, just wanted to check you can hear me. We can answer Clearly you. Enough. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, in relation to um, Buttons Drove uh, itself, we've been in liaison with. Um, oh, uh, members of your committee um, and also um, Anglian Water and Swavesy IDB uh, over the last few years. Now this relates to concerns from the IDB about um, increased uh, levels of, of uh, foul water flow being directed to Utton's Drove. Um, not so much in terms of a water quality issue but more um, relating to potential for increased increased flood risk downstream from the discharge point of um, uh, of the water recycling center itself um, so it is something that we are um, aware of and as i say we are in negotiations and, and liaising with uh, with anglian water about the the future use of it um, it currently it Buttons Drove, the water recycling centre, currently has a um, a permit to to discharge. Um, however, Anglian Water are seeking to do improvements to the works itself to increase the uh, increase the capacity. Um, and as part of that, they will require um, a, a revision to the permit um, from ourselves, which they will receive, which they have to. Uh, to, to discharge itself. As part of a, a previous uh, land drainage solution, uh, which some members may be uh, familiar with, uh, there was modelling uh, carried out, uh, which identified a, um, a, a specific flow rate, which the, the downstream receiving water course would be capable to, uh, to accommodate without risk of flooding. Um, and it's our understanding that the initial pre-application uh, for the change in the permit for the discharge from the water recycling centre, um, there's there's two scenarios being investigated. One which will be looking at that maximum discharge, which is possible to accommodate within the watercourse itself, and then a slightly lower one as well. They're still at the pre-application stage. Um, in terms of the discussion about the permit for uh, for those changes, so we are in liaison with them, but um, in, initially it's uh, still anticipated that the water would be able to be accommodated in terms of the discharge of the treated water would be able to be accommodated within the water course um, based upon the a previous land drainage solution. 
Now, as part of the revision of the permit itself, um, we will also be requiring uh, Angling Water to undertake uh, an updated flood risk assessment. So we have, uh, we're, we're reassured um, that that will be the case, i.e. that there will be no increase in flood risk from Mutton's Drove itself. Adam, thank you for that. That's, um, I hope that's partially at least answered the question. And as you said, we can come back in the debates if we, if we need to touch on this topic again. Yes, yeah, yeah. thank, thank, thank you, Chair. I, I, I am grateful for I'm a bit perplexed as to why there would be an objection to an application for 1,000 houses, but not an application to, to an objection for 4,000 houses. But maybe we'll come back to that. Thank you. Thank you. Point noted. Uh, Councillor Hawkins, please. Thank you, Chair. I will stay on the issue of the um, groundwater. Um, Councillor Williams has actually asked the, the main question. But my concern is, again, paragraph 45, where it is acknowledged that the, the watering um, needs careful management, given the potential for disruption to existing water movement patterns. How is this going to be managed? And what happens if the water movement underground is disrupted? Uh, Stephen, or perhaps one of our officers online might be the best place to answer. If I, if I can just just touch upon that, obviously the, the um, uh, I think someone has already referred to it. There are um, proposed conditions, uh, and indeed the addendum um, report seeks a slight modification to condition 39 around groundwater management, um, uh, recognising the there has been some work done already, which has been referred to in terms of the technical note, uh, but recognising the need for monitoring um, of uh, the development through uh, the construction phase and through those dewatering um, activities that may be required as part of uh, the, de the development. Um, Chair, as I said, there are the, the applicants, the consultants are on available perhaps to consider this further because I'm conscious that Perhaps also some of the speakers may well wish to raise similar points, so I wouldn't propose to draw them in at this stage if that's acceptable to wouldn't yourselves? Wouldn't. Chairman, could I suggest that actually pulling them in after the public speakers might be better because then we'll have a more picture complete, I would have thought. Indeed, I think this is a point for our officers to ask any questions of clarity of. So if after the public speaking and the debate, um, or actually when the, the applicant themselves addresses us, we can perhaps ask questions of, of their consultants then. Okay. Um, Councillor Peter Fane. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, my question rather follows up the, the question from Councillor Roberts earlier on. Um, we have, I suspect it may be a question for the Environment Agency, um, very helpful to have Mr. Uh, Arland on available to us. The Environment Agency response is at paragraphs 158 and 159. Um, no objections, subject to conditions, and I think the points in 158 have already, in relation to Utton's Drove and so on, have already been dealt with. In respect of water supply, um, the response deals mainly with the question of who will be responsible for that? Um, whereas, of course, the key question that may emerge is, is there enough and is that on a sustainable basis? Now, that is dealt with in more detail at um, paragraph 610, uh, which is on page 105. Um, so, we understand that Cambridge Water has confirmed it has adequate water resources to serve the proposed development. Uh, but it does go on to say there is insufficient capacity in the current infrastructure, and therefore we are rather dependent on reinforcement um, to that. The final paragraph of that section, section paragraph 613 on page 106, um, officers are therefore satisfied that sufficient available resources will be available in the longer term to serve the site, and that the availability of water is not a constraint for development. I think the concern must be, 
is the sustainable availability of water a constraint for development? Now, I take on board the points that our director, Mr. Kelly, made earlier about the need to address, to address this through strategic policies, particularly as this is covered in the local plan. But I think I follow Councillor Roberts in saying that when we are faced with an application for 5,000 houses, even one approved in the local plan, uh, we need to seek reassurances on these points, whether from the Environment Agency or from officers. I think it's probably a question for the Environment Agency, I'd imagine. And I see Mr. Islands jumping back in. Sorry, yes. Sorry, I should have waited the invitation first. But uh, um, no, I think uh, Mr. Kelly was uh, was correct in terms of um, yes, his, his his initial summary uh, as as just referred to um, as well. Um, it is correct that the. Uh, the water resource management plans that are prepared by uh, water companies are uh, uh, much more strategic as opposed to a, a, a singular site uh, and also long term, i.e. they relate to the uh, and are based upon the uh, the housing numbers as a whole um, within uh, within the local plans within the uh, I would, I would have said water catchment area, but it is uh, much further afield uh, as strategic uh, water supplies are being um, are being developed. Uh, again, as alluded to earlier, with the um, with the the, uh, the trunk networks for uh, for for wider water transfer, and that's across um, East Anglia as a whole. Um, so, in terms of the sustainability. Uh, Based upon the water resource management plans and the current uh, scales of development across East uh, East Anglia, um, then yes, that is still considered to be sustainable, um, and part of that is um, relates to the required condition or the proposed condition 31, uh, which related to the uh, the 110 litres paired per day design um, from. Uh, design of uh, of properties for the for the water usage. So with that, um, yes, with that that management of the of the design, we we know we can't change people's habits in terms of their own personal uh, use of it. Um, but that is um, yes, with the design code, we're confident that that current um, current water supply is uh, is able to to yeah to be met to uh, for the needs of the development itself um, and I'll just allude also um, that was that was mentioned towards um, also demand management which is led through Anglian Water themselves um, a lot of that will be relating to uh, to metering um, and efficiency measures and promotion of that to their their actual customers um, I can't speak too much for <laughs> in fact I can't speak for Anglian Water themselves um, but no, in terms of the sustainable supply, then then yes, that is considered um, appropriate at this moment in time. Um, uh, and as I say, with more strategic um, solutions also being um, yeah being planned across across East Anglia as a whole. That's that's fine. Thank you for that. Uh, we have two more speakers: Councillors Khan and then Williams again. Martin. Um, I, I, I'm, there's two, two concerns. First of all, I, I, I'd like to know some information about the um, actual ground conditions on the site. Um, it's lying on gold clay, and yet we're talking about groundwater. Gold clay is basically very impermeable. So I presume there must be superficial deposits, uh, and I'd be interested to know what sort of, uh, what the superficial deposits are and what sort of capacity for groundwater, how deep they are. Um, because obviously, if they're very uh, thin, it's going, the site is going to be very susceptible for all the groundwater to be building up and to be after a long period of time and, uh, and uh, excessive uh, uh, discharge of water onto the ground uh, outside. Now, I, I, I'm not aware of what that situation is. Um, I just would like to know if somebody's got information on that and so we know what, what the actual likely risk is. Um, secondly, in terms of the, I, I, I accept that you can supply water uh, in the current situation, uh, perhaps in the current situation, but it appears to me that the long-term water supply of, uh, of 
approachable water to the site depends upon the achievement of the strategic water plan, not just the fact that there's water, a strategic plan in place. And we know that this, this will clearly involve quite major investment for the region. Um, uh, uh, now, that may not proceed as fast as we expect. Um, uh, and I'm wondering whether consideration has been given to uh, phasing uh, or having the viewpoints during the actual development of the site, which is going to be developing over many years, uh, to, uh, to, to check that actually the supply is uh, predicted will actually be coming onto the site. I think that will be useful information. I want to know whether that has been considered. Okay, thank you. So two questions there. One on uh, some clarity around the current ground conditions of the site and two around whether any consideration will be given to phasing of the site. Um, again, I'm not sure who wants to take either of those questions. Can I just suggest, um, thank you, Councillor Khan. Can I suggest in terms of the, the ground conditions, there is actually a, a, a slide, an image um, that might be helpful in, in exploring that. Now, obviously, um, I'm not sure that we have that in our current presentation, Councillor Khan, but perhaps we can we can uh, bring that forward as part of the uh, uh, in, in, into the debate because I think it's an, an important point to probably help for clarity. Um, in respect to the supply point, I think the um, scale of the interventions that are uh, that are uh, associated with addressing the abstraction challenges. Um, it becomes quite difficult to assign that to a particular development or a particular site reasonably in, in planning terms um, because uh, obviously the demand is a consequence uh, and in fact you know, the abstraction uh, on the chalk um, aquifer is a consequence of the whole of the Greater Cambridge area and parts of Huntingdonshire um, and in terms of the reasonableness particularly of a, a proposal within the development plan uh, of preventing um, the progression of that. Uh, I'm not sure that's appropriate. Uh, but the Environment Agency might wish to comment because obviously associated with the abstraction is a, is a requirement for license licensing from the Environment Agency to maintain uh, or indeed change abstraction levels. And those licenses are reviewed, I think associated with the Environment Agency's clear position of seeking to try and manage down current abstraction levels. Uh, so I don't know whether uh, Adam Ireland can, can comment, but the concerns about continuing to, to draw substantial quantities uh, away is something that, um, and the consequences for the uh, chalk streams and the um, uh, special environment uh, in that area is something that it, it may well be helpful for the EA to, to comment on because they oversee that environmental. Let, let, let's see if they can. Adam, are you still there? Hello. Hello. Um, I'm, I'm a bit limited as to what I can say uh, relating to this at this moment in time. Uh, Stephen Gay is, is correct in terms of the uh, license capping for abstraction. Um, and we are currently going through a review of abstractions um, across the, the whole of East Anglia. Um, and as part of that, um, we have indicated uh, to the abstractors, uh, both uh, private abstractors, also water companies as well, um, of uh, the intention for uh, a certain capping levels. Now, these will be specific to each individual abstraction. The reason I can't go into that a lot further is it's going to be it's part of a judicial review at this moment in time in terms of our process, uh, what we've undertaken. Um, so there is a legal process being um, being carried out at this moment in time. Uh, but yes, that is it, it's our, it's it's our um, obviously our our role and duty to um, ensure those abstractions are managed. So uh, both for the, the the use and supply of water to commercial residential and also in obviously ensuring that there's no detriment to the environment but I'm quite limited unfortunately as to what I'm allowed to say at this moment in time. That's fine that's understandable Adam but I think you've answered as best you can so thank you for that. Martin was it come back? I just wanted to comment that um, I understand why you feel that uh, one particular development is difficult to uh, regard the, the need for a review but the problem is here that we have a number of large developments uh, over the next few years Water Beach uh, Camborne, North Stowe, and uh, other developments of Alcumbry, which cumulatively will have a big effect. Uh, and each of, for each of them, the same situation will apply. But individually, 
it's difficult to justify. Uh, uh, and I want to know if there's any solution to this problem, because obviously it, it's going to be a concern. I think Mr. Kelly. We give permission to all of these uh, when they were stuck, unless we have some means of, of review during the process. I think Mr. Kelly wants to come back on that. One of the things that um, uh, in the wider study, indeed it's referenced even in the recent publication from Water Resources East, um, and I refer, I've touched upon it, is this um, effectively short, medium and long-term responses to the challenges that the area faces. What the um, Water Resources East uh, work highlights is that in fact they're uh, recognising there is a right to be provided with water enshrined in the legislation for developers. Um, there are nevertheless, and, and Adam has referred to issues about further abstraction, the Water Resources East work and the conversations that we've had with um, uh, Cambridge Water, Anglian Water and Water Resources East suggest that in the medium term there are potential interim bulk transfer options that exist both from uh, in planned infrastructure to the west uh, of South Cambridgeshire and indeed from the east of South Cambridgeshire that can deliver uh, between two and three million litres, I think, um, of additional capacity per day. Um, uh, now, obviously, uh, in a dispersed um, pattern, so if you're trying to service individual villages, that might be difficult. For sites like North Stowe, those bulk water transfer and potential options may be uh, options that form part of an interim strategy. But they're not part of, uh, we won't know for sure about that uh, until the Water Resources East final water resource management plan is published late in 2023. Um, but the programme and the delivery of North Stowe is, as you're fully aware, a kind of long-term programme of, of delivery and implementation. Uh, and I suspect, coupled with the Environment Agency's obligations about further abstraction, or the issue of abstraction, a very clear stated desire of everybody to reduce levels of abstraction from the short streams, those projects are feasible in um, technical terms and are the subject of the water, water resources planning uh, that is ongoing at this moment in time, such that we wouldn't um, point towards a need to cap the further growth of North Stowe, which, as I said, is within the development plan process uh, as a committed, uh, as an existing commitment. Um, but as we go forward with the local plan, you, um, I don't need to remind members of the statements that we've already been quite clear about in terms of further additional growth beyond the development plan um, framework at the moment. Thank you. Chair, if I, I'm sorry to just jump in, but if I can, just to help maybe Councillor Khan on the first question. Um, the site, uh, uh, not my area of professional expertise, but it's river terrace deposits overlying the clay. Um, is it the sort of uh, geological situation in the area? Okay, thank you for that clarity. And um, um, finally, Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, a plea from us to members and officers that are working with the, the um, paper-free version. Our page numbers aren't the same as yours um, on the paper. So if we could use paragraph numbers, because, or at least give me a few minutes to find the page, that would be, that would be grand, thank you. Um, on a, something a bit more um, substantive, I just wanted to clarify whether I heard correctly um, about the Swayze Internal Drainage Board, because on paragraph 184, I've got the Swayze Drainage Board object um, and then, and Swavesy on 130, their parish council objects supporting the internal drainage board. And it's probably my hearing, it's quite difficult with the, with the screen and, and everything. But I thought I heard somebody say that the internal drainage board had objected to the second application, not the first. But this suggests to me that they have, unless that's a different board. Um, and then they do on pa paragraph 436, um, the IDB would prefer to see water discharge. I assume that's the Swavesy Internal Drainage Board that wants that. So is my understanding correct that they have been consulted and that they have objected to this application as well as the other, even if they've not requested to speak on this one? Thank you, Chair. Oh, and on Utton's Drove, sorry, the other one before I forget, because um, many of us have heard about Utton's Drove 
from Councillor Ellington, um, particularly Councillor Hawkins will be familiar with that and Drover, I'm sure. Um, does this take into account the calculations that have been made about Cambridge West going there as well? Um, because I think that's important, the, the dates, because I know there was a change in the, where Cambridge West was going to be going, and now it is going to Arms Drove, I believe, not Patworth. So making sure that um, the responses we've got here are post that decision. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Might be better if we uh, invite Mike Huntingdon in to answer at least the first one. So, Mike, some clarity on the IDB uh, comments on this application, not the next one, and whether they are either um, not raising any objections or they are raising an objection. I think some absolute clarity on that would be handy. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> um, my understanding is the IDB are com uh, about to, uh, sorry, the IDB are one of the speakers about this application. Um, but my understanding is it's the objection to 3B because 3A was always factored into the Uttons Drove works. But I think best is to hear it from the IDB when they when they comment on the application. I've I've also got um, a plan that you asked earlier on that Councillor Richard Williams asked for, or no, Councillor Martin Khan asked for in relation to the the uh, River Terrace deposits. Should I share this on the screen? Uh, yes, if you can quickly. Yep. Um, I'm not a geologist, um, but this plan is the area, red line is the area of, of phase 3A, and you can see in faint... Hang on, we can't faint. see your, you're not showing your screen. Oh, I thought I've got a red line around it. Okay. We can't see it in the room. Oh, okay. Um, that's strange. Chair, this actually seems to be an issue on our end as opposed to on Mike's end. Can I just try to quickly resolve this for us? Uh, yes, okay. Sorry, Councillor Williams, did you want to come back on the IDB point while well, that's going on? Yeah, no, I think it's on, on the online version, but the way the bookmarking and everything works, <coughs> it's showing part of phase 3B in as 3A. So I think my question on... Chair, yeah, while we're waiting... Not, do you May mind if I make a quick that. suggestion? Hang on. Hang on. <laughs> so let, let, let her finish. Yeah, it might be a technical issue on how this is presented on, on the online. Okay. Like I say, we do sometimes get different numbers and things, but if they can confirm it again with, with what I've got on this version. Okay. Mike, I'm not sure if you heard that, did you? The, um, I think it might be a discrepancy between the way the report's presented on the online version as it is in paper. So I think just for absolute clarity, some some clarity around the comments from the IDB on this application. I appreciate they are speak, down to speak as well, but if we could, if you could, for absolute clarity, help us with that, that would be useful. Mike. Lots of people jumping in. Lawrence, did, sorry, did you want to say something earlier? Oh, here he is. He's <laughs> run into the room. Mike, um, I think we we lost you just um, after you started speaking when you were responding to Councillor Williams on the drainage board. So again, sorry to rehash all this. If you wouldn't mind very briefly going over uh, for, for clarity. And I think actually whilst we, um, in the interim, there was a concern raised from Councillor Williams that the online version of the agenda doesn't marry up necessarily with the paper version. So um, if you could just give us a couple of sentences saying if the IDB has commented in one way or the other in support or not? So <clears throat> the IDB have not objected to 3A, but they have objected to 3B. Okay, that's fine. Thank you, Mike. 
Um, okay, one final speaker, Councillor Wilson, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going to ask something not about water or drainage. Um, on page 71, paragraphs um, for 402 and 403 um, refer to the um, it's the um, the strategic environmental management plan, which includes arrangements for construction vehicles. Now, this refers to um, requiring the construction vehicles to use the A14 and the B1050. But I was, I'd like to know whether any um, further research has been done or whether there's any further intelligence about the provenance or the destinations of these construction vehicles and what happens after they've got onto the A14. Um, in particular, um, what concerns me, there's a, a gravel pit at Water Beach um, where gravel is extracted and spoil and soil from construction sites is returned to backfill the land that's where the gravel's been dug out. And, and I would like to know whether any thought has been given to requiring those construction vehicles to actually use the A10 and not go through the intervening villages because they could quite easily get on the A14 and then um, cut a corner to get to, instead of using the A10. So, uh, and, and I'm sure there are other places that these construction vehicles are, are going to and coming from and, and whether the routes that they could be taking should be um, set out so that they avoid the small villages in between. Thank you. That's fine, thank you. Probably best to direct that one to our colleague from the Highways Department, if he's still with us. Just Hi, good morning. Hurry. Good morning, welcome. Hi. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear and see you fine. Uh, did you manage to pick up that question in full there? I, I did, yes. Very interesting question raised. Um, not considered that before, but definitely can consider that as part of the camp. So the construction environment management plan, when that comes in as a condition, then I'll look at that in some more detail and make sure that they uh, they, they definitely specify the A14 around Cambridge and not um, joining the A14 at the very last moment, having gone through all the villages. So thank you. Appreciate the brevity. Does that, do you want to come back, Councillor Wilson? I'd like to come back on that. It, it was, it was, I was thinking more, uh, this is just an example, that um, the construction vehicle would join the A14 at um, around Dry Drayton and go along the A14, but then cut back through Oakington and Cottenham to have a quick route through to Water Beach. And what I, would, what I was suggesting is that they should be required to go along to the A10 at Milton and then use the A10 to go to Water Beach. And this is just an example. I don't know what other destinations or um, provenances the, the construction vehicles will be using other routes. Uh, I think Mr. Kelly might be coming back on that, but I just see a thumbs up from Tamna. Uh, sorry, it's just to say that um, uh, actually the, the technology and the kind of solutions that are being looked at, not just for this site, but for other major sites about vehicle routing um, uh, are, it's fair to say, evolving. So historically, uh, we've just had published routes and so on, but um, certainly vehicle monitoring and the ability to monitor individual vehicles and their, not only their origin, but how they get to their destination is something that I suspect working with the County Highways team on a number of similar projects of this scale uh, is something that we will evolve. Um, uh, and we recognise the problem uh, of, it's not just where they come into the site, but uh, the, the distance in between. Uh, and it's something that, as Tam's highlighted, I think is going to be um, an important part of the construction environmental management plan process, um, recognising that technology, for example, GPS tracking of individual vehicles and so on, is something that is now available, uh, let alone by the time construction starts on a, on a project like phase uh, 3A and, and the permissions granted. Okay, thank you for the response there. Members, no more questions of clarification for, um, for officers.
Uh, members, I'm going to break us there before we go into the public speaking element of the, of the application. Um, the time now is quarter to 12. If we come back in 10 minutes, so 5 to 12, in our seats, ready to start, and then we'll go straight into the public speaking. Thank you very much.
Okay, thank you, members. We're live again now. So welcome back, everyone, to this meeting of South Camps District Council. We're still on item... Can we be quiet, please? Thank you. We're still on the first item of the agenda, which is North Stowe, item 3A, and we're about to go into the public speaking element of the meeting. Um, the first public speaker is a Mr Keith Wilderspin, who's from the Swavesy Internal Drainage Board. Um, Mr Wilderspin, welcome. Obviously quite timely given the discussions we've just been having. So um, I'm not sure if you've been to the committee before, but you have three minutes to address the committee, at which point if you wouldn't mind holding, staying in your seat in case there's any questions of clarification for you. So whenever you're ready, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um... Before I start my statement, could I like could I clear up some of this business that was going on before the adjournment? Swavesy. Hang on, if you actually if you give us your statement first, then I'm sure there'll be some questions okay. of clarity for you at the end. No, but Thank this you. isn't a question of clarity. It's a question of whether Swavesy IDB has objected to 3A and 3B. We have objected to 3A. I have the letter here, and I have Andrew Thompson Thompson's letter back to our drainage engineer with his comments on, on our comments. So that's, we that's have helpful. had an objection in. Okay, whenever you're ready, please. Um, my statement then. North Stone 3A treated water is to be discharged to the Swavesy drain system. This is a drainage channel susceptible to flooding and is tide lock locked at times of flood for periods of up to four weeks. Four weeks. To cater for the increased foul water flows from Camborne 950 and North Stow phases 1, 2 and 3 A's 10,000 houses, a total of approximately 11,000 houses, a scheme called the LDS has been installed over the last 10 years. This has a design capacity to receive the 239 litres a second flow model that was needed. Subsequent to this, and without agreement from the EA, Anglia and Ward have more than taken up this capacity with plans to add approximately the 6,000 houses from Camborne West and Bourne Airfield. This all was originally planned and stated in their statements at the time to go to Packless Water Recycling Centre. In a letter from the EA to Anglian Water, 19th of April 2021, copied to Chris Carter and myself, among others, states, quote, We share the concerns of Swavesy Parish Council and the IDB relating to discharge being directed to Utton's Drove from additional development other than those previously agreed through the LDS. This leaves big questions beyond 2027 with seemingly no strategic plan or urgency to establish what infrastructure options there may be that do not increase flood risk or cause environmental harm to Swavesy. Please note that we will not be delivering any future LDS or similar. The flooding experience in this part of the Great Ouse catchment this winter just demonstrates how important an issue this is. And with climate change and such ambitious house growth plans, there are unlikely to be many, if any, solutions that will be simple to deliver, to deliver and quick to expedite. We will be sharing this letter with other interested parties." Unquote. This obviously will increase the problems of flooding to Swavesy catchment, therefore the IDB objects to North Stoke 3A and 3B until such time as the overcapacity discharges to Swavesy drain with its serious consequences to Swavesy are addressed. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much for that. Uh, members, are there any questions of clarity for Mr Wilderspin, Councillor Heather Williams? Thank you. Um, so I didn't catch you. You made a quote from a letter. I didn't catch who you said the letter was from. The letter was from the EA um, to the environment to Anglian Water. Thank you. That Thank was you. only part of the letter. I'll have the letter to hand if it's if it's any help to the committee. Thank you, uh, members. Any further questions of clarification, Mr. Wilderspin? Councillor Roberts, please. Thank you, Chairman, and through you, Chairman. Um, good morning, sir. Can you tell me that, in, in, in layman's terms, 
I do some t often wish that Councillor Mason was here. Um, can you tell me in layman's terms, what do you feel would be the effect if this application was to go through with things as they stand? Currently, the consent that the LDS was designed for, as Adam Ireland said, was 239 litres a second. This was designed to cater for the, the, the things I've mentioned. If, well, because the Camborne West and Bourne Airfield are now going to be discharged into that system, it, it, it will be it will seriously impact on the pump that we have installed at Webb's Hole Sluice to pump sewage water out. It will seriously impact on that's ability to cope and keep the drains down to a reasonable level. That they, they would, that the level that they would have been at if, if this extra sewage charge hadn't been discharged. It's a bit like Armageddon coming, isn't it? It's... Well, Honestly, uh, um, the situation ongoing with what is going to happen, we have North Stow and Camborne, and we, as I understand it, we now have North Stow. Um, Camborne is the likely place for any further expansion still. If this all goes to the Uttons Drove sewage treatment works, we are in big, big trouble. And believe me, um, what's happening at Swavesy or likely to happen at Swavesy keeps me awake a lot more times than my business or my private life does. Thank you very much. Councillor Richard Williams, please. Uh, thank, thank you very much. I, I actually had a, a similar question to, to Councillor Roberts, so I won't go over that again, but could you just, I think it would be helpful, if you could just tell us or give us a bit more clarity on the situation um, at Uttons Drove now. I mean, is, is, is your case that it, it's, it's now basically at or over capacity? without anything additional? At the moment, it's not over capacity. At the moment, they, the Anglian Water have a, a, a license to discharge 122 litres a second. Um, they have, on their own admission this spring, exceeded that already. Um, this 122 litres is has been an increase from the 40 litres a second that was that they had before the building that's taken place at the moment. So that extra 80 litres a second has just come from the 950 at Camborne, which has been finished, and the, I don't know if the 1500 have been finished at, on phase one of North Stow, but that has put that extra capacity into that system and they only have another 100 or so litres to go. 120 litres, sorry. Thank you for that. Councillor Ripeth, please. Um, thank you. I think you said this. I just don't want to... Um, I want to check I didn't miss here. So you said there's big questions beyond 2027. So basically, from what you're saying, the next five years... It's kind of okay, but from that point on, you think it will be over capacity and not able to cope. Am I correct? That is exactly what we think. Okay, thank you. That's very clear. Thank you very much. Members, no further questions or clarification for Mr. Wilderspin, so we say thank you very much for taking the time to address us. And we'll move on to our next public speaker, which is Mr. Daniel Fulton from Fuse Lane Consortium. Mr. Fulton. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I think the committee has sort of lost track of what's happening here today. Um, there were 34 pages of updates sent um, at 8 o'clock yesterday evening. Um, in one of those pages on Annex D, it indicates that there have been further conditions proposed and have been accepted by the applicant. These conditions have not been provided to this committee. It also says that in accordance with the report recommendation, the final wording to be agreed in consultation with the chair um, will be delegated to officers. What you're being asked to do today is to grant planning permission um, without approving any finalized wording of the conditions. 
And as you know, when it comes to implementation, the conditions are absolutely everything. All you're actually approving today, in theory, are the plan submitted and the description of the development. I've been coming to these meetings for four years. I have never seen anything close to a development of this scale being approved by this committee with no specific wording of conditions. Um, if Mr. Clark um, could go ahead and play the video, there's a, a Councillor Khan just a moment ago hit on one of the key issues, and this is the actual geology of the site and the fact that we have localized groundwater impacts that have not been addressed in the officer's report. And I, I've submitted a brief video. This is from the national charity, the Aquifer Alliance, a talk given by nationally recognized sustainable drainage expert Joe Bradley on the 19th of December. And if we could go ahead and play this, this one minute video, uh, it summarizes uh, the concerns in Long Stanton. Lawrence, do we have a video? Yes, the video is ready and waiting. Do I have your permission to share it? Yeah. Go ahead. Very much, bear with me one second. Can you see this on the screen now? We can. Hopefully the sound works as well. Sorry, Lawrence, we, we can't hear the sound. Um, what you will need to do is just stop sharing. And when you go back on the share options, there's a little tick box in the top right hand corner that says include computer sound. Um, and that will that will get the sound of the video to work. Thank you very much, Aaron. Um, I see that. I am just getting to that now. Let's try again. Please let me know if this is all working. Still no sound, I'm afraid. Uh, might I, I, would it be proper to ask Mr. Fulton if the sound, sound is necessary or will the uh, uh, subtitles suffice? We do have subtitles. The sound is necessary, gentlemen. Sorry, could you just repeat that for me? It is necessary. There, there's a request for the sound, if possible. Please yes, OK. Please bear with me, and I will do my best to get this sorted as soon as possible. Actually, Lawrence, my friend, I can actually uh, get that in. It's, uh, it's a slight issue with the headphones that we have as well. Um, I will just pop that in now. Thomas dried up in long um, And I picked this up in the, in the press. It was on Twitter. I think we're there. If you want to start the video again, Lawrence. Or Aaron, whoever's got control. So this is a development called North Stow, um, and they did masses, uh, masses of dewatering for the residential development, big residential development. And all the ponds dried up in Long Stanton. Um, and I picked this up in the, in the press. It was on Twitter and it was on, on Facebook and LinkedIn. Um, and something like that is, is so easy to do by mistake. I, I can't imagine they did it on purpose. But the impact of that for Long Stanton is enormous. Not only is it is it aesthetically not very nice to have rivers and ponds that got no water in them. This was in the summer, and you imagine you're a, a terrestrial mammal living in that local area. There is nothing for you to drink anywhere because all the springs and all the rivers and all the streams have dried up. So that's it. That's curtains for all terrestrial mammals, unless the local people are putting water out reliably every day. And we should be ashamed of ourselves as, as a species. Um, I don't mean you personally, um, because that's just, it's, it's awful that we allow things like that to happen. Uh, and that was, that was an accident. It wasn't nature that did that. That was a, an accident of, of us, of ours. So on the 30th of November, a group, um, I, um, together with a group of pond owners in Long Stanton, met with Stephen Kelly to discuss our concerns about the loss of groundwater from the River Terrace Deposit Aquifer. We asked Mr. Kelly to give us data on what the, has happened to the groundwater level since March of last year. We also asked for borehole data that we know for a fact is in the possession of Homes England that they have refused to turn over to the local planning authority and Mr. Kelly refused to ask for it. We want to see the data. We have ponds, our ponds in Long Stanton have no water and Mr. Kelly did nothing to address that. This is ecocide. I'm not sure that you appreciate this. This is not something that will be fixed if it is not fixed when planning permission is granted for 3A and 3B. This is what our ponds look like in the summers in Long Stanton. 
Jews Lane Consortium has an entire library of these images. They're available for free, for free public use for any candidate for council. Do you want your picture on a flyer next to the picture of one of our destroyed ponds? This is what this council is doing. Please, this doesn't need to turn into a political knife fight. We're all good people here. The council is not ready to grant planning permission on this. You have to defer it. There's no question about it. You have to defer this application. You're not ready to approve it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fulton. Um, members, do we have any questions of clarification? Hold on, Mr. If any questions of clarification for Mr. Fulton? I don't think so. So thank you very much for your time this morning. Okay, next speaker we have, I think we saw him earlier online, Mr. Ian Rawls, Cambridge Friends of the Earth. Are you with us, Mr. Rawls? Hello. Hello, everybody. Hello, councillors and officers. Hello. You're very, you're very quiet, Mr. Rawls. Am I? Good grief. There's not many people say that to me. Is that better? <laughs> Am I? Yes, yeah, that's better. Ah, oh, great. Thank you. There well, we go. Okay. So, um, yeah, as with the other speakers, three minutes to address the committee, then they may have some questions for you at the end. So if you stay on the line for us. Thanks a lot. So with regards to both phases of the development, um, Cambridge Friends of the Earth would like to raise a few issues. I mean, to start with, um, we'd, we'd question which members of the electorate decided that the thousands of new houses for sale are needed or wanted in the region. How many of these will be available for genuine social rent as opposed to the more, rather more nebulous affordable housing category? How likely is it that the proposed development will significantly reduce South Cam's District Council's council housing waiting list? Moving on to slightly more environmental issues, if you like, we also strongly question the blithe overall assumptions suggested in the national policy planning framework and given form by the region's growth agenda that growth, in quotes, is inevitably a good thing for the region. We question who benefits from this. The rising tide may well lift all boats, but that assumes everyone can afford a boat. On a more practical level, there is no mention in the local plan of realistic ways to provide the necessary water for the planned quantities of new housing development such as this development. On the 1st of July 2021, DEFRA announced that chalk streams will be given enhanced environmental protection and published the Environment Agency document titled Water Stressed Areas Final Classification 2021, which included on page six the fact that the supply areas of Cambridge Water and Angling Water are areas of serious water stress. Additionally, according to Appendix 3 of this report, Cambridge Water needs to reduce abstraction by 22 million litres of water per day from current levels or from levels current at the 1st of July 2021. Mangalian Water needs to reduce abstraction by 189 million litres per day from levels current at the 1st of July 2021. Surely given these facts, water stress and shortage in itself should halt any further development. And yet we see that whilst consideration of this application is taking place now, the consultation for the regional water plan is not due until the summer of this year. Perhaps councils in Greater Cambridge region are hoping that no one notices small detail or the sound of cans being kicked down the road, which has the potential to slow down the development juggernaut. After all, Greater Cambridge planning seemed to have chosen to exclude any mention of environmental harm from the officer's report for North State Development. The Greater Cambridge planning has not sought the water company's assurance that it can meet the needs of growth without causing deterioration. It seems it's said to have gone out of its way to obfuscate fundamental water supply issues. Assuming that this glaring water shortage can be solved by proposals such as pumping water from also water stressed North Lincolnshire or building reservoirs in the fens where they'll be vulnerable to saltwater intrusion and flooding as climate change advances is fantasy greenwash of the highest order. And that these plans are big enough and bold enough to distract you, the decision makers, from having to address the fundamental issues surrounding this development. For further months and perhaps years. Approaching this issue literally from the other end, there appears to be precious little attention of how the resulting sewage will be dealt with. Decades of underinvestment in water treatment infrastructure by privatised utilities have left the system unable to cope with current levels of sewage, leading to far too frequent discharges of untreated sewage into the river cow. And yet further pressure is to be put on this ramshackle system by ever increasing demand from further development. Friends of the Earth therefore ask councillors to recognise the proposed development in Norstow will cause further unacceptable deterioration of the Cam Valley chalk streams and endanger the Cam herself. We ask you to reject this development on the grounds of unacceptable and unprecedented environmental harm. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Rawls. If you wouldn't mind holding on in case there's any questions from councillors for you. Uh, one from Councillor Roberts, please. Um, good morning. Um, I think we all know that the organisation that you stand for and are speaking on behalf of has done a great deal of good um, over um, maybe the last 50 or so years in particular when you've got you. to um, worldwide attention, um, the deficits in how we treat the world. Um, I wonder, can you just tell me, um, I'm sure that you've read um, the mission statement of this council. Um, what do you think of its mission statement that the environment is at the heart of this council and that we are green to our roots? I think those are great words. I'm, I'm, I'm sure many of the, if not all of the members of the council would go along with that. Unfortunately, it, it does seem that pressures from outside or maybe pressure, financial pressures are forcing the council in directions that it's not entirely happy with, maybe. I suspect there are very good people on the council. I mean, you, you yourself have made some very good statements in this meeting regarding water supply issues. I think outside pressures are maybe having um, a malign influence, should we say, on the decisions made by this council. Okay, thank you. Any further questions of clarity, please? Councillor Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair, and through you. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, are you aware of the Water Resources East consultation that's ongoing, and are you going to be taking part in that? We are aware of it, and we will be making a contribution at some point, yes. Okay, I'm um, aware that this this uh, the consultation is the plans for the water supply companies to actually provide the water that they are legally lawfully obliged to provide to all the public uh, public users and agriculture and all that. We appreciate that, but they're also legally obliged at the moment, and they, they seem to be failing in that task to a large degree. We will contribute to the consultation, but. As is the way with such um, such devices, should we say, consultations, they're often a way of brushing over fundamental issues. As we said, piping water from elsewhere in the country is not is not a solution. It will be coming from already water stressed areas. I mean, throughout history, men, mankind has moved to where fundamental resources like water and agricultural land are. Now we seem to be trying to sort of almost in a sort of kink in fashion bring the water to where we are. And this is now this is in a very rich area, very wealthy area that's perfectly capable of looking after itself financially. It doesn't need further growth. It doesn't need inward investment. There are other areas of the country far more in need of investment, investment and hope, basically. I'm from Wolverhampton originally, and I went through there on the train recently, and it's devastated. That place needs investment. Cambridge doesn't. It, like I say, it's perfectly capable of looking after itself. And it's just development seems to be attracted here. It's like a honeypot, obviously. Divestment, money breeds money. And we all seem to be suffering for that. I hesitate to use the word greed, but... <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I think the point's been made, but if there's a question of clarity you. around what he's been saying, no, okay. That's all right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there are no further questions or clarification. So, Mr. Rawls, we thank you for your time this morning. Thank you. Thank, thank you for the opportunity. And we will move to our final public speaker, who I believe is in the room with us. This is Monica. Ooh, E. Jock Hone. <laughs> is that right? Yeah, E. Jock. Okay. Uh, maybe Monica, if that's okay. Yeah, that's yeah, fine. Okay. That's fine. Uh, it is on my list. Uh, for objectives, we have parish councils as separate sections, so don't worry, we haven't forgotten about you. Um, Monica, so as with the others, three minutes, please, and then if you hold on for any questions of clarity. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, some of um, what I'd planned to say has just been covered by Ian. Um, I'd just like to also feed back on what I've heard this morning, this concept of presumption in favour of sustainable development this is clearly patently not a sustainable development. Um, and I think everybody knows here that we don't have enough water. I was absolutely incredulous at what I just heard from um, Adam Ireland from the Environment Agency. He clearly hasn't read the literature that has come from the Environment Agency. Um, in August 2020, they said, any increase in use within existing license volumes will increase pressure on a system that is already failing environmental targets. It's already failing, right? 
this isn't going to tip it over. It's already been tipped over. Many water bodies in 2020 did not have the flow required to support the ecology. Evidence of the ponds in Long Stanton, low flows, too much algae in the water, everything is just collapsing. Um, and they, they also recommended that the council, the planning authority, should seek the water company's assurance that it can meet the needs of growth without causing deterioration. Um, I've been unable to find any evidence that the planning authority did that. Um, in fact, it would appear that everything possible was done to avoid scrutiny. So they came up with a clever little plan. Anglian water would supply, Cambridge water would abstract. That way, uh, Anglian water needs to be consulted, Cambridge water doesn't. So, of course, Anglian water say, oh, it's absolutely fine. We've got no problems with supply. Cambridge water do the abstraction. Um, and it seems that they're getting away with it. But um, on the 1st of July, last, last summer, on the 1st of July, the Secretary of State for DEFRA accepted environmental agency advice and determined that both Cambridge Water and Anglian Water are now areas of serious water stress. And chalk streams on top of that were given enhanced protection. Um, and based on this new information, in order for our rivers to be sustainable, in order for our rivers to be just sustainable, Cambridge Water needs to cut abstraction by 22 million litres of water per day and Anglian water by 189 million litres per day. In the meantime, we are just adding more taps, constantly adding more taps. We are doing nothing to cut abstraction. Um, and I would also argue that this new classification basically would invalidate any responses um, received prior to the 1st of July last year from environmental groups and water companies to this um, to this, the consultation on this application, because it means current abstraction, abstraction licenses are now out of date and they need to be rewritten. And in fact, that, that is happening. Um, license, licenses need to be uh, reduced, the license quantities. And I'd like everybody just to think about what, what is at stake here, right? This is the reality. What is at stake here? Cambridge without the CAM. So um, my question is, finally, I just very quickly, did the planning authority seek assurance from Cambridge Water, who they know is um, bulk supplying Anglian Water, and they certainly know now, um, that it could meet the needs of growth without causing deterioration, and in view of their needs to make significant sustainability reductions following this new information from DEFRA on the 1st of July? And if so, can we see it? How are they going to supply North Stoke and reduce abstraction by 22 million litres per day to save the CAM? Thank you very much for that. Um, members, any questions of clarification uh, for our speaker? Councillor Hawkins, please. Thank you, Chair, and for you. Um, thank you, Monica, for your presentation. Um, you asked if the authority sought um, assurance from Cambridge Water, and I think the answer is in paragraph 610 on page 105. Yes, it did, and Cambridge Water has confirmed that it has adequate water resources to serve the proposed North Stoke development. Can I ask if they answered that question? Are you question? aware of that? Were you aware of that paragraph? I wasn't aware of that. But I would like to know when they sent that response. Was it after the 1st of July? I think that might be a question someone might like to ask in the debate, potentially. Um, OK, if there's no further questions of clarification for our speaker, we thank you very much for your time this afternoon. And we'll move on to our next speaker, who is, I believe, an agent of the applicant, um, Mr. Michael Bottomley-Tibbalds, who's joining us virtually.
Michael, good more good afternoon. Hello, good afternoon. Afternoon. Um, okay, Michael, same as the other speakers, three minutes to address the committee with any comments you want to give them, and then if you hold on for any questions of clarification, please. Okay, thank you very much. So thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, I'm a planning consultant for Tibbalds, representing Homes England. Uh, Homes England are a non-departmental public body uh, sponsored by the Department of, for Leveling Up Housing and Communities. Homes England's role is to accelerate the delivery of housing across England to ensure that more people have access to better homes in the right places. This means as a public sector master developer, Homes England is seeking to deliver North Stowe in the public interest. The design for North Stowe Phase 3 has been in development since early 2018, and we have engaged extensively with the community, district council, county council and other statutory consultees. We arranged three rounds of public consultation and held 17 pre-application meetings and workshops prior to the application submission in April 2020. We have continued to engage and to refine the proposals over the last 18 months and the result is a scheme that meets or exceeds policy requirements and is of a very high quality. The application has been accompanied by a full environmental impact assessment. Water extraction permits for phase 2, 3A and 3B have all been secured from Cambridge Water and the Environment Agency has confirmed that it's satisfied that suitable consents and permissions are in place for the development. The proposals are based on a master plan that will deliver a vibrant 21st century settlement with strong local identity. The master plan aims to promote sustainable transport, creating a highly permeable movement network which integrates phase 3A with the rest of the town and surrounding area, as well as promoting active and sustainable travel choices such as walking, cycling and public transport. Homes England is committed to ensuring that North Star achieves a balanced and sustainable community and recognises that an approximate, mix, um, an approximate mix of homes is crucial, an appropriate mix of homes is crucial to that objective. 40% of the dwellings on the site will be affordable housing, containing a variety of affordable tenure types to meet local needs. Throughout the design process for Phase 3A, there has been a commitment to ensure that healthy new town principles are applied to all aspects of North Stowe's development to maximise opportunities for positive lifestyle choices. Over one third of Phase 3A is open space and green infrastructure, retaining groups of trees and other landscape features, including lakes, and uses them as characters drivers um, in new neighbourhoods. To support these measures, the Section 106 package includes a community infrastructure contribution of £68.5 million. The technical team who worked, who worked on the proposals are on hand to answer any questions you have, including Janice Hughes, who is the Project Director for Technical, Environmental and Transport Matters, an expert on drainage and water matters, uh, Dean Harris, the Planning Manager for Homes England, Philip Harker, the Infrastructure Lead for Homes England, and Katya Silla, the Urban Designer and Master Planner. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. And if you could hold on a second in case there's any questions of clarity for yourself, starting with Councillor Roberts and then Richard Williams, please. Um, good morning, if it is still morning. No, gone beyond. Um, gosh, it sounds like utopia, doesn't it? However, you must be aware of what the conversation has been this morning, the debate has been, and the great concerns for people at the sharp end, especially the drainage board people. Um, what have you got to say about um, the problems related to um, the chalk streams, the ponds, um, the uh, permeability of the land, etc. please? So I'll uh, pass that question over to Janice Hughes. Thank you, Mike. So I want to speak on behalf of our technical teams and draw your attention, first of all, in terms of the groundwater issues um, and the concerns over the ponds in Long Stanton. So we submitted a technical note in August 2021, which explained further what the drainage strategy um, includes and what the impacts are likely to be on groundwater. So firstly, to explain that, the um, the reason why we are predicting a, a reduction in groundwater levels is because once developed, the site will um, allow less infiltration. So we've taken a very much worst case assumption that in the surface water drainage strategy that there will be limited infiltration and that will um, go into the um, surface drainage network. However, as the development builds out, we'll be um, under condition and looking for all opportunities to enable that infiltration. So the assessment is, first of all, very much a worst case. That was set out in the EIA chapter as well on ground conditions and hydrogeology. Um, and 
summarised in that groundwater note. Um, there was a question earlier about the nature of the ground conditions. And um, do I have the chair's permission to share um, a, a, a diagram from the groundwater note? Would that be acceptable? Uh, which, which question is this in response to? Um, so this is regarding the issues around groundwater and our response to that. Is that, is that acceptable to explain? Yeah, if it's, explain? If it's just helpful, please do. Yeah, OK. Uh, my apologies, everything froze there. So in terms of the groundwater conditions, um, we have um, provided diagrams which show a cross section of how the site drains. And within those figures, um, we, we give you an indication of what the clay and the river terrace deposits are. So in various cross sections, you can see that the site is Kimmeridge clay overlain with river terrace deposits in locations. The section which um, goes between phase two and phase one and the um, Oakington end of the site, what you can actually see is that the river terrace deposits are in the middle and affected by groundwater changes, but actually because the clay is on either side, there is no actual flow between what's going on on phase 3A and phase phases two and one. So just to draw your attention that the um, the, the note that we prepared explains that the um, direction of flows of groundwater are such that there isn't really an interaction with what's going on in Long Stanton and the flow actually goes um, two thirds towards the northeast side and into the Beck Brook um, through the attenuation ponds that have been constructed and the other third towards the Oakington area. So just, first, can, just, first, sorry, can I just quickly interrupt, Chairman, can I ask? It's just been noted um, or stated that um, the note, what, what note are we talking about here? And also I'd like to ask as well, you're not answering my question about, I think you said at the start of your uh, presentation, you were talking uh, very quickly about you'd been uh, doing a survey be following on the problem of long Stanton ponds being empty, but you haven't actually told us uh, why they are empty. Um, I'm so, sorry, um, in terms of why they're empty, there's been an HR Wallingford report that's looked separately at that. That's related to what's gone on in North Stowe phase one. That report does not make reference to phase two or three. Um, the phase 3A site conditions are different. No, nonetheless, um, Homes England will be committed to monitoring the situation, so the construction management will enable that situation to be monitored as it, it goes on. In, and also since the time of, of that work, um, the EA now require an, a, a licence for, for dewatering. So there are many, there are controls in place to ensure that that can be controlled going forward and the site conditions are different. Okay, thank you. I think that's answered the question as best as can be. Um, question of clarity, please, from Heather Williams. Thank you. Um, so my question was about on the affordable housing. So we've heard that there's 40% on this application, but over the whole site, when you factor in all the phases, um, we're not at 40% overall. I'm just wondering whether it's something that would be considered by yourselves. I know we can't ask for more than 40%, but whether if balance sheet allowed, you would actually release more houses to make it 40% overall as you're in a different position to, to many developers and have that flexibility. Thank you. Um, I'll pass that on over to Dean Harris. Hi, I'm Dean Harris, hello councillors. <clears throat> Just a point of clarification, on phase two, we're providing 50% affordable housing. So across North Stove, the affordable housing provision is in excess of 40%, it's 41% of North Stowe as a whole. So we're meeting policy in relation to phase three and half the affordable housing is to be affordable rent. 
which meets policy requirements. So that's the proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I, I think uh, members may know I asked the question and um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And Councillor Richard Williams, please. Thank, thank you very much, Chair. Um, uh, it was useful actually to share um, that, that, that one of our um, that one of the speakers shared that report because that's exactly what I'm I'm looking at here. So so I'll assume from that that, that, that the applicants do accept that we're looking at um, a reduction in the water table of two two to three meters because that, that's what those figures are those diagrams that we were just shown um, indicate. Um, I, I would also seek a question of clarity or, or, or make the point that this report does not say that these indicated final water tables are the worst case scenario. It, it says these figures show the anticipated reduction in, in groundwater um, in, in the area of the site, which is a very different thing. Um, so um, I, I don't think it shows the worst case scenario. That, that's not the way that it's phrased. Um, it talks about anticipated. Um, and then a final point. Um, it, it was just stated that the Kingfisher Pond system um, is, is, is different, but in the phase three report from H.R. Wallingford, the first thing it says is that the Kingfisher Pond is situated in hydraulic continuity with the underlying river terrace deposit aquifer. Um, and that's exactly what we're talking about here. Um, so, you know, we know that what happened to Kingfisher Pond was not, not intended. I've, I've had a look back at the phase one reports. Uh, nobody thought this was going to happen. Um, and now we're being told that actually, even though there's going to be a two to three meter reduction further in the river terrace deposit, that won't affect you know, the, the streams at Oakington. Um, I find that um, difficult to, to, to accept. Uh, I don't know if anyone wants to come back on that. I don't think there's a question there, but if anyone does want to come back, there's an opportunity. But just in terms of clarification, yes, it is also river terrace deposits on phase 3A, but the clay um, sort of interrupts those, so it's not a continuous um, drainage system. The drainage flow within phase 3a is going to that um, point to the north and, and northeast and the south okay thank you for that with um with that there's no more question oh, sorry one more question of clarification from councillor hawkins please uh, thank you um my concern is about the construction management plan and having had to convene a meeting with those who were building out phase one to resolve issues of um, construction lorries going through over Willingham on routes that they were not supposed to according to the management plan that was in place. How do you propose to ensure in this case that the uh, construction lorries actually keep to um, the management plan once it's been agreed and Michael. it should not be going through our villages. Michael, a question around enforcement of the construction management plan. Then. Anyone? <laughs> can, can they hear us? Someone, someone respond if you can hear. Uh, apologies, Chair. I'll um, just make one quick point, just um, uh, a statement of fact, which is phase one um, isn't a Homes England development. I suspect a number of um, members know that. Uh, in terms of the, um, the routing, we're happy to look at this um, by condition and work with um, the County Council, the District Council uh, to get this right uh, going forward as part of the uh, construction environmental management plan that's to be conditioned. I don't know if Janice Hughes has anything to add to that. I, th I think it's worth noting as well that phase 3A uh, um, has access from the Southern Access Road West Dual Carriageway. So it's a different situation than phase one that has to be served from the existing roads. Okay, um, that's, so that's fine. alongside what is happening with phase two at present. That's fine. I think you've answered. Thank you. Um, there's a comeback from Councillor Hawkins. Um, I'm very concerned because it's not just your construction vehicles, it's your suppliers as well. And it was the suppliers who were actually causing serious problems uh, for phase one. So whatever it is, you would have to be responsible for that and make sure that it works. Thank you. No need to respond to that. Thank you. Okay, we well, thank you very much.
um, everyone who's contributed to that. We're going to move on to our next um, set of public speakers now, which are representatives from local parish councils. Um, first on my list I have is Councillor Dan Delamere Lyon, who's representing Long Stanton Parish Council. If you'd like to take the seat, please. And you'll probably heard this a lot now, but as usual, th three minutes uh, to present to the committee, at which point there may likely be some questions for you at the end. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Before I start, I'd just like to mention that I'm joined by remotely by one of our other members of the Parish Council, Andalo Andy Witcherly. What I'll present will cover both the 3A and 3B phases. Unfortunately, I can't stay with you after this presentation. I'll have to leave. I will try and rejoin remotely uh, when I reach my, my destination, but Councillor Witcherly can fill in anything in the meanwhile if you have any questions. Okay, that's great. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, so um, before we go too much further, I assume that everybody's familiar with this famous document. Yeah, Councillor Williams, you just mentioned it. Um, I did ask for it to be circulated to you beforehand um, because it's a very important part of the decision-making process. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Ricketts for his presentation where he mentioned the environmental impact assessment and a number of you have questioned. Sorry, sir, just for clarity, would you mind just stating what, which document it is? We can't all see. Oh, sorry, yes, okay, that's the H.R. Wallingford report. Okay, thank you. So that's the, the, the two phases of the report that were published, but it was actually a three-phase report, okay? That's clear, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, Mr. Ricketts mentioned the environmental impact assessment and stated that that had been reviewed by all. I think you've probably proven to yourselves this morning in the debate that you've had that there is doubt over the nature of the, of the environmental impact assessment and whether or not it holds true for today. If we look at the impact on Long Stanton, um, you've seen some video, you've seen some pictures. It's much worse than the pictures tell. Um, I was speaking with residents yesterday where they've had to have tons and tons of material shipped in because their garden is sinking, their house is disappearing. We have a section 106 application in for funds to contribute to solving our very real impact of that in the parish council in that our village institute building is collapsing uh, due to subsidence uh, and the cracks in it, you can actually put your hand in. So they're not small and insignificant. And this has all happened since the dewatering uh, has started for phase one. So we would suggest that uh, based on the material and uh, based on the HR Wallingford report that there is doubts to be cast over the basis of the scientific decisions that are being made and the recommendations that are being provided here. And it was worth uh, a point of note that the Environment Agency have made no mention in any of their material about any of the available data that shows that there are things going on here that have not been factored in. So from the point of view of the parish of Long Stanton, it's a very real uh, effect that we feel. And I'm sure that my colleagues from North Stowe will uh, will we'll tell you uh, more about this from their point of view and from Oakington. Um, the Kingfisher Pond is just one part of it. Please do not focus on the Kingfisher Pond. Although the report says it on the front, it's about a much bigger structure that underlies our community, provides our water, and affects us massively. And you have mentioned of farmland around. We have farmers with no f uh, water in their wells that they can draw. Where they have a license to draw it, they can't draw it to, to water their crops and run their businesses. Um, so from our point of view, I'll, I'll keep it very brief and, and sum up. Uh, if you're going to make a decision, uh, I would expect it to be based on believable and credible scientific information. And I think we've called that into doubt today. We would ask that that scientific basis is reviewed, set correctly, and decisions and plans are made on that. I know this report suggests that there should be more work done. I'm pleased to see that uh, we have some engagement going on, and I know that Stephen Kelly has uh, been involved in that as well, uh, to look at what has happened. It probably is accidental. Um, you don't design for things like this to happen, um, but we need to get to the bottom of what is happening there. So if you're going to make a decision and you're going to move to approve the development, we would ask that there would be conditions put in place that uh, there is a fully understood, costed, and importantly, funded plan to remediate the damage that's been done with the work from, excuse me, from phase one, and that that is done on a basis of no impact to the further development in terms of section 106 contribution and community facilities. Uh, it's all too easy to spend a fortune on these things and then uh, take that out of the cost of the, uh, of the development that is taking place. And in addition, Mr. Fulton mentioned uh, monitoring. We'd ask that 
you know, in the spirit of transparency, that monitoring is installed to keep tabs on what's going on with the water levels as this development progresses. We're very focused on today. We've heard about you know 2027 and beyond where water becomes a challenge. It's obviously a point of such contention that we need to have data available and transparency of that data to allow us all to see what's happening as the development on North Stowe continues. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, before we go to questions of clarity, one thing I should have asked at the beginning was, can I just confirm you got permission from Longstanton Parish Council to represent their views here today? Correct, I do. Good. Thank you very much. I'll have to cover that off. Of course. Uh, Councillor Roberts, please. Thank you, Chairman. Through you, Chairman. Good afternoon, sir. Um, can you just remind me again, you were talking about some properties and including your own um, uh, build, parish building, I think. Can you just explain again to me uh, what people are uh, now um, having to, to deal with um, and have more people got concerns about their properties and when did this really start showing its face? Thank you. Um, certainly. So um, the ponds are obviously a very obvious visual indicator and that's been present for uh, well, pretty much months after the, 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 the dewatering first started and it's been a constantly deteriorating situation. It obviously takes time for uh, things like the drying of the land to take effect and subsidence to take effect, but um, certainly we've had notable subsidence in the Village Institute for well over two years. It may even be three. COVID makes things a little bit hazy as to exactly when we were there and when we weren't. Um, but certainly talking to residents uh, in and around the village, um, they have seen the effects building ever since the development work started on North Stoke. So it's, it's, it's not something that's happened recently. It's been a progressive thing. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you very much. I don't think there's any... Oh, sorry, Councillor Wilson, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, has there been any engineering reports um, done on this building to um, connect the, the problems people are experiencing with the dewatering? I'm not aware of those at this point, no. Okay. However, the buildings do all sit on top of the structure. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't believe there's any further questions for yourself, so thank you very much for your time today. Thank you very today. much for your time, everyone. And we will move members to our next public speaker, who's a representative of North Stowe Town Council, Councillor Richard Owen, who I believe is joining us online. Councillor Owen. Yes, hello. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear and see you fine. Great, thank you. Good afternoon. Great. Thank you for joining us today. Um, as with other speakers, as close to the three minute mark as you can. Um, and then if you want to hold on for any questions of clarity at the end. And before you kick off, yep. do you have the permission of, of your town council to represent them today? I do. Good. Thank you very much. So, whenever you're ready, please. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Chair. I'm uh, Richard Owen, Town Mayor of North Stowe, and thanks very much for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, the North Stowe Town Council broadly supports the application for Phase 3A. However, this support is subject to strict planning conditions which must be imposed to manage the impact of development on surrounding villages, current and future North Stowe residents, and our local environment. The first and most critical of these, as we've already heard many times today, is around hydrology and groundwater. Independent studies and our own analysis, based on publicly available data, has shown that water levels in the gravel seam, which runs under North Stowe Phase 1 and Long Stanton, have been badly affected by earlier phases of development in North Stowe. This has resulted in many water features and ponds drying out, with loss of habitats, as we've just seen, as well as structural damage to buildings within Long Stanton, as noted just now by Councillor de la Merlion. Phase 3A sits on that same gravel seam further upstream, so any impact to groundwater levels here will have a knock-on impact, contrary to claims here just made by the applicant. And as Councillor Dr Williams noted earlier, the Arcadist impact assessment in the current plans projects a permanent further two to three metre drop in water levels as a result of the development. We note that drafting of a planning condition has been proposed to monitor the groundwater levels through development, but we also seek here a condition to mitigate this impact through revisions to the drainage strategy and for the impact of the development to be considered beyond just the phase 3a boundaries. Further lowering of the groundwater levels underneath North Stowe and Long Stanton will significantly worsen the impact and damage that we've already seen and we cannot let that happen. We must also learn the, the lessons of development in phase one when it comes to phasing. 
of the development. So most residents in phase one will have to wait until at least 2024 for roads and cycle paths around them to be finished, which is largely due to the sequence of parcels being built in, as well as a lack of access through the southern part of North Dover building traffic. Residents in future phases must not be subjected to the same mistakes being made. So we recommend a phasing plan which allows primary roads and cycleways to be completed as building is complete and welcome the comments uh, made in the last couple of days by officers to add a condition to that effect. We also note that an adequate construction environment management plan must also be in place before development starts in order to mitigate the impact of dust and noise throughout construction. On a uh, more positive note, we do support the plans for green infrastructure throughout phase 3A and the maintenance of green separation between North Stowe and Oakington. And we believe the planned open space will be of great benefit to residents both from North Stowe and the surrounding villages. In summary, we've, we've got the opportunity here to build a green and sustainable town that we can all be, all be proud of. But for that to happen, the planning committee has to take action and impose the conditions we need to make that happen. But thank you very much. That's great. Thank you very much, Councillor Owen. Um, members, do we have any questions or clarification for Councillor Owen? No, I think that was all succinct. Thank you very much for, uh, for your time this afternoon. Okay, members, our final public speaker is from Swayze Parish Council. Um, sorry, I don't have whoever it is, his name in front of me, but uh, I believe they are either in the room or online. Is there a representative from Swavesey Parish Council? Do, do, not 3A. Okay, fine. <laughs> Tick. <laughs> okay, members, that's all of the parish councils that wish to uh, make representations to us today. So we'll move on to local members. Um, I believe we have Councillor Handley, who represents Willingham and Over, on the line. Yes, yes thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Chair. Um, um, I think you probably know the rules now. Three minutes, and then if there's any questions for you at the end, um, you uh, just hold on the line for those. Thank you. Yes, yes, indeed. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I, I'm the District Councillor for the Villages of Over and Willingham. And as Councillor Hawkins has already alluded, uh, Willingham does have a big problem with volume and speed of traffic uh, passing through the village. And although not of course, not all heavy traffic is connected to North Stowe. Some of it certainly is, and it shouldn't be. Um, the, the, the current construction traffic management plan, it's been in place since the early phases, um, has been pretty much impossible to enforce. Uh, it's really easy to spot construction vehicles travelling to or from North Stowe via Willingham. It happens all the time. Uh, but there hasn't been a single successful enforcement case because, um, you know, enforcement officers <clears throat> can't act uh, unless they get corroborated evidence of breaches uh, and vid video evidence. And since the, since the construction vehicles um, need to be shown entering or leaving one of the developer's sites, you know, we're told that simply recording them uh, is not enough. And the evidence needs to show that the vehicles driving through Willingham village as well. It's fiendishly difficult to monitor and gather the, the, the enforcement evidence. Drivers know it and they pay no attention to it. So the people of Willingham are, are really being badly affected. I get more of complaints about this than any other. Um, so I would urge the planning committee to take this opportunity to beef up the transport plan for this, certainly for this phase of development. Um, and to see what they can do to make sure that technology is used, ANPR or vehicle tracking or whatever it is, uh, to identify vehicles that ignore the transport plan and to give the council's enforcement team the evidence they need to act. Um, I just uh, a plea, please, um, please use this opportunity to protect the people of Willingham. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Handley. Uh, any questions or clarification for the Councillor? Councillor Heather Williams, please. Chair, I feel this might be one that <coughs> might need to be sent to officers, but um, I think many of us can understand the, the issues that you're raising, Councillor Handley. Um, but when it comes to the evidence and, and what have you, um, do you, do you think that there is actually ways that would meet the reasonable test for conditioning for this, the suggestions that you're making, or that might be 
I appreciate you might need officers' support to answer that. Well, all I can say is we we discussed this um, at great detail about three years ago um, with the various developers, and it was agreed that an ANPR system would work. Uh, and L and Q estates have been uh, well, all kinds of. They're all kinds of reasons why it hasn't happened. Um, COVID being one, um, but you know. Uh, I think the people of the, village, of, of, of the village of Willingham are really exasperated that it's taken, you know, three years and still nothing's been done. And they fear that this next phase will just add to their woes. Um, I, I, and that's um, that's the reason for me speaking today. I'm sorry, I probably haven't answered your question. And if I haven't, yes, I agree. It probably needs uh, officer in, uh, input. Chair, thank you. And like I say, we, we can appreciate the the issues. So you've had, if I can clarify, you've had a meeting where an AMPR system could work. Maybe if officers could advise if that would meet the reasonable test, because it doesn't seem unreasonable to, to ask for it to be conditioned. I think Mr Kelly's going to come in. Uh, um, uh, it would be appropriate, absolutely, in terms of uh, the planning condition. As I said, in fact, some of the conversations and our lessons on things like uh, Adam Brooks um, Road in Cambridge and ANPR suggest that there might be slightly better ways even than ANPR to be able to deal with it. And I've referred to that earlier. Um, so uh, it's it's an option. Um, if it's helpful, we'll perhaps review the condition to make sure that it's dealt with. I'm sure that Homes England um, are also conscious of practice across the country in terms of this, but it's a very serious point and, and you know, we will be exploring the most effective means possible within within reason, as you say, against the planning test, but it would be reasonable to attribute um, on a development of this scale that type of obligation. That's great. Thank Chair, you. can I ask then, because it's we we could um, easily forget things throughout the day, can um, we add that to a, a list if you're making one of potential conditions? It's, to it's on the list. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Councillor Wilson, then Carl, then Hales. Thank you. Hello, um, Councillor Handley. Um, early on, I asked them a very similar question. I was told that there are all sorts of technologies coming online, one of which is GPS. Was that ever discussed with you? No, the ANPR was presented to us as the, the best solution. Um, and this was in discussion with our own uh, enforcement officers. Yeah. Um, I, you know, technology moves very fast. This was three years ago, and, and it could well be that GPS tracking devices are now a better solution. And uh, I don't think, to be honest, uh, I or the people of Willingham would mind how how it's done, um, as long as you know enforcement can take place and and that we stop the large large number of vehicles that pass through the village. Can I ask the officers again whether that be part of the conditions that if the GPS technology is available that um, destination and provenance is included in the condition for all the construction vehicles just to make sure that they're not rack running through yep. villages. Sure I mean Mr. Kelly I'm sure your response will be similar to the last one but um, yeah I mean go on if you want to. Uh, uh Absolutely, obviously, um, and technology may well evolve even even further. But um, you know, we, I think we're I'm confirming we're committed to do the, the very best um, technology solution now and in the future. And we'll look, we'll just uh, review the recommendation that we had in respect of conditions on this subject um, to, to see if, if if there's anything further that could be added to pick up that concern. Thank you, Councillor Khan. Please. <coughs> Sorry, um, <laughs> Councillor Handy. Uh, the I, w I wondered if you could uh, elaborate on what are the main um, lorries passing through the village? Are they mainly gravel lorries? Are they builders' merchants' lorries with timber? Uh, I suspect the gravel coming from the Needingworth uh, pits, but I don't know. I wanted if you could confirm that. Yeah. Yes. I I gather. Well, yes. 
it's it's mainly gravel gravel vehicles, but not 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 a, just that. Um, also, builder supplies as well. But I think the the gravel extraction vehicles, because of the the, the location, as you say, of gravel uh, supplies, um, are it's there's quite a detour for vehicles to go via you know St Ives or wherever onto the A14 the way they should go it's a it's quite a there's there's quite an incentive to cut through the village of Willingham and uh, boy do they take it <laughs> okay uh, I just wanted to pose the question whether there might be some means also of ne therefore uh, ne um, coordinating with the suppliers to ensure that uh, perhaps that uh, it's impossible for them to to go in the other dire your direction no maybe the Officers can uh, ask. Yeah, answer probably, whether probably a question for the officers, I think. <laughs> it's okay, Councillor. You don't have to answer. Um, Councillor Hales, please. <coughs> Thank you, Jeff. Through you to Councillor Henley. Just, um, Councillor Henley, can you just confirm? You said it, the uh, conditions are already in place for vehicle tracking of some description or another for the the current. Uh, not not vehicle tracking. No, uh, the transport plan uh, forbid you know forbids um, construction traffic uh, travelling through Willingham. But the, the the problem is that enforcement of that is very very difficult. Uh, and simply because if you if you if you follow them from North Stow, um, you've got to know exactly where the lorry has come from. You, ha you know there may be four or five developers on site. And you've got to know where it's come from, otherwise the enforcement officers can't act. So that makes it difficult from one end. And if you want to plot the, 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 the route for construction vehicles coming through Willingham towards North Stow, um, you, you know, you, you, you've got such a lot of, of vehicles coming through, um, you may not actually get on the tail of um, one that is going to North Stow. It's really difficult to provide the... Uh, the 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 evidence we found um and we've all tried um in the last three years to do that uh, as i say the lorry drivers know it and um thumb their noses really through you to uh, mr kelly i suppose really this ultimately sits with conditions and what have you that have previously uh, been uh, applied to the current build I mean, is there anything that can be learned from that now and then perhaps enforced in a better way so that we can learn so that any any additional phases and traffic management um, processes can then be severely beefed up? I mean, I've had experience in my neck of the woods where the developers have been exemplary, frankly, and the one next door, you could have, well, same situation as Councillor Hanley, really. They come in different different colours, so to speak, the builders, so. Sure, I mean, we can go into lots of detail about this in the debates, if you like. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'd not spend a lot of time asking officers questions at this stage, but um, obviously all the concerns and comments around conditioning has been noted. Um, sorry, Councillor Hawkins for Councillor Hanley. No, okay. Agenda meetings that was trying to find solutions um, to the problem. And yes, we can learn from that. I don't know why L and Q, who had undertaken to actually put the system in place, didn't do it. Um, but we can learn from that. But definitely in this case, we need to do some, which is why I um, asked the question of the applicants earlier on. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Handley, I think that concludes all the questions to yourself. So thank you very much for thank, holding on so you. long. Chair, just one very quick question. Councillor Goff, who's the county councillor for Willingham, has also asked to speak, but he can't be here. He's given me some words. Um, is he? Is it down to for me to present those words, or is that? I do. I do have that note. Um, how long will it take you to read them? Uh, it would take. It would take three minutes. To be honest, a lot of the points that um, Councillor Goff makes are very similar to the ones I've made. Okay, if uh, you could, if you could edit. Uh, in that case. Well, at the risk, at the risk of. At uh, the risk of um, annoying Councillor Goff, perhaps I could just say I, I won't. I won't take the opportunity. But um, I'm not going to stop you. But if you... What, it would reinforce what I've just said. Okay, appreciate that. I will we'll let Neil know. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um,
Thank you, Councillor. So we have now the two local members for Long Stanton, um, Councillors Chung Johnson and Mallion, starting with Councillor Chung Johnson, please. Hi, just to clarify, it's just uh, myself today, but I am speaking on behalf of Councillor Mallion, so this statement is from the both of us. Okay. Um, so first of all, we'd like to begin by thanking Homes England for all the consultations, work and engagement they've given us and local residents for Phase 3 and 3B. They have been very comprehensive. As district councillors, however, we wish to object to the overall development based on the following specific issues. I'm actually summarising here our comments in general. We made more detailed ones and they are available on the council website for those who want to read them. Uh, firstly, on the green separation and inappropriate development, including excessive building heights about along the Oakington edge. Uh, we like to thank uh, Homes England for the modified uh, uh, changes they made, um, but we still feel that the proposed green separation is not sufficient to provide a buffer between the development of North Stowe and the village of Oakington. It places, it's estimated that this, in places, sorry, it's estimated this green separation narrows to 40 metres. Oakington residents and the parish council have raised objections that the boundary of North Stowe will now directly back onto the gardens of existing properties and affect their privacy, and we support these objections. In addition, we are concerned about excessive building heights along the Oakington edge, and the original North Stowe Area Action Plan proposed height restrictions of two storeys here so that buildings would be located behind substantial natural buffers, um, but unfortunately this application still proposes three-storey houses bordering Oakington and we would argue strongly that if an approval is given for housing along the Oakington edge that those directly facing the village should be at a maximum of two-storey height and, and we already have precedent with this uh, for Rampton Drift on phase two. Uh, finally we support the concerns raised by residents on Station Road regarding the removal of trees adjacent to their property. Without these trees there'll be nothing to separate them from the development and the proposed bus only access to the site. The second objection is around the location of proposed design of the Southern Access Road. Broadly, we uh, uh, agree with the Parish Council's objections, uh, which are on the design and location of the Southern Access Road East. If it is required, then we would support trying to locate this in the vicinity of the new A1037 existing Dry Drayton roundabout, rather than feeding onto Dry Drayton Road nearer to the village. Um, we do think that the proposed road will, route will lead to an unacceptable increase in traffic, through Oakington, although we note County Council's highways uh, modelling suggesting it won't. Drainage and flooding is our third concern. Um, flood attenuation is essential to Oakington Village and much of it is located on a floodplain. So um, the village itself has suffered several recent flood events, most recently at the end of 2020, uh, when many other villages in the district also uh, suffered. Unfortunately, this updated submission has not alleviated the serious concerns. Um, so we are asking that should permission be granted that firm conditions and commitments are sought uh, to sufficiently mitigate the flood risk to Oakington to at least a one in a 200 year event standard plus a 40% climate change allowance. And we would further commit you to the comments made by the Parish Council and the Oakington Flood Mitigation Group and the proposed conditions which they have asked to be attached. Fourth, ecology. We note with concern the cons comments from the ecology officer on a number of issues remain uh, and we would ask that these important ecological considerations are also addressed prior to any approval. On the SEMP, we agree with many of the comments already been made, so I, I won't go into them in detail, but specifically we want uh, work on development and timing, strict limits on times of construction, specific requirements on noise and dust monitoring specifically. Um, we have had problems currently with residents on phase two and phase one, uh, mitigations and routes to resolve issues and limits of construction vehicle movement with no construction vehicle access via Oakington Village. We also support uh, North Stowe Town Council comments on phasing uh, that works for residents, uh, unlike it, uh, in phase one. Um, in our original comments on this application, we had not raised the issue of dewatering as we did not have the findings of the independent hydrology report that Longstanton Parish Council mentioned. Um, and this report links dewatering in the early phases, as we are aware. We acknowledge the concerns um, raised by Longstanton Parish Council, uh, and we share those concerns of those of their local residents about further development on Long North Stowe and the impact on groundwater levels. Um, we note that Homes England have provided an assessment of the impact uh, and we note that the Environment Agency has not raised objections, but we would ask that the Planning Committee consider this matter carefully and require that monitoring of groundwater levels on the site continues ahead of and throughout any development on phase three should the application be approved today. Thank you. 
Thank you for that, Sarah. Um, members, do you have any questions or clarification for Councillor Chung Johnson? Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you. Through yourself, Chair, because um, it was mentioned um, in your statements, Sarah, about the um, Rampton Drift. And I remember from that application that actually the heights there, it was, it was a very emotive issue because there'd been assurances given that we wouldn't exceed a certain height and then the application did. Um, is, is what you're reflecting here a similar situation, a sort of replication of that situation? Um, and then perhaps, again, this might be more for officers, but just if we're keeping a note, if it's possible to sort of see the diagram with the heights um, and um, again, just to give us that, that clarification. So um, thank you for yourself, Chair Sarah. Yeah, so I think what we're saying, uh, so for phase two, just to recap, the design guide suggest, said that uh, two-storey houses on that Rampton Village edge should uh, be limited. Um, what actually happened and what did get approved was that two storeys immediately in front of the village were approved, but then we had a three-storey kind of literally just behind it. So although technically it met the design guide in spirit, it really didn't. And I wouldn't want us to be in the same situation in phase three, where potentially we say yes, to no to having only two story uh, houses on the Oakington edge, but then for a technicality of that, if you could just put it a few meters behind that would still count. Um, I think we need to be very, very clear that should we um, propose that uh, houses should be limited on the Oakington edge, um, that we make it clear that that um, is adhered to strictly. Thank you, Chair. And the diagram, I don't, yeah, that might take time if it's possible to see. Um, I think there's a request to see a diagram of the building heights. I'm not sure if that's immediately available. If not, we can probably pull that up in the debate, I think, if it gives officers time to find it. Um, in the interim, does anyone have any further questions of clarification for um, the councillor? Councillor Roberts, please. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I'm sure that you've listened in this morning to um, a variety of people who've put their concerns forward regarding... Uh, all matters related to water, drainage, etc. And I'm a little surprised because I don't think you've actually, in your presentation, said that you um, utterly share those concerns because what the people who have spoken to us this morning, over a, a, a wide variety of, of people and, and groups, is saying that this application is actually potentially disastrous after 2027. Can I have your, your views on that? Do you not support that um, information that's being given? Because it's not just plucked out of air. It's being given to us, I understand in my, in, in my view, um, in, a, in a very um, experienced and knowledgeable manner. Do you not share that concern? I mean, one of the things that has been asked is for a deferral. I, I'm quite surprised as the local member, knowing what your residents are having to, the consequences that are happening already, um, can you explain to me why you're not pushing that yourself? So up to you whether you answer that or not. Yeah, I, just for clarification, Councillor Roberts, we are objecting to this proposal for this application as a whole, and we do uh, acknowledge and support the concerns raised by our own residents and the parish council on dewatering as a whole from the North Stowe uh, development. We are also aware, however, that obviously we are talking about North Stowe as a whole and its dewatering concerns, but you as a planning committee are looking at phase three only, um, and we wouldn't want to you know, presuppose your judgments on, on that. But just for a, a, a moment of clarity, we did, we do, we do represent our residents' concerns and we represent those of the parish councils and the North Stowe Town Council in their concerns. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Hales, please. Thank you, Chair, through you. Um, Sarah, you, know, you talked about the three-storey buildings behind the two-storey buildings, which was not necessarily within the spirit. Um, would you and, and colleagues back at the ranch have any kind of distance that you would you would hope to expect before a three-storey building was constructed away from the edge? Um, I don't think we have a specific, I wouldn't want to speak on behalf of Hogan to Parish Council, obviously, or, or designate exact distance, but I think 
in the instance that I was talking about, that the, the two rows of houses were very close together, whereas you'd expect an actual kind of house worth of depth and a garden from your two story before you then started three story, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think that's that's clear. Okay. Thank you. Um, Sarah, there's no further questions or clarification for yourself. So thank you again for joining us this morning um, and for answering the questions. We will, members, that concludes all of our public speakers. Um, members, I'll put it to you whether you want to go into the debate now or if you want to break for lunch. Okay. All right. We'll break for lunch then. It is now quarter past one. If we have half an hour and we're back at quarter to two, uh, then we can restart. So we do have quite a lot more to get through. So members, we're now in adjournment for half an hour. Thank you.
Okay, welcome back everyone to South Cam's District Council's Planning Committee. We have now concluded our public speaking element, so we're moving straight into the debate. Members, as mentioned at the beginning, to try and keep some kind of um, structure to the debate, um, I think we agreed to try and keep it um, grouped. So the first group we have is sections one and two of the key issues in the planning assessment, which refer to the principle of development, land use and vision, and the parameter plans. So members, I will throw it open to yourselves if anyone has any points they wish to make or questions, of, questions for officers um, around those particular sections of the report. Councillor Williams. Uh, thank you, Church. Sorry, there was a couple of things that we asked for, for example, <coughs> the heights and possibly the letter to deal with the Swayzing Town Drainage Board. I don't, I just wonder if they've been found over lunch. Mr. Kelly? Uh, in terms of the, the, the height, um, uh, I have actually, um, uh, Mr. Huntington can produce the parameter plan that you can see, um, if that's helpful uh, at the moment, because you said parameter plans are part of this. Mm -hmm. um, if he could just share the screen, it shows the extent of the two story parameters on the edge of uh, Oakington. Right, yes, yeah, so there's another one that's come in. It's taking its time to, to transfer over. I think the important uh, edge point is where you can see it says uh, 80 metres. Sorry. I'll just show you if it's. There we go. So, so just if I. If I right. Um, so just to, to help um, uh, councillors a little bit, you can see that we've tried to mark on the distances between um, the existing edge of, of Oakington uh, that was touched upon earlier in terms of um, comments around two-storey development. So those are the separation distances if effectively over, a tree, over the tree belt which is to be retained. If we can just go on to the next slide. It's having a few technical issues. Whilst we're, waiting for, whilst we're waiting for Mr. Huntington, perhaps um, uh, in respect of the, uh, I think you wanted clarification about the IDB's comments. Um, uh, I just let me just check with my uh, colleague whether or not we've we've been able to locate that uh, on the on the file. Um, I think the IDB did refer to a letter from the Environment Agency from January. I'm conscious that there was a subsequent letter which is on the file from the Environment Agency uh, that dates from 25th of August last year, in which they um, uh, indicate that they have been engaging with Anglian Water around the Uttams Drove issue. And certainly, um, uh, and I'll read out to you, we're assured the operation of Utton's Drove WRC will be in compliance with land drainage solution. Um, I therefore advise you that the concerns we raised against a number of planning applications, including North Stowe's phases 3A and 3B, relating to Utton's, Utton's Drove, have been addressed and that there is no material reason in terms of foul water drainage to prevent permission from being granted. Obviously, you've heard the concerns of the IDB about um, discharges associated with foul water drainage and the consequential impacts on water um, uh, and flood risk. Uh, but certainly, the Environment Agency have clarified their position of no objection at the moment. Um, I can see uh, Sharon Brown. Um, uh, Sharon, I don't know whether you wish to, to comment on the IDB point or not. Uh, 
you're muted. Sorry, Sharon. That, that was my understanding as well, Steve and Kelly. I think we, we have a map. Thank you. So, so um, if we can just explain the, the colours there, you can hopefully see the kind of pale yellow and then a kind of tan colour, I suppose, uh, on the uh, parameter plan. This is one of the three drawings, um, or one of the, one of the drawings, uh, that would be um, subject to the permission, so approved as part of the permission, and form the basis for the design code um, uh, that, that will be required. But the t uh, where, just above, directly above where it says Oakington, um, that area there in the, uh, where the cursor is now is for t maximum of two storeys or seven metres high, I think, development. That's the parameter. Um, that strip that you can see, that, that, uh, the depth of that is about 40 metres or so deep, which is potentially sufficient for not just the first house, but depending on configuration, the, the house behind it. Uh, it. Of course, the committee may well have a view about whether that's sufficient to cover the concern. Um, it obviously doesn't, uh, and uh, you can see the movement network. So the, the, the grey line uh, is part of the movement strategy. It doesn't include two storeys uh, along the... Um, full extent of that boundary with um, uh, facing towards Oakington. Thank you. Just just to try and it does help to sort of visualise these things. Um, so from on that map, where would buildings above three storeys begin? The, the, the um, yellow area um, so rather than the town, the, ye the yellow area, in fact, I've got a map in front of me, um, sometimes just to go back to analogue, isn't it? Is, is for three-storey development. Thank you, Mike. Um, so it says, uh, if we can just zoom in, so up to three storeys, 11 metres. So that spur is either two storeys or three storeys maximum, up to 11 metres. Um, the, the, the scale and the heights actually increase towards the centre of the site, so somewhere away from, um, from, from the edges. I don't know whether you can zoom out, Mike, to, to help that. So obviously the central area, uh, and you can see those blobs which uh, correspond with the edge of the military lake. Those are up to seven storeys, uh, and the, um, the uh, orange area is up to, or the kind of red pinky colour is up to five, five storeys. The darker or at the Sorry, the orange, that bit there, thanks, Mike, is up to five storeys, and the red, or the pink yeah, area... That's up to four. Sorry, is up to four, five. and that's up to okay. five. So I think, I think the answer to the question was the spur that goes towards Oakington there is, is two and three storeys, so the yellow section is three, and the slightly greyer section is two. So that's... So the depth of that is 40 metres... Um, but Mike might be able to bring up an indicative layout plan that will give you a feel for what that looks like. Clearly, um, if you wanted to um, extend the depth of that two-storey um, uh, demise, um, it's a matter for the committee to do. My, my view, given that um, it wouldn't be um, increasing the environmental effects to reduce the heights in, in that area, uh, is that it's something um, that would be within the gift of the committee to seek to direct. Um, Thank you. The, the application uh, conditions and the resolution could provide for an adjustment to that. In the event that Homes England were not prepared to accept it, they clearly need to bring the matter back to you. But um, there is no greater effect if it was in the committee's uh, desire to see two-storey elements uh, uh, taken forwards uh, further along the parameter edge uh, to, the, to the development. Uh, come back, Heather. Yes, thank you. Um, can, I, can I sort of add that to your list, Chair, just in, in the event that it was brought forward, I think that that should sort of spur, are we calling it, um, should all be lower story and I have to say I'm a bit concerned of 
not just the bit that comes out, but towards the left as I'm looking at it, you know, anything that's close to Openton, I think we should have sort of a, a phasing in of the stories, um, which probably be more aesthetically pleasing as, as well. Um, almost creates a sort of <coughs> mountain type. We don't have many hills in South Cairns. We could, but it would look that way maybe. Okay, it's been. Uh, I, I, didn't catch I think that. the uh, the request for the conditions been been noted anyway. It's on my on my list of conditions. Um, Councillor Richard Williams, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I was actually about to make a similar point, but the bottom left. But I'm I'm kind of interested in what is over the red line there. Whether there is housing in in that area, because we've got a line, a measurement line going kind of sort of south ish. But we didn't really get one going the other angle. Um, I think we so, might be about to see a photo. Lovely. And the other one I had was on the spur, I think, from memory, the measurement from the end of the spur was 210 metres. Well, I think that was to the house, no, 110, but that was to the house, not to the back of the garden. So the distance to the back of the garden to the red line in the top right is actually less than 110, if I'm right, because that's going to the house, not, not the garden. Good stuff that clarified. Okay, so yes, I think the answer is yes, that is to the centre of the property, not to the back of the garden, so it would be less. Yeah, about um, 50 or 60, sorry. Okay. About half by the looks of things. But, um, and Mike, I think Councillor Williams wanted to see what was um, in the bottom left. He wants to see what's there already, so I think there, where you are now. So that's where we are, so that red line indicates the line we saw in the previous picture. Chair, probably just helpful to, to clarify as well, um, if Mr Huntington could show the parameter plan um, for the green spaces, because the, the tree belt that you see there um, it is to be retained. There was some further work done um, on that edge, um, which resulted in an increase, uh, as the report notes, of that separation distance. But um, for your assurance, the parameter plans retain the woodland um, the wooden planted belt that you see between the new homes and the old ones. You can see underneath them, uh, you know, the, the trees are not um, a total and absolute screen, but you, uh, and you can glimpse properties from the site through that area, but they do provide a fairly substantial component of, of the indicative screen. Of the area, so it's got no, um, this isn't one of the uh, drawings that would be uh, subject to an approval, but it is an indicative plan that gives an indication of that relationship. Can you just lift that up slightly so that we can see the Openton properties? Thank you. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. Um, Councillor Hales, please. Thank you, Chair. In actual fact, I was going to say, could you just leave that slide back up if you don't mind? I completely agree with uh, Heather um, with regards to the, the heights of the buildings and what have you in that spur. Uh, 40 metres is practically nothing in, in relation to this, the size of this overall uh, phase. Uh, I mean, more close to home, we have a, a, a 30 to 40 metre green barrier on one of the developments at home, and you could literally trip over it and bang your head on the other side. So 40 metres is nothing. So the, the, the less impact you have on Oakington with the new development, the better, frankly. Um, I would be with Homes England insistent that they think it's a great idea. Okay, thank you very much. And Councillor Khan, please. I was likely going to go on the same, uh, comment on the same points about the, the height of the buildings uh, and the, also the, southern, the, the southernmost point, which was the other area which was close by. I did want to ask whether the, um, whether the trees around the, uh, in the tree belt are deciduous or coniferous. Can we answer that? Um, from, uh, I believe they're deciduous. The predominance is... Because that has quite an impact yes. upon the, uh, the, the screening effect, obviously, that you can see through deciduous trees through half so the year. The, the, when I was on site in uh, late autumn, the mix of trees, though, means that some of those deciduous trees retain their leaves, even though they're not, um, obviously, green and, and, and verdant a bit more. So that, But assume there's a degree of permeability, absolutely. There, there's a mix of species. And... Okay. I believe we have another plan on the screen now, members, which is uh, 
whatever we're looking at there. <laughs> there we go. I think that's a, an indicative overview with the existing trees. With the existing trees. Okay. Councillor Hawkins, please. Thank you, Chair. Just looking at that, I wondered if it was possible to increase the depth of the tree belt. Um, just thinking, because we had something similar with Bonnier Field and Highfields Caldicott. Um, and yes, you know, distances, once the thing's on the ground, doesn't look as far as, far as it does when it's, um, when it's blank. Okay. So so potentially, perhaps, increase the tree belt. Yep, that's been noted as well. Thank you. Are you... We're just going to get another just, officer comment. Just to clarify, obviously that's the extent of the parameter plan around the um, green uh, infrastructure uh, and uh, the built development area, you can see then the woodland uh, and the um, extent of the, uh, some green space uh, between the woodland and the um, development area uh, or near, where the, near where the cursor is. The, the depth of that was increased um, uh, that the separation was increased uh, through an amendment during the application phase. Uh, I think if you were seeking to um, in extend further the green space into the development area, uh, that would be something that, that potentially had implications for the quantum of development and the, and the layout, and I couldn't comment on whether that's possible within the scheme, but certainly the use of the green space and the planting regime that supplemented the existing um, tree belt is something that would, is within the gift of the reserve matters but, uh, and the design code. Okay. Well, members, I think we've had a good debate on that particular section. Um, we'll move on to the second grouping, which is section three, uh, and that revolves around access and transport. So if um, members had any comments they wish to make or any further points they want clarifying um, around any, any elements to do with access, transportation or highways issues, please. Sorry, Councillor Williams, please. Take it, that's me. Um, <laughs> it's only two of us today, sometimes it's three, it gets very complicated. Um, so just to re-emphasise after the comments from Councillor Hanley that if this is approved, I think I think we, we sort of spoke about AMPR and, and GPS, but the reality is we don't know what the technology is going to be. So if we could have conditioning that... Um, sort of puts in the minimum of AMPR, because we've heard that's something that's recognised, um, but that can be updated to some, if, um, and modernised as it goes along. Some wording that enables for change, but I think we want to at least put a, the, the sort of backstop in, rather than just saying something, because I think that's kind of what was being alluded to, that they need to be a bit more concrete. So a minimum level... Um, but giving flexibility. But I see Mr. Reid is waving. That doesn't always bode well for my suggestions. Mr. Reid. Um, I've uh, recommended that, in fact, we look at dealing with um, uh, traffic issues and routing matters in the planning obligation rather than by way of a, a condition. And certainly Denton's are, are supportive of that. That will allow us one, to include a lot more detail and hopefully will give us um, greater certainty in, in relation to enforcement. Relieved that wasn't me getting my knuckles wrapped, Chair. No, that's a, that's a pat on the back. So, well <laughs> Okay, um, members, any further points in the debate on traffic? We have councillors Wilson and Hales, please. Um, just to add to um, Councillor Williams' point, um, I, and I accept that this is being referred later for the, the um, to be discussed further. But I, I, I would like to know that it's going to look at both the provenance of these construction vehicles and the destinations, because once they've gone beyond the site, anything can happen. And this is the problem experienced by my village in particular, where people get onto the A14 and then they take a shortcut when they've got beyond the bounds of the, the construction site. So I think it, we do need to have 
both the provenance of these vehicles and the destinations. I think that's been, been noted. Thank you. Councillor Hales, please. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to say something now that um, Mr. Reid may well say no. <laughs> um, but is it possible to have any kind of um, encouragement to the, the main contractor that in the, the transit of the vehicles, delivery vehicles, backwards and forwards and what have you, as has been discussed now, that in conjunction with any AAPR, AMPR information and what have you, that there are essentially a penalty clause attached to the suppliers and the, and the, the transport um, carriers, if you like. This is, this is actually taking place as we speak with a big development we were talking about earlier um, in Melbourne, where they have actually dismissed contractors for not obeying what they've actually said in the thing. So if we can lay that down as a, as a if you like, a, a, I don't know how we do it, but yeah, for the lawyers. Uh, yes, Councillor, I, I think it's, it's a lot easier to include that sort of provision in the planning obligation because, uh, yes, you can get the main developer to confirm the action they will take if any of their subcontractors or suppliers doesn't ad adhere. And I'm assuming then that the main contractor is and held responsible for not following his own diktat. The, the obligation will be entered into by Homes England as the landowner and then they will have to covenant in the planning obligation as to what they will do to uh, provide a satisfactory solution and to enforce the obligations. Thank you very much. Councillor Rippeth, please. I hope I'm coming in at the right point here. Um, access and transport, can we also discuss um, not transport for building the development, but also once it's built? Yeah. Yes, anything highways related. Um, I'd gathered, I think, from, the, from reading the report and also from the presenting officer's presentation, which seems like about two centuries ago now, um, this morning, that the second road... So, uh, is it the southeast or the southwest road may not actually come to fruition as a main access road into North Stowe, and that will be based, I think, on modal shift. And can I just check what your kind of parameters will be for that and how that will be um, tested? And indeed, do you think that in the end that may not be built, and what impact could that have have elsewhere? On other villages. Okay, I think Mr. Kelly's going to answer this one. Uh, I'll, I'll start, but I'll ask uh, Tam in a second. Uh, yeah, so so just to clarify, obviously, the the um, Southern Access Relief Road East, um, the modelling uh, suggests that it may not be required dependent upon the level of modal shift that is achieved. Uh, and obviously, you've heard some of the concerns about people, about the potential um, uh, for uh, rat running. Um, I think it's probably best for uh, Tam Parry to, to comment, possibly. But the, the objective is that, obviously, if it's not required, uh, then it wouldn't be appropriate to, um, uh, to, to install it. And, obviously, um, that may well have a, a positive impact on the concerns of residents of Oakington and so on who are worried about that road forming a stream into uh, or a rationale for uh, um, rat running uh, through their, through their uh, area. But, Tam, can you comment on the monitor and manage approach uh, that, that determines that? Y yes, indeed. The, um, the reason for the seven access road east is because we expect at some point the junction at Bar Hill to become full and to reach its capacity. So at that point, we then need the seven access road east to relieve Bar Hill of any local traffic. That's aiming really for Cambridge or off to the A428 to go off towards St. Neots. Um, so, so it's um, the, the trigger point for reviewing whether or not a seven axis road east is needed is 2,000 dwellings for phase 3A and phase 3B or 5,500 dwellings when you include um, phase 2 as well. So it's an aggregate of 5,500. And the trigger point for then building and completing the Southern Access Road East is, is 3,000 dwellings or 
aggregated over phase two and phase three, 6,500 drillings. So what we're saying is that when we do the review at 2,000 drillings, we might actually say, well, we haven't reached that point yet where the sudden access road use is needed because there's been modal shift um, or more booking at home or not, not the amount of traffic that we anticipated in the TA transport assessment to require the seven access road, access road east. And at that point, we'll then continue monitoring the flows to decide whether or not it is then needed before North Stay is completed. So the Section 106 agreement aims to keep that flexibility there if it is needed, but also to have the flexibility not to build it if it isn't needed. Thank you, Tam. Does that answer your question? I think so. And just to um, press home, maybe not the right place to do it, but the um, guided busway and the connection to North Stowe, um, that really probably can't come soon enough to then be able to encourage um, residents to use alternative forms of transport so that hopefully we don't need to build another road. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tam. Uh, Councillor Hawkins, please. Um, thank you very much, Chair, and through you. Um, I know Mr. Reid was explaining the, the, the issue of um, putting in the SEM as part of obligations, not as a condition, but I can't see how we can enforce if it's not a condition. Because the last thing I want to do is find that we can't, the enforcement officer is saying, well, there's no condition that we can enforce. <laughs> so how will that work? Stephen, do you want to come back? Thank you, Chair. Um, so my experience of putting it in the planning obligation was, in fact, when Bourne Airfield was being used for storage of um, containers, uh, and uh, we put it in the planning obligation there, and I never had any feedback from the, uh, from the parish or local residents to uh, express concern that the routing plan wasn't at working but nobody came back and told me or, or asked me to ensure that we took action to enforce the planning obligation so uh, so i think the question was around can we how well can we enforce the planning obligation was the question uh, in my view it's easier to enforce the planning obligation than it is to enforce a condition Yeah. Come back on that, please, Chair. Um, we need to be quite explicit as to what the process should be, because most of the time people don't know what to do. Um, and so they suffer in silence. So if this is going to work, we need to be quite clear as to how it's going to work. Um, and also, I... I think somebody mentioned, uh, one of the speakers mentioned the issue of um, cycleways and pathways being uh, finished in time and not being blocked and all that stuff. So if we are going to have the level of model shift that we need, I mean, also supposed to be a healthy town, um, we need to make sure that um, all those pedestrian and cycleways um, get built on time and properly, but I don't see anything here in the conditions that actually helps us to do that. In terms of the shift to electric, um, there's a condition for electric vehicle charging, but not for electric bike charging. Um, and also we're gonna be having um, cycle storage for cargo bikes, which no doubt I think we will find um, will be taken up quite considerably um, in the new town. Thank you. Thank you. So I think a couple of questions there. One was around the um, uh, potential condition around building out the, um, the cycle of footways. Uh, is there any way we can get them to do that on time? And then secondly, around EV charging, from what I understand. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, in respect of, of, of the point around phasing, um, certainly the conversations we've had with Homes England, that there are two dynamics in that space. I think there is an ambition to make sure that the cycle and uh, non-car-based infrastructure in, is in as soon as possible. From the conversations that certainly uh, I had with uh, Homes England, 
One of the dynamics, however, is you do not want people, um, parents and children and cyclists mixing with construction traffic. Uh, and so uh, there is an element to which that needs to be iterated as, as individual parcels come forward. Condition nine uh, uh, of the um, recommendation in the appendix sets out a phasing uh, strategy that's required, uh, which has defined, uh, will define the key phases, but also the, the triggers as to what comes forward within that. Um, and um, uh, for those with the, the, the paper version, that's on page 144. Sorry, Councillor Williams. I, uh, um, someone will help me uh, as to which page it is in, in document. Uh, and then uh, there are also uh, provisions um, uh, within condition 10 about what happens in each of those phases, uh, including um, uh, the management of, of vehicles, public vehicles, and, and so on, um, are at, at 10D. The other point around um, uh, the, uh, I think the point that was made around the uh, construction uh, is obviously covered in part in um, condition 44, is it? Uh, sorry, sorry, condition 42 um, uh, in, in, the append in the appendices, but um, hopefully that's, yeah. Yeah, that's I helpful. think that covers it. Thank you. Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you. Just on this, on paragraph 187, I'm just double checking that this is the same. No, that's on the next one. It's the one previously. We'll have to get these bookmarks sorted out, Erin. Um, I'm just going to go with the subject rather than where it is in the document. So the um, one thing to bear in mind is obviously we've got changes and updates to the highway code and things like that at the moment. So can we be assured that there's adequate for horse riding? Um, and provisions made in. Um, I think it's on the next application that they've objected, but just for consistency on this one, can we um, have some reassurances that all forms of non-motorised um, travel, if we can refer to it as that, are, are being fully considered and catered for? Okay, it's a question around non-motorised users rather than specifically bikes or foot um, walkers. Yeah, I'm, I'm ref Mr. Hunting has referred me to condition 18 uh, on the um, uh, on the schedule of conditions, um, which which addresses that. I'm very I am conscious that there has been uh, engagement around this um, matter. Which page is that, please? That's on for the paper copy. Page 155 refers to footpaths, cycle, and bridleway links. Um, just on the point around footpaths, obviously you have had representations that were included in the um, addendum sheet. Um, probably the right point to mention it, that express a concern about the um, footpath reconnections that are taking place. Um, but condition 18 is, the, uh, is uh, we think, uh, appropriate to address that. And I know that in the movement um, uh, parameter plan, uh, it recognises the bridleways uh, and the provision for bridleways. Thank you very much. Um, members, I think that's all the debate we have at the moment on the access and transport element of the report. So we'll move on to the next uh, grouping, which is sections four, five and six. And they relate to employment assessment, housing delivery and social and community infrastructure. I don't think we've actually touched on this much uh, so far, but obviously if members have any points or comments they want to make or questions on any of those sections, please, now is the opportunity. Councillor Richard Williams, please. Thank you. Just a quick one. Did we get the data on density across the site? Well reminded, uh, officers. Sorry, thank you, Chairman. Phase one is 35 DPH and phase 3B is 38 DPH. Sorry? Uh, phase one is 35 dwelling spectre and phase 3B is 38 dwelling spectre. Uh, Chair, sorry, just to, just to supplement that. Um, uh, my understanding is, yeah, phase, phase one is 35, phase two is an average of 38 DPH, uh, and then um, uh, you've got the figures for, for, I think, 40 for 3A and um, 38 for 3B. Thank you very much. Um, members, if there's no further points people wish to make on that, those sections, we'll move on to the final. 
three sections, which are sections seven to 10, and they encompass environmental considerations, cumulative impacts, financial obligations, slash S106, and the planning balance. So hopefully this is the section where members can give views on those things and also come to a conclusion if they have heard enough to be able to do so. So members, I will throw it open to, to you. Councillor Roberts, please. Thank you, Chairman, and through you, Chairman. I've, <clears throat> I've not felt I needed to speak on the other matters. Um, I have concerns, generally, about density, etc. We seem to have lost the idea of garden cities anymore, don't we? Uh, but we are where we are. Uh, however, I think that when it comes to um, the presentations that we had this morning, I think alarming was the least word you could use. Um, potentially horrific. I think that we would be absolutely um, seen as uh, absolutely running our own show without any concern of our residents if we went along with this today. Um, to ignore the presentations, and they, they came from a variety of, of people who were coming in, in it their own ways, but it was all the same message, this is not right as yet. And I think that's what I feel. I think in principle we know that uh, something um, uh, could uh, and, and probably will in, in future go there. However, we cannot today, I think, make any move forward with this. And I know it was in one of the parish councils or somebody said, um, defer it. Well, I, I don't think it's one for deferment. I think it's got to be a, a straightforward uh, yes or no. Um, the, this development looks as though it's going to, to have um, the worst of all worlds with water. It's either going to be um, that the residents won't have enough water because the systems are not going to be able to provide it. And we heard of the consequences after 2027. Or a situation where because of the um, makeup of the land, there is going to be terrific flooding. Now, I lived for some years over at Over, so I know what that land area is like. And in winter, your back gardens were always covered in water. We didn't flood our houses in those days, that was 30 odd years ago, but, but there is a situation over that, uh, that particular side of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the city. Uh, and it, it needs much more than is here at the moment to rectify it. You know, this could end up, do anybody ever remember that dreadful film? I think it was called Water World, where the whole world was covered with water and the few remaining survivors were desperately looking to see if they could eat anything other than fish and find a piece of dry land. And I'm struck with uh, that this is going to be the case. I mean, to hear that now the stream there and, and the, what's happening to the land because of the abstraction is very, very concerning. That buildings are starting after a very short period of time showing signs of, of problems, serious problems. And yet, um, also, this possibility that this whole system is going to collapse. Now, we, we can't be giving planning permissions with this sort of terrible uncertainty. It's, 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 it needs now to be refused now, and everybody needs to go back to the drawing board, and I think the developers need to take on seriously the views that have been put forward by people who do know. I mean... I look at myself as a complete amateur on this, and I'm sure really everybody in this room is, or the councillors, but these are people who do know of, uh, an awful lot. You know, they, the land drainage people, um, you know, uh, the, water, the water people, they do know what they're talking about. So I will not be voting for this. I'll be voting against it. Um, I hope that we will do that. We, our reputation will be in ruins if we go along with this. We cannot give the hypocrisy of telling everybody that we're so committed to the environment 
we are so rooted in, in care of the environment and they are listening to all the concerns that have been given us today by the people who will have to suffer, ignore it. I mean, we will be shot to ribbons. This council, uh, not me because I'm going to vote against it, but this council will be shot to ribbons if it goes along with this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Richards Williams, please. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, it, obviously, I think I've already made the point. I have got serious concerns about the groundwater um, and the impact on the groundwater. I think we've established now that we are expecting a two to three meter um, drop in the level of um, groundwater on that site. I'm not satisfied that we have had sufficient evidence and reassurance about what that impact would be. I mean, again, I am no technical expert in this, but I would imagine if you lower the groundwater level by two to three meters, you could potentially completely change the flows of water you know, across that site. Um, so I would want to see much more in information on that, and, and I'm really um, not, not satisfied on that at all. I mean, I have to say, I have two other concerns as well. Condition 39, it, I, 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 I'm not happy with. We don't have any indication of what the levels of water um, that would, um, will, what would be set as the minimum in that condition um, actually are. And I certainly would want that before I approve this. I mean, it, it's been suggested yesterday that there's a new condition for a site hydrology assessment. That could be a very useful thing, but I don't know what it means. I don't know anything about it because we've just got a sentence or two sentences given to us yesterday so what the wording of that condition um, would be. So, so I, I can't really be reassured on that. And, and I do have to say as well, I'm also not happy with what's proposed on page seven of one of the supplements that, that, that we effectively delegate all of this anyway. So we aren't really setting any of these conditions. We don't really know what the conditions are going to be. And I also have to say, I'm a little bit troubled by the wording of the supplement, which says the applicant has, had, has reviewed the draft conditions and has confirmed their acceptability in principle. I mean, surely it's for us as the local planning authority to set the conditions. It's not for the applicant to tell us whether they agree with them or not. And that was my understanding of the process. Anyway, we set the conditions. And if they don't like them, they can either appeal um, or seek to get them varied. But, but we shouldn't be in a process where we're somehow, it seems to be, negotiating with them. Um, about, uh, about what the conditions actually are. Um, that, that, that's not a way um, to go with this. I am also concerned about the drainage, um, what we've heard from the, from the Swavesy uh, Drainage Board. Um, I, I, I'm concerned that even if this proposal could work, is it going to work with all of the other proposals? I would like much more um, detail um, on, on that. So, um, Yes, I, I'm not satisfied by the conditions. I, I think they're, they're very vague. I'm not satisfied by the fact we don't actually have before us today a, a statement of what the conditions would actually be. We don't really know what we're, we're approving. Um, and the risks are just too great, given, I think, the evidence that hasn't been disputed from that um, report that, that, that we've seen a few times about the level, the impact on the groundwater. We just simply don't know or have enough information to be sure what the consequences of that are going to be and that it can be adequately mitigated. Thank you very much. And Councillor Fain. Thank you, Chair. Um, like I think other councillors, I have some real outstanding concerns about the impacts of this development. I think many of those can be met by conditions or possibly by planning management obligations, certainly on vehicle movements and so on, and I think we've largely dealt with that. The key issue for me in various forms is that of water, and I'm not quite clear from this whether they're going to be, the, the future residents are going to be um, suffering from drought or, or uh, flooded out. Um, I think it was suggested there might be both. I find that hard to believe, but um, on the serious issue of the groundwater level, um, no, I don't see this being water world or disastrous or whatever, but I am concerned about hearing of settlement of built buildings, particularly the Village Institute, and um, in, indeed of gardens too, because that is an indication of wider problems to come. 
uh, and I wasn't entirely satisfied to the extent to which that is the impacts of that derive entirely from earlier phases of the development. Um, I think we need to be sure of what those impacts will be before we accept that assurance. Uh, I'm concerned, as Richard Williams was on the, the question of drainage, and of course, on the question of water supply. But on these issues, whilst I have real concerns, I think we had a very informed contribution from the Environment Agency, um, obviously somebody who had read all the detail and was fully familiar with it, contrary to what might have been suggested at one stage. Um, and of course, we have to bear in mind the guidance from central government that Director Stephen Kelly referred to earlier on, that this is a development which is in accordance with our local plan. Um, and therefore, there is a limit to the extent to which we can impose new conditions. Um, I'm not entirely happy that reducing water consumption to 110 litres, that is a design factor. And the problem is one can never be quite sure uh, how that will be implemented in practice, not just by the developers, but by, of course, the future residents of the houses. Um, so I'm always reluctant to take assurance on that point. But I think the government guidance of 22nd of July that was referred to in 2019 is that this, these issues have to be addressed through strategic policies, um, particularly because they're in the local plan. So whilst I am still concerned about many of these things, I can't see that I can come up with any grounds for refusal of this application. I am tempted towards deferral of it because there are some issues here that clearly have still to be resolved. Um, and I'm not quite clear which way I'm, I'm inclined to vote at the moment, and indeed nobody's put a proposal for a deferral, um, but I, I think I might be sympathetic to that. Thank you. I think Mr. Kelly would like to come back on that. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's a couple of comments, really, in relation to the, to, to the points that, that have been made, and noting the um, uh, Councillor Roberts' comments. It's probably helpful, and I might, I might call upon the Environment Agency, uh, if they're still here, just to, just to clarify. Um, but uh, Councillor Williams raised, raised, raised two points um, that I thought it would be helpful. Um, on the point around water levels in the, in the aquifer, one of the things that the HR Wallingford report identifies is that Actually, the, the pattern of, of water levels in the aquifer changes with climate conditions. It's, not a, it's a shallow deposit, and therefore it's quite sensitive to both inputs in terms of levels of rainfall and so on, uh, and obviously also um, the, the consequences for uh, dewatering and, 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 and such. The modelling that um, you heard Arcadis explaining that they had done um, suggests uh, an impact uh, on the prevailing uh, groundwater levels. But I think the, 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 the actual uh, and, and uh, your request for a baseline, I think, against which that um, uh, happens, I, I suppose caution against setting an absolute baseline. But one of the things that I think, uh, because the climatic conditions, regardless of any development factors, uh, may well uh, bring matters, um, uh, may well introduce matters that impact that. I think, however, there is probably a point in what the um, addendum sheet was trying to identify in that in condition 39, where we have set out the parameters for that monitoring regime, um, it is suggesting introducing um, a, a, an agreed baseline, as I said, not a figure, but an agreed baseline against which monitoring takes place under part I uh, of um, that uh, condition. And I think that is a reflection of the, the, the recognition about the need to track carefully um, uh, those, those changes that take place rather than to define a, a particular level. You also made the point around um, uh, agreement of conditions with the developers. It, the government certainly encourages sharing uh, discussions around conditions with the developer, not least because pre-commencement conditions have to be agreed um, uh, with uh, developers. Uh, and the objective is, is not to essentially stitch up or do some form of a deal, 
but it's to make sure that the conditions um, are robust and, de and deliverable, um, because obviously the last thing that people want is, is, is planning appeals uh, against uh, conditions, uh, the, uh, or indeed the need to vary conditions because they are configured in a way that's un undeliverable. And, and you know, this committee has entertained conditions in the past that have needed changing to that effect. Councillor Williams, do you want to come back? I was just going to comment on the, uh, the, the, the last point um, that I wanted to make is um, uh, absolutely to recognise all of the comments that have been made by, by third parties today. And count, um, picking up on um, Councillor Fain's comments around uh, levels of doubt and, un, and uncertainty. Um, I think the issue, and the, the issue in this particular case around uh, groundwater and um, to a lesser extent drainage, because you've heard from the Environment Agency, but the issue in terms of, of groundwater uh, is that um, it is a material planning consideration, absolutely. I, I think there's a recognition that the extent to which it was considered in phase one um, is perhaps substantially less than the debate that we've had today. But it is a material planning consideration. Um, there has been technical information submitted and there have been comments about that information that you've received from uh, third parties. The um, statutory consultees have indicated they're satisfied with the application as submitted. And the really important matter for members to consider today uh, relates to the point around uh, monitoring. Because there is still, uh, and the HR Wallingford work makes this point clear, there is still um, uh, doubt about the precise cause for the variances in phase one groundwater levels. Um, but what is important uh, is, uh, and we cannot <coughs> identify that definitively, You've heard from Arcadis about their modelling and the assumptions that suggest there will be no external impact because based upon their note around where water flows, they don't believe that to be the case. But the important um, issue is that we have uh, introduced conditions that require both pre-commencement monitoring of ground levels, uh, uh, groundwater levels, uh, including on the perimeter of this site, and then post-development and ongoing through the development condition uh, around uh, the monitoring and mitigation where appropriate uh, of any impacts that are observed. Now that simply didn't take place in relation to, to phase one to the level that is being proposed here. Uh, and you know our, our uh, proposition to you as officers and indeed um, uh, the uh, applicant's proposal is that the way to address the doubt about this matter is to monitor before you start, uh, to have a mechanism in place for addressing the monitoring as you progress, uh, and uh, to have measures that can be taken uh, to address any uh, impacts uh, observed. Well, Councillor Williams, I'll allow you to come back on that. Yeah, so just, just, just a quick comeback um, on that. Thank you for that. I mean, just on, on the point of the conditions, I mean, Yes, yes, of course, I, I completely take the point that there'll, there'll, there'll be some dialogue, but, but I, I have to say, in all honesty, this is such an important application, and this issue of the groundwater, and, you know, we've seen the unintended impacts, and yes, I know a lot more work has gone on in, in, in this case, um, but it's so sensitive and it, it, it's so important um, that I have real concerns about approving a planning application where we don't actually know exactly what the conditions are, because they could change, we have a suggestion of a condition which could actually be quite useful, but we haven't seen the text of it. And I really don't think as a planning committee and as a council, we're doing our job if we give the green light to a planning application of this sensitivity with these extremely important issues. And we haven't really seen the final conditions. I, I must admit, I kind of agree with Councillor Fain. I don't think this is ready. Um, I would like to see all of the conditions as they will be agreed before the planning committee um, endorses this application. I think that's really important. Thank you. Chair, just to, just to respond to that, appendix, uh, um, I'm sorry, I'm slightly confused because appendix D of the um, committee report is the, is the full text of the planning conditions that we're recommending, albeit that there is a provision um, for uh, uh, delegated to, to um, officers to be able to 
uh, uh, amend those uh, potentially as we as we progress forward. But there is there is a I'm sorry if Councillor Williams uh, hasn't spotted that. But Appendix D is the, is the, is a schedule of conditions that we're proposing be appended to the um, decision. You know, I, I, I hadn't seen that. That's my point. Um, I mean, you know, th these aren't really the final conditions because it does say subject to further discussion. So we do have this site hydrology assessment potential condition where we're told an additional planning condition is recommended to secure this. Maybe I've missed the text of that planning condition. That, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, the, I think the, the reference to the uh, text that you highlighted in the addendum report is to amend uh, the condition 39, uh, which is on, on page 165. I'm sorry if that was not, not clear. Um, uh, and uh, to insert additional wording into that condition that is in Appendix D. No, so, sorry to come back. Uh, I, you know, I, I do know that. No, what I'm talking about is on page 5. Uh, and it says, the representation from the North Stoke Town Council received 18th of January 2022 has been further considered by officers. The following update is provided by way of response. Site hydrology assessment. The applicant has confirmed the acceptability of an independent groundwater monitoring assessment being carried out. An additional planning condition is recommended to secure this. Wh which, what specifically is the text of that additional planning condition? So whereabouts is that in the um, agenda, it please, is or the, the supplement. Sorry, it's one of the supplements. To be honest, my supplements aren't numbered, but it's the one with 24 pages. One with 24 pages. And that's on page five. Chair, sorry, sorry, uh, and um, I'm sorry for the confusion caused there. The, the um, uh, further on, and I'm uh, and I'm sorry, perhaps the wording is not is, is not clear. North, North Stowe Town Council recommended a. Um, additional condition. We reviewed their request, looking at the condition um, number 39 that we've got, uh, on page uh, 10 of the supplement, we then suggested amendments to condition 39 rather than an additional condition. And there's, there's not one in front of you. Uh, that additional condition is therefore not in the sheet because we felt that... There isn't an additional one, it's the amendments yeah. to the existing yeah. one. Thank Sorry, you. It was yeah. the use of the word additional condition that was confusing me. Okay, we got there. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you. We have two more speakers registered. Councillor Harvey, please, and then Councillor Khan. One more. Okay, thanks, uh, Chair. Um, well, I just wanted to return to, and I think um, Stephen Kelly touched on it earlier, in his commentary. Um, the uh, presentation we had from the IDB and the capacity of the water course to take the sewage outflow, which I think was a problem. And I, I just wondered if you could sort of clarify how the codependencies um, that he described between various um, large-scale developments in the area, which are at various stages of um, planning and implementation a a actually work. And I mean, it's, it's a little bit similar to the situation we have with any um, sort of limited infrastructure resource, you know, for example, um, electricity supply, where if you've got, um, you know, um, say two or three developments um, um, contempor contemporaneously evolving, um, and then, because I'm a little bit puzzled that um, the Environment Agency in the consultation section of this report would have no objection um, in, in light of the letter we were, um, that was described um, from the Environment Agency to Anglian Water. But I mean, I, I suppose you can see how that would arise because in the absence of um, the other developments that were described, um, there would be no basis to say that there wasn't capacity there. But, you know, is there a risk that um, because of the contemporaneous nature of these developments, one's setting up 
a situation in which inevitably the capacity of that watercourse will be um, exceeded at some point in the future. Okay, I think it might be good to hear from um, our officer Adam Ireland if he's still on the line. Here he is, Adam. Hello, welcome back. Hi. Yeah, did you manage Thank to pick you. up that in full? Uh, yes, yes, I did. Um, I'll pick up that issue first. I might be able to perhaps provide another suggestion relating to the previous item, which was discussed, if if you so wish, relating to the the conditions on on surface water and groundwater. Um, but spe specifically um, in relation to the uh, issue around the IDB, when we uh, we met with them, uh, we met with the IDB, uh, Mr. Wilderspin. Um, uh, Obviously, who's presented uh, earlier? Uh, Councillor Hawkins actually uh, uh, chaired that that meeting as well. Um, and as part of that, we were um, informed by Anglian Water um, uh, of other other options that they have. Essentially, saying that they they will find a solution, but it was also the fact that um, their networks don't operate um, in isolation, as it were, and that that. that um, if um, it was likely that there would be an exceedance of any permit, that they would be able to um, uh, accommodate it elsewhere within the, the sewerage network via, via transfer. Um, so that was one of the elements which um, led to our subsequent comment and email through to uh, uh, Mr Kelly relating to our removal of objection um to the host of new developments not pu not solely uh, uh north so phase 3a to answer your question councillor yes, i just wondered what what the transfer would entail would that be Boys. look would that be a, a pipe network or a, a physical transportation uh, no, that would be um, it. Would be done via a piped network. Um, that would be the the uh, yeah the more sustainable solution. Um, again, I, I can't explain exactly how on behalf of Anglian Water. That's uh, that's outside of my. Uh, chairman, uh, Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Chairman. Um, through you, Chairman, we've invited them to come back on. Can we invite the gentleman who spoke on behalf of the um, Internal Drainage Board as well, please? Does he wish to? Okay, if come forward if, as long as it's brief. There are no ways they can divert that water in in in, in a very short time, as Adam Island's letter to Anglian Water stated. There is no way that this can be done in a short time. I can't remember the exact words now, and I've left my paperwork there. But there's no way that this can be done in a short time. I had conversations to Adam Island after I'd seen the letter where they um, accepted what the EA um, Anglian Water was saying. And I said to him, so what are you saying? And he said, well, what we're saying is that once they've reached 239 litres a second, they cannot put any more water down Utton's drain. So if they can't put any more water down Utton's drain, and um, there is no other way of moving it within perhaps 10 years, what are they going to do? They're going to just keep putting it down Hutton's Road and flood Swavesy. This committee has the responsibility to deal with that. It is not to be left to people like Anglian Water, who, as we all know from the press now, are not the most reliable of people. Okay, no, thank you for the uh, input there. Well, members, we've had two sides of the coin there, one from our consular team, one from the IDB, so it's up to us to balance that. Um, members, I've just been reminded, because we've been going for a long time now, way more than four hours, we need to pass a resolution to continue. I mean, given the fact we're in the, I think, the home stretch, I hope, can we agree that, please? Great, thank you very much. Okay, um, I'm going to move to the next speaker, please, Councillor Khan. I simply wanted to comment. Um, um, I mean, we're in a very difficult position because uh, we are dependent upon promises from Anglia, uh, Anglia Water and Cambridge Water that they will supply. Uh, um, 
and we have to take them, we're really obliged in the sense to take them at face value, but we have certain reservations because they're different independent bodies and we can't, we know from experience that major, what they're talking about, major capital works and so on, are often are very often delayed. And so I am concerned that we, I am concerned that we, um, we cannot review the phasing of this until such uh, provision is made. Um, and uh, I see the difficulties that it's one of several developments which contribute to this. Uh, 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 and there's a certain injustice in the fact that one would have to, might, might have to pay for the other, uh, you know, the, the lack of control of others. But, but in principle, I feel that we ought to have some provision for review if the problem in years to come, because this is over a period of, of decades, that this development, rather than in a short period of time. So that's something that does concern me. Um, in terms of the, the water, the drying out, um, a number, about 25 years ago, my parents who were living in Cambridge were suffering, had a problem which they thought was subsidence. And so I learned quite a bit about subsidence, subsidence at that time. It proved not in their case actually to be that. But they were lie. They, they, their building was built on on clay ground, and basically the problems with building subsidence is often very frequently due to drying out of clay you know, because of the lack of in, in very warm weather. So it's important to know whether the um, whether the provision in this case was due if that was the cause. It was notable that people are not talking about substance in the new development, which is on, on gra uh, apparently on gravels. Um, so I suspect that this is what was happening, uh, it was, this was happening there, and whether that was related to the groundwater level or just general climate, um, it's something I think we're going to be expecting to happen more frequently in the future. Um, I don't know, but the new development appears to be mainly uh, on gravel with the surrounding development a bit, a bit distant. Uh, uh, so uh, I suspect that the risk of this happening is less. Um, but it, I think it would, again, I rather sympathize with Councillor Fain's proposal that we defer it while this is looked at in more detail. I think there is a need to have more clear information of how this might happen in the vicinity of the new development if they're going to reduce the level of water. I understand the dewatering is temporary during the period of construction and then, but I, uh, I would welcome that to be confirmed. Maybe so that maybe a temporary phase, which then is, um, is stopping being dewatered afterwards. Um, so uh, I see we're committed basically to this development. It's in the development plan. We are in fact committed by things which were taken many years ago when these considerations weren't so high. Um, so um, it creates, it has created problems. Um, I'm concerned about. I am concerned about the context of these proposal, uh, proposals, uh, uh, and I am. A, I would be sympathetic to the uh, deferral and looking at these uh, water matters in more detail, and particularly these issues of, of groundwater. I think they, they do need to be examined more carefully. Okay, thank you for your comments, Councillor Hawkins, please. Thank you very much, Chair, um, and through you, I just want to say, first of all, thank you to everyone who's been involved with putting this together. I know it's taken um, quite a while to get us to this point. Um, we are talking about a site that was allocated many years back, um, which is in our current local plan. And the issues that we have all been talking about are issues of concern. That is true, especially with groundwater and water supply and um, you know, the environment. Now, we have a duty as the local planning authority to ensure that we have the houses and infrastructure that our residents require to cater for the needs and the growth that we are currently um, going through. We also have to rely on statutory bodies to provide some of this infrastructure. Just as we have our local plan, which looks at 15, 20 year periods, 
The same goes for the water authorities. They also have the original plans. And I actually did some bedtime reading looking at the Cambridge Water original plan. <laughs> um, yeah, put me to sleep, but there we go. They also have their plan looking at how they're going to supply um, this region based on the requirements of our local plans. Now, we are not the water authority. They have the legal obligation to us. They have provided some information, but we're saying we require some more of them. Fair enough. But looking at this, They have not raised objections to this outline planning application. And I say outline. You hit their letters, didn't you? And if I was, let me rephrase that. We do rely on their expertise. One thing that has um, given me some confidence is the uh, condition in uh, condition 39. I think if you recall, I did ask the question how they were going to do this monitoring um, early on. Now, this monitoring was something that wasn't done when phase one was being built out. The problem that we had with phase one actually started as I think you heard from the Long Stanton um, uh, parish councillor many years ago. And it wasn't actually picked up until 2018 when councillors Malion and John oh, Johnson yes. raised it. And we then worked with Longstanton Parish Council to um, get the um, Wallingford report. So we are picking up issues here and we are learning from the mistakes that were made in the past. As Mr. Kelly said, you know, we can have a baseline from which to work, but we cannot put a figure on that. It's what is in the ground that we can work with. And whilst I share all the concerns that have been raised, and you know, um, some of these are things that we as a local planning authority have no control over, let us control what we can control. And we need to hold our um, the statutory organizations who are our partners, we need to hold their feet to the fire. Ottens Drove is a, a case in point. The groundwater level, I mean, the environmental agency is gonna be doing the monitoring. Yes, you know, they can do the monitoring, but they need to also provide us with access to the data and make it publicly available and all that. So I can actually see what is going on as this site um, is being built out. Now, much as I hear the uh, let's defer or reject this. I don't think we have material planning grounds to do so. So I will be voting for this. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, one, two, three more speakers I have on my list, beginning with Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, so balancing through, I think, you know, the environmental concerns have been raised by many people, you know, on committee and, and public speakers. Um, and I would be interested to get advice from officers about sort of deferrals and any implications that could have. Um, because as we know, sometimes actually, you know, deferring has an unintentional consequence that can be quite, you know, then actually take it all out of our hands. Yeah. Um, I, I have no issue, and, and indeed, I think all bar uh, a couple of people um, in this room voted for the local plan. So building in that area, there is established you know, that and approved. Um, and like I say, most of us here voted for that. But um, I do think we do still have an obligation to get it right. So yes, have these houses, but we need to make sure because and, and when we had phase two, you know, with Rampton Drift, 
the emotion that's attached to it, understandably, we've given assurances, we broke those insurances. So we actually, we need to get a bit of trust back from them there as well. So, but it's not for myself, it's not just the environmental impact that concerns me. The, the diagram that we showed, and, and I think officers were displaying it, we went into detail, and I know you said we could sort of extend on that spur um, as to the um, levels of the housing heights. But for myself, I think just that bit doesn't really satisfy my concerns. Um, even if we were to put more in, that it is a very close distance. And I appreciate we're going to have some trees, but we've also heard that we might lose some coverage from that. Um, and I think, it, you know, when we had like in, in Water Beach, where it was almost ringed to sort of bring it into heights in the, in the middle and lower down. So I think... I think I know officers said that they would, would sort of speak and come back if it couldn't be agreed, but I, I do feel to support it myself, I would need to see actually what it is that's being settled on, because just that jointy bit isn't enough. Um, I'm also very conscious of the comments that have been made around Utton's drove. Um, you know, like many people, droves and sluices until I sat on planning, you know, was not, not something I'd come across. But it's something that in my time in the council we've heard again and again and again. Um, so I can understand why people are concerned about that. And uh, th there has been a lot of effort and work gone into this, that's without doubt. But I, I don't think, I think to have peace of mind and to be able to sleep myself at night, I would need to see for myself a bit more concrete guarantees around that and I don't think we have that at the time I do think these things can be overcome um, but it's not here in what we have in front of us it's, it's not there yet um, so with that I am minded for for refusal but I'm open to hearing the, the um, things on the deferral Okay, let's, uh, let's throw to officers for that. And what would the um, uh, what would the advice around deferral be? Would there be any consequences we haven't considered yet? Uh, thank you. There's, there's two elements, I suppose, um, uh, in terms of the issue of deferral. I think there is recognition um, from, from all of the comments that have been made uh, that we do not know for definite exactly what's going to happen. I think um, uh, it's... Uh, and that's a reality because it's almost impossible to lift up everything that's underneath phase three and look in forensic detail at every single part of it. The HR Wallingford report that was circulated, but which uh, underpins uh, some of the concerns uh, that Long Stanton shared with you earlier on today and North Stoke Town Council referred to also, uh, highlights actually the difficulty of being able to uh, identify the under and understand exactly what happens uh, under a place. Uh, and um, in relation to phase one, it highlights the fact that, for example, climatic conditions uh, interfere with any attempt or impact the ability to try and understand it. So the, the um, uh, applicants have done some modelling based upon um, uh, monitoring that they, they have undertaken of, of groundwater. And of course, they also have been monitoring groundwater under phase two. Uh, and they have put forward a, pro a proposition. Is that exactly what is going to happen? I think the difficulty um, that we face as a uh, that you face as a committee is that uh, there is nothing, in many respects, uh, straightforward that could be done to give you a greater level of certainty. The work that has been done to date, and therefore deferring the item until you increase levels of certainty, may well be a considerable period of time whilst long-term monitoring takes place uh, and um, some form of a suggestion uh, about what that gives rise to. Now, we are in a dialogue with North Stowe Town Council and Long Stanton Parish Council on this issue, and we are, as the council, taking forward that dialogue to try and understand exactly what is going on uh, on phase one. But even our own drainage team, people like Pat Matthews, who've been with the council for 25 years, recognise that, um, uh, and we've had positive conversations with the town council, they have a hypothesis. But the exploration of that is going to take, as I said, a considerable period of time. 
I think people have recognized that the principle of development, I think a number of people have said the principle of development is satisfactory. And effectively, the outline planning commission, whilst it puts a number to that, it's actually the same number in your adopted local plan, um, you are being asked to confirm whether uh, under the terms that are set out in the recommendation, um, confirming that principle of development is acceptable to you. The important point, because I don't think we as officers could identify how we could give you more certainty, and certainly the conversations with third parties, whilst they focus on monitoring and review of groundwater conditions, have not identified a clear route to that, other than the process that we have defined in conditions, which is to monitor before development commences, to monitor as development takes place, and to consider both through the drainage uh, conditions and the phasing, whether or not um, mitigation or interventions in the event of a uh, adverse effect can be brought forward that, sort, uh, that seek to increase the groundwater recharge as that development and indeed the learning on phase two uh, proceeds. Uh, and, uh, and so what I would recommend to you is that um, refusal on the basis of um, the current uh, uh, position I think would be hard to justify in terms of having a tangible basis upon what level of certainty you were looking for from this development. We're, we've been talking a lot about phase one, but actually the permission application in front of you is for phase three. Uh, and secondly, if you were to seek to defer the item, I'm slightly uncertain about when we would be able to bring this application back to you and what level of information would provide the assurance that's necessary. And you've heard from, uh, and, and, and you have heard from uh, and seen in the report that the agencies that we have consulted on this matter, including the Environment Agency, are satisfied with the material in front of you. So the point around uh, were we to then face a planning appeal seeking to um, uh, explore that issue is again whilst there is uh, a number of comments that have been received about phase one, uh, and um, uh, we have noted them, uh, there isn't adverse comment from the statutory consultees. And indeed, um, the basis of the assessment that has been done sets forward a credible proposition for consent, monitoring, and management of that impact in the event that it arises differently. Uh, and on that basis, uh, I'm not sure that we have, or our recommendation to you, would be that you have a sound basis for either refusal or deferral uh, on that okay. uh, on that matter. Thank, thank you. I think you wanted to come back. No, Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you. Um, so I've, I've listened to what you said, um, and obviously for myself, I've got the two two outstanding issues. I think with the heights as well. Um, but just in case members are minded to uh, approve, I'm just looking back on my notes as the comments that were made by Longstanton Parish Council. Um, they did put a request in about a condition for the cost of remedial works rather than just um, monitoring um, for any damage done uh, that then didn't sacrifice other things in the 106 agreement um, and asked for information to that data so I'm just wondering if officers could advise what they've requested there is that already co sufficiently covered or is it possible or, or just something because that's obviously a condition that was asked by them sorry uh, um, uh, I mean we we've certainly reviewed uh, Longstanton Parish Council's request there's two things firstly uh, in the event that um, uh, mitigation costs were required they would be allowable in any viability appraisal to offset other obligations as part of that process. So you cannot simply write those costs out uh, in the way that they've perhaps suggested. The, um, uh, the, the issue that the terms of their representation may um, raise relates to the reasonableness in planning under the SIL regs uh, of effectively requiring um, this development to resolve other issues that we have already heard exist at this moment in time without the development. Uh, and so there, uh, we didn't feel as officers that the obligation on the current application to essentially fix 
almost regardless of cost, all of the issues with the previous application by a different developer uh, would satisfy the tests of SIL regs. What we have done, however, uh, and um, hopefully, uh, I don't know if people have been able to look at the revisions, but also the terms of condition 39, the report provided by um, Arcadis in respect of phase 3A identifies that if in the process of um, the application's development, uh, groundwater levels are seen to depart from what they believe and have modelled, then the drainage scheme, and indeed the drainage conditions also provide for this, for subsequent phases, can explore means in which that groundwater can be, in a sense, recharged, potentially, by adjustments to the drainage scheme that currently proposes, actually, the majority of surface water drainage from, for example, the homes and roofs, to be taken off the site. Uh, the condition and the uh, uh, application suggest that we can look to adjust that so that within phase 3A, the recharge of the, of the groundwater is something that would be caught by the, both the monitoring and then the measures in terms of the planning conditions. Thank you, Chair. Um, and my last, my last um, comments was just, um, I think a lot of us got confused around the essentially sewage transfer because the only sewage transfer I've ever seen is like the empty septic tank. Um, so it was said about pipes um, and it could be piped out and alternative. But I'm just wondering how long would it take to get the pipes in and everything? Is it something that potentially could see lorries transporting sewage for a, a short period while the pipes are put in? And if so, you know, how long would you be looking at roughly? Um, just, just because of the comment that was said and um, not being an expert on sewage transfer unless it's inside a nappy. Um, good, good question. Let's see if anyone can answer. Uh, um, yeah, Mr Hunting has just referred me to condition 41, um, which deals with uh, the foul water drainage strategy, um, which does uh, require before any development parcels uh, come forward. Um, uh, for this site, sideward foul drainage strategy, I think in respect of your concerns about the consequences for Uttams Drove, the planning authority are not the regulator around that, I think, and that's the important point. The um, uh, Anglian Water have suggested to the Environment Agency, and you heard the gentleman from the Environment Agency suggest that they're satisfied with Anglia Water's response. I think the description of the foul water network is something that goes beyond the ability of the applicants to, to, to resolve. Uh, and there is a regulatory regime in place that deals with both the concerns, I think, for the IDB about exceedance um, uh, and the collateral effects that I think they were suggesting was a concern in terms of additional water uh, entering the watercourse, which I think Swayze Parish Council are also concerned about and overwhelming that. The, the, as the planning authority, um, those responsibilities don't rest with us. Clearly, the development has an outflow and an impact, and we've consulted with the agencies, and they've indicated they're satisfied on that. There are differences of view that you've heard, but the resolution of those are not through the Town and Country Planning Act. They're resolved through other provisions. Okay, thank you for that. Can we have Councillor Hales, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm kind of struggling a little. Um, some of the things that have been said, something that Councillor Khan said with regards to the uh, the water table repairing itself, I think it was, you said, wasn't it? Uh, well, there was some indication. Um, I hadn't heard anybody talk about that, or the EA or anybody else like that, so that wasn't a uh, thing there. Just as an example, that may be <coughs> food for thought. Um, Shepherd's Parish Council have just closed their churchyard. They wanted to extend into a field to the side. And uh, as I believe by law, they have to have a dig to see if the ground is suitable to put remains in. And the, the body that came back said that the water table was far too high and essentially that um, those laid to rest would essentially float which was not good. And that then affects the main churchyard, 
because it's next door to it. So they said it's exactly the same problem there as it is here. And so that churchyard was instantly shut for new burials, even though it still has space. And the, I think if I remember, I'm correct in my comments, is that in the report that came from the, the people who did the, the um, investigation, was that the cement works that used to extract, that Barrington used to extract an awful lot of water from the ground, are now not. And so therefore the water table has gone up some substantially, which has now caused that effect all over. So I don't know whether we have any kind of lessons to learn from that small one company taking the water out there as to what's going to happen elsewhere. Comment that Heather made with regards to the spur. Um, I too feel it's knocking on the door of Oakham Oakington, rather, Oakhampton, not further away, Oakhampton, Oakington is knocking on the door. And you could argue, um, and I appreciate that we can't change bits and pieces here, but I'm sure there are others who own the plan can. Um, it, could be re it could be reduced by at least a third, which would make that much less of an impact. Um, the comments from Swavesley, uh, Swavesley, I beg your pardon, but Swavesley, with regards to Otters Drove and all the rest of it, the outfall of the sewerage from the plant is giving me a heartache. Um, there doesn't seem to be in front of us, even though we're not the, we're not the statutory body for those things, i.e. walls or sewers and all the rest of it, but since they're part of the consultation process, it doesn't feel that we have um, the information before us that says that we can be confident that whatever plan they have in the next 5, 10, 15 years uh, would, would satisfy us as, as lay people. So that, that's a worry. Um, and I think my last point kind of covers that with essentially the detailed plans from AW, Anglian Water or Cambridge, Cambridge Water, as to the extraction, the levels of extraction, how they're going to reduce. And I think Councillor Fain said something along those lines with it's all very well to say we're going to reduce usage down to X, Y and Z, but when Joe Bloggs wants to wash his car and there isn't a hose band, he will. And so there is those things there. So at the moment... I'm struggling, to be fair, as to whether I, I would say uh, refusal or deferral. And I appreciate Stephen's point of, with regards to the deferral. So I, I'm, I'm definitely in turmoil here. So unless Stephen can come back and make me feel a really happy bunny. Um, if I could just try and offer a little bit of assurance um, uh, on, 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 on Councillor Hale's point. Um, our recommendation um, is based upon the basis of the feedback that we've had from the, from the consultees around uh, this point. And uh, uh, on foul, foul sewage uh, and the treatment uh, around Uttons Drove, uh, we don't have. Anglian Water, um, I think, have not provided to the Environment Agency a definitive plan on how they're going to address that. But I come back to the point around um, that planning authority uh, is not the authority responsible for the management of that. That is the Environment Agency, and you've heard from them earlier on. What I can advise you is when the planning authority has consulted the Environment Agency about that matter, the Environment Agency initially raised concerns, but then have subsequently, um, uh, on the basis of their assessment uh, of the risk and the harm that, that arises, they have advised uh, the planning authority uh, that uh, their concerns have been satisfied. Uh, and um, refusal of the application on the basis of that impact uh, would be difficult for the planning authority to sustain given that neither Anglian Water uh, nor the Environment Agency have raised objections. The um, IDB have raised a concern about the level of clarity that they have in terms of those future plans. But since you have nothing in front of you around those plans, again, 
deferral on the base or refusal on the basis that those plans are inadequate would be at odds with the advice that you've received from the Environment Agency, who've indicated they're satisfied. But who the, 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 the second, the second uh, point Chair, that you raised. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Hales. I do, I do apologise, Chair, but Mr Kelly, would you mind repeating the last couple of three sentences? Couldn't quite catch what you said. Thanks. So the the um, you'll forgive me if I if I if I've gone too far or or, or um, uh, please stop me. The the planning authority have have consulted with um, uh, the environment agency who are responsible for managing uh, the uh, outputs uh, from Uppingham's Drove with uh, defined uh, and and you've heard the concerns from the IDB who have a, also have a responsibility for the maintenance and management of that infrastructure. Uh, Angling Water have met with the Environment Agency uh, and the Environment Agency have withdrawn, their, uh, have removed the concerns that they've originally raised, not just about this scheme, but about other major developments. On the basis of their level, uh, I'm assuming, and Adam is on the call, their level of assurance about the ability to resolve the concerns that have been identified. The, the planning authority, if we were minded to refuse, for example, the application on the basis of inadequate details centered upon the future uh, strategy for addressing uh, water uh, treatment at Hutton's Drove, um, you would be doing so without the ability to rely upon the Environment Agency, who is a statutory body responsible for the adverse effects that uh, would, would you would presumably be arguing arise um, without their support uh, and um, uh, we have already provided for in the extent of the local planning authority's interest foul water management details to be provided on site um, the IDB I think did recognize uh, that this point in terms of capacity will be reached in 2027 or beyond, I think was the was the uh, or before then, um, but it is not an um, it is not an immediate issue, and I think the IDB confirmed that it is not an immediate issue uh, at this moment in time. It is it is an issue that needs to be addressed through the investment plans and the strategy of Angling Water, which need to be agreed by the Environment Agency. I think I think we've we've gone over this a number of times now, and I think we've we've heard the local authorities' position on it. That isn't going to change. We've heard what the IDB's position in, is on it. That isn't going to change. Um, so we need to weigh up as a committee how much weight we give to that. That's a decision for us, Councillor Roberts. Please. Thank you again, Chairman, <clears throat> and through you, Chairman, I have a, a few um, finishing um, thoughts that um, I'd like to uh, share. Uh, I think it was. Councillor Khan said, well, you know, the, this is going to be decades in the sort of future, but it isn't, is it? Um, we've already heard the date 2027, it's only five years away, it's no time whatsoever. And we've also heard from the internal drainage board that when emergencies occur, they will not be able to sort it out. Um, it's a, it's a long-term um, situation which requires a lot more work on it at the moment. Um, and... It's not mandatory. The, the consultees are not, we are not mandated to take notice of them. They are there as advisors. Toomey Singh seems to think it's funny, but I think the residents wouldn't. We are there to listen to them, but there are always two sides to every story. And we've listened to their views, but you know, you've got two completing organisations here. Uh, and I'm afraid I don't think the tw twin are necessarily going to meet. But we've got another organisation which is just as responsible, the Internal Drainage Board, who have told us categorically and read out very, very strong evidence um, of why we should be so concerned here. Um, we, we cannot negate our responsibility. We are the first block in this house of building. It's up to us not to get, negate our responsibilities but to actually put down a marker. I don't want a deferment because I think a deferment will, as Stephen has said, 
will lead to months and months, and then they'll go to a spin on non determination. So I think that's a no go. But one of the things that I would be um, happier about was if this is refused and it goes to appeal, then an appeal would probably take two or three days, not like we've been today, five and a half hours. Um, it would take days. Every bit of evidence would be put in front of the inspector, every single bit. And every bit of, single, of evidence would be you know, looked at for its value, looked at for its value, and, and a decision could be then taken by an inspector. But, you know, I really don't go along with this. We haven't got enough things to fight it with. I think we have got enough things to fight it. And quite honestly, what the hell have we wasted five and a half hours of today? We came in at 10 o'clock. It's now half past three. If we couldn't, why the hell did not somebody say at the start of this meeting, well, actually, chaps, there's no good you sitting here all day being hungry because you can't have a proper meal or anything because there's nothing you can do about it. I mean, it's, that is so incorrect. That is not true. We can do something about it. We have a responsibility to do something about it. If we refuse them, they could go to appeal straight away. But as I say, an appeal is a very different beast. I've been to a, a, appeals where I thought, my little village doesn't have a cat in hell's chance. And actually, we've won against the big boys. Um, it all depends how you present your case, how determined you are. And I'm sure that you know, both sides um, you know, will present a proper case. Um, but I think it's for us today to refuse it. There's so much hanging on this. The quality of our life. And I mean, the, I don't, I don't the fear of God in me now if I lived in Longstanton or Oakington. I really would, um, of what might be coming. You know, we are blighting these properties. Because now, once this gets into the Cambridge Evening News, as it will this week, because they'll be listening, once it gets into the Cambridge News and all these stories of uh, uh, um, concerns about the flooding, um, all this, uh, not enough water, you'll all have to put a, a, a brick in your lavatory, you'll have to have a bath with a friend, you'll only be able to do it once a week. It'll all go in and they will think immediately, my God, I'll have a hell of a job selling my house because South Cam's District Council have blighted it. Now that isn't acceptable. This isn't a way that open, transparent, uh, decent government works. We are here for the people we represent. We're not here for the developers. We're not here for the water authorities. We are here first, foremost, and primarily for the people we represent and the quality of the life that we can or will not give them. It's up to you. Thank you very much. Um, we only have a few more speakers left, and I'm hoping we can move to a resolution on this. For what it's worth, I tend to agree. I don't think we should be deferring this today. I think we should be making a decision one way or the other. That's obviously my view, and it's up to the committee what we do on that. But I'm going to hear for the rest of the speakers, and I'm going to move that we conclude this. Uh, Councillor Wilson, please. Thank you. Um, this is probably going over the same, it's very similar ground, but um, the, the one thing that worries me is the evidence from the Swavesy IDB. Having, um, I, I've, I've, I, I've, I've worked with the um, Old West IDB and I know how much, how knowledgeable these people are and how much expertise goes into what they do. So have Anglian Water come back to us on, or any of the other statutory bodies come back on what the IDB concerns are? Uh, officers, can anyone respond on that? Um, I, it's probably helpful for um, Mr Ireland to, to, uh, from the Environment Agency, I think, to comment on that. All I can say is that the IDB referred to a letter from Anglian uh, to, from the Environment Agency um, uh, on this application in which it raised concerns from January 2021. Uh, as I said earlier, subsequent to that, we've had a letter from the Environment Agency that removes those concerns uh, and an impediment to development. But perhaps Mr. Okay, yeah. uh, Ireland can Mr. Comment. Ireland, if you could indulge us, please. 
Yes, certainly, as, uh, as, as mentioned earlier and was uh, mentioned by uh, Mr. Wildspin from um, uh, the Swayze IDB. Uh, yes, we, it was very much determined that it's going to be relevant to the, the discharge permit uh, and the total of 239 litres per second, which will be identified as the maximum um, uh, referred to as flow to full treatment in terms of the discharge from um, the Utton's Drove itself as well. So that will be a, a, a bespoke requirement of the permit, um, as will uh, an up-to-date um, uh, up flood risk assessment. And this will be in order for us to review um, the aforementioned land drainage solution. Uh, obviously, that's quite historic now, so we want uh, up-to-date information to inform ourselves relating to the specific discharge permit. Um, I can also let you know that we we are also dis, um, speaking separately with Anglian Water uh, in terms of ascertaining um, uh, the current number of homes connected to Utton's Drove, uh, what developments are planning to go there so we can build up a better picture um, relating to the timing uh, of when you know, we expect capacity to be reached there. That will also then inform Anglian Water um, when they produce their um, next asset management plan, um, uh, that will then inform them as to what they need to do in terms of looking at the longer term um, solutions. I think it was Councillor um, Councillor Williams that mentioned uh, something around the time scale relating relating to that. Um, so yes, the, in terms of the asset management planning, then the the design. Um, and, and construction, um, I'd suggest you'd be looking um, in the region of eight to ten years for a, that solution. Right, okay, thank you. I think that's answered the, the question. Um, Martin Kahn, please. I'd come back in. I'd like to first of all thank uh, uh, Mr. Kelly for the, advice, uh, the information he provided. I found that very helpful um, and I think it helped, has helped me rev review my position. Um, in terms of the, uh, the, the, the new development on, the, uh, on 3A, the, um, this will be done for a period of, I was interested to hear that for a period of, as the individual reserve matters applications come on, you can review what was being done, uh, uh, you'll be able to review what's being done and revise how you manage the, uh, the, 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 water, the groundwater. And I think that's, that's a great help um, because it also comes back to the whole position um, uh, of the uh, position regarding water supply. Uh, th this development will be implemented through a series of uh, reserve matters applications over a period uh, as it's phased. And, uh, <laughs> and Paul, can you please uh, stop interrupting? <laughs> um, no, I absolutely won't. So I, I think it's important to make it clear that we would be needing to look at uh, water supply as reserve matters come on uh, and some way I think it's important that if we the application is approved that that's made clear maybe simply through an advisory to say that as information becomes available um, the position of water supply may affect the phasing uh, and speed of the phasing of the development. Um, I, I say that with a bit of reservation because I remember for nearly 50 years ago when I was living in this area shortly. There was a problem with water supply in this area then. Water shortage is a, is a, is a persistent thing in this area because we get less rainfall in the east of England than, uh, and there was lots of talk about transferring water from the west to the east. There was talk about what they called the Great Conta Canal, which was going to bring water from the west or the, or the Pennines down to this area to supply water. So it is a problem uh, and it's not been resolved. Uh, so I am aware that there may still be a problem uh, during the duration of this. So I think we need to have something which says something about it. Uh, I realise that it's not our responsibility to supply that. You know, they say they're going to supply it. We have to take the statutory body's responsibility. But I think um, situations may change and we have to be aware of that. Um, in terms of sewage, the position regarding uh, the pumping stations and the two pumping stations, the total water produced by the two pumping stations will be the same, so the same the amount of water discharged into the ooze will be the same, whatever's happened, it may just be where it's actually discharged. The problem seems to me that 
the problem that was raised was a problem about the amount of discharge that they pumped into the river. Uh, and that is, a, that, that is a problem which the Journal Danish Board is worried about. The pumps are not large enough, for doing, uh, are not large enough to do more than a certain amount. That seems to be an argument between Anglian Water and the Internal Drainage Board, not between us and the Internal Drainage Board. And it's the, 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 they are worried about being able to pro provide the discharge that they require. Uh, uh, and the, that's an argument. Um, Anglian Water said they can do it. Uh, I don't really, on consideration, I'm not sure that we have a say in this. It's unfortunate. It is a concern, but it's not something that really we can do through the planning system. And I think I agree with that point. Um, so, uh, I, again, it's perhaps an advisory to, to note that there's a problem, but it's not something that we can resolve. Um. Okay, thank you for that. I have two more speakers now, and then I think we can probably finish. Councillor Richard Williams, please. I, I, I'm sorry, but, but, but with the greatest of respect, I don't think we can sit here and say we have an expert in the room who has told us there's a real problem here uh, the environment agency, I, I very much respect their view, but they're not the people on the ground, and I think it's fairly obvious from what we just heard that they don't have as detailed an understanding of this problem as the person who actually deals with it and is telling us this is a real problem. I don't think as a council we can just say, oh, it's nothing to do with us. We're just the local planning authority. We just granted permission for other 4,000 houses. Nothing to do with us. I, we could, what is the point of us? Yeah. These are material considerations. We do have a choice. Otherwise, as Councillor Roberts said, we might as well have packed up at five past ten this morning if we really have no choice about this planning application. These matters are material considerations. We can take a view on them, and we have an expert in the room, specifically on the point of the foul water drainage, telling us that there is a significant problem here and that we cannot be, on, on, on the expert's evidence, satisfied that this development can be approved in a way that doesn't have severely detrimental um, impacts on the environment for the foul water drainage reasons we've seen. As we are perfectly entitled to take the view, and as I do take the view, um, that you know, I'm not satisfied that the impacts on groundwater have been adequately dealt with. So, uh, you know, I, I, I respect the good faith of members to, to reach different views on this. Some of us may vote to approve, some of us may vote uh, to uh, re refuse. I will be voting to refuse. But I don't think we, we can do it on the basis that it's nothing to do with us. It's just an argument between two other agencies. We're just the local planning authority. It's not our job. It is our job, and we have to decide. I would respect decisions on either side, but I don't think we can pretend they're not decisions from, for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Harvey, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, well, first I'd like to thank, um, I think it was um, our officers for um, sort of flagging uh, condition 41, because I think that does give me some comfort um, that these problems are reviewed prior to each phase. And, and I, I guess addressing my sort of concern that um, you know, have several major developments who might be competing for a limited resource. I, I suppose um, those are also phased, um, and therefore there is an ongoing opportunity to um, reassess it. But could, could you just confirm that uh, in relation to um, condition 41, um, there is this assessment of capacity, not only for the subsequent phases, but also for the first phase, because I think Obviously, that would give a, a kind of more confidence that um, nothing will have changed between today and, and the next kind of step in the process, if you like, um, that we would have then had um, a, a reiteration of um, confidence from the Environment Agency that capacity exists uh, and backed up by the water. Just ask Mr. Kelly to come back in here. Thank you. The condition 41 is framed. Um, uh, the prior to the commencement of the development, so it would be expected to address the issues um, before anything happened uh, on any of the development parcels. Thank you. And Heather Williams, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was just going to say on the last uh, representation from EA, um, if I hadn't had my mask on, my mouth would have been wide open when you said eight to ten years. 
um, that put an element of panic, if I'm honest, in, in me, which has probably firmed my, my vote up now to a refusal, I'm afraid, whereas before I was weighing things up. Um, I just wanted to check if, just in case it is minded and members are collectively minded to refuse, Chair, just wanted to make sure we, we've discussed a lot about the environment, quite rightly so, and drainage and everything. But I do think that the scale parameter plans with the heights, that they really do need to, for me, that is equally a really big issue. And I, I think I've heard that it is for Councillor Hales as well, that that's an that's issue. So if I just seek, seek, seek reassurance that that's been noted, just as other issues may have dominated. It has indeed. I've got scale parameters, drainage and groundwater issues, and some others as well, but it has been noted. Okay, members, I don't have any more speakers, and I think we've had a very long, healthy debate on all of this now. Um, I think we are at the stage now when we do need to make a get to a resolution on this. Um, I've heard people say they're going to vote in favour, people vote against, some people have mooted a deferral. Um, as I said, my, my personal view would be that we should come to a decision on this. I don't think we should be deferring. Jeff, microphone, thank you. And, um, and I haven't heard anyone propose a deferral at this stage, so just... For fairness, I will offer that opportunity if anyone does think deferral is a good idea at this stage. No, okay, so we are going to come to a decision on this today, members. Um, it's probably wise if we go over any additional conditions or alterations to conditions should we approve and also the detailed reasons for refusal should we refuse as a committee. So I'm not sure how prepared officers are to, to go through those. If, if maybe if we start with the conditions, should we approve? Thank you, Chair. Obviously, there is a delegation to officers as part of the recommendation. Um, in the addendum sheet, uh, we uh, propose some uh, uh, an alteration that we've discussed previously to condition 39 um, to um, uh, bolster that and include provisions around uh, an agreed baseline. Um, we had the conversation around condition 42, uh, which uh, picked up on the discussions around construction management uh, routing. Uh, with your, uh, in the event that members are minded to support the recommendation, obviously the delegation is um, to uh, officers on that alongside the completion of the section 106. Mr. Reid identified the potential to introduce a construction management routing plan uh, into the section 106 agreement. Uh, and that may well mean that elements of condition 42 might fall away, particularly around that particular point. But I'd ask you to note that, uh, and the matter is um, delegated to uh, officers. The other um, uh, uh, adjustments to the conditions are contained, I believe, in the um, addendum sheet that was circulated, I think, yesterday. Um, I don't, haven't picked up... Uh, chair any others, save for Councillor Williams and Hale's comments around the parameter plan mm -hmm. uh, and the um, ambition that um, if commission, permission is granted, uh, that, uh, that um, uh, the matter of the two-storey dwellings uh, within that spur be uh, addressed by way of either a condition or um, uh, an adjustment to the, to the um, terms. Yeah, I think how I understood it was that um, I think members were minded should approval be granted that that particular spur that we spent some time looking at be restricted to only two storeys. That's how I understood it. Yeah, has that been captured by officers? Yeah, we've captured that. Yeah. Good, okay. Councillor Hawkins, have I missed something? Oh, just a quick one. I think um, there was talk about uh, the pump for uh, SWIFT's IDB because we're talking about Pumping station, a new pump. I must admit that one passed so me by. That's something that was um, taken note of. Have officers noted that? I said, I must admit that did pass by me. Thank you, Chair. There is, in the heads of terms, there is a contribution towards the pump at, um, at Web Sluice. That's the pump. That's the pump that texts. Right. Is that the one that you're talking about? There's, there's something in the heads of terms towards that. I don't think it was web sluice. No. No. I think I, I think if the con if, if the issue is about uh, a contribution towards Utton's Drove, um, 
I don't recall the details of that conversation, but certainly um, uh, that really is a matter for the water resource management plans of Anglian Water uh, and their capital program rather than uh, for this development on its own, um, having regard to um, the wider uh, feed-in and catchment for that facility. Timmy, do you want to come back? So it was just something that I, I, maybe I misheard, but <laughs> it's okay. Um, one thing I did pick up, actually, I think someone at some point did ask for um, provision to review the drainage scheme should approval be granted at regular intervals to make sure what would be impl implemented is working. Uh, I think there was a suggestion around the uh, water supply side. Yeah, um, my advice would be that I think that needs to be dealt with at a strategic level because effectively, uh, in really in line with the SIL regulations, it isn't just this development that draws from the aquifer, it's every single development in Cambridgeshire uh, or in Greater Cambridgeshire. Uh, and um, the local plan and the strategic level of the local plan is really the vehicle to introduce policies that may, for example, require staircasing in terms of implementation rather than a specific site. Because under the uh, effective, regardless of where you are in Greater Cambridge, each house has the same impact um, and it would be inappropriate to apply that to a single development, which is why I think the local plan and the strategic approach that we're recommending for that is the appropriate mechanism okay. for it. Thank you. Councillor Heather Williams. Um, yeah, I think maybe because we, we agreed it'd be an obligation, not a condition, but just to have it, I think we need to vote to put an obligation in um, in relation to, I was signalling driving um, and the traffic, sorry, my but that's what my hand signals were. Um, Sorry, I missed that. What was that? To do the APR and the monitoring of traffic through an obligation. But I think, do we need to vote on that to put that obligation on it? Uh, it's whether or not members accept. Okay, um, members, I think the Heather's trying to keep me on the straight and narrow here and remind me that we need to officially agree that should approval be granted, that um, conditions around the traffic monitoring um, be officially incorporated into um, into the obligation. Thank you very much. Um, are members generally in agreement with that? Agreed. Anyone not in agreement? Good. Okay. <laughs> members, I haven't jotted down any further conditions or alterations to conditions as we've been going through the debate. Have there been any that I've missed that members feel we should be including? No, I don't see. Sorry, Councillor Hales. Do we have the option of moving back the spur by a third? I think the question was, can we move the spur back by a third to move it further away from Oakington? The, the, the application um, uh, in front of you with the parameter plans isn't that doesn't propose that. There has been an amendment uh, in that. And because whilst we have spoken about uh, the potential uh, for reducing the height of the buildings, a change to the parameter plan uh, of that nature um, isn't something that I would suggest is appropriate to, to consider here. Okay. All right. Well, I think we've got the updated conditions should approval be granted, members. So we move on to reasons for refusal should committee refuse. Um, I'm hoping officers have been jotting down official terminology as we've been going through. I, th I think I think there are there are there are two fundamental policy issues that you've raised in terms of your concerns about uh, the development. The first relates to uh, the extent to which the development complies with policy CC7, um, which is around the quality of, of ground uh, water not being harmed. Uh, and clearly, um, that was an element of the, uh, of the concern. In terms of um, the precise wording, I think it's probably appropriate. I, I can't offer you an immediate um, uh, uh, form, but it clearly set pivots around um, the adverse effect of the development on groundwater quality uh, within the uh, locality and the failure to demonstrate satisfactorily that it would not be uh, impacted by the development. Um, the second um, uh, area of, of concern uh, appeared to be associated with a concern around the collateral effects of surcharging Utton's Drove with um, the uh, additional outputs from this site 
which would seem to um, offend policy CC9 um, in the way that it impacted uh, flood risks um, downstream from the Uttons Drove plant. Uh, and uh, again, um, uh, I think you would, it would be a straightforward reason uh, based upon uh, your belief in the adverse impact on flood risk associated with the unresolved uh, discharge uh, uh, through Uttons Drove, this quantum of development in association with other developments previously consented, including Camborne West, which was referred to and so on, uh, as a cumulative impact reason for refusal. Is that consistent? Sorry, I haven't got precise. I was listening to you all too intently to, to, to give you a precise form of wording, but that is my sense of the... Would it be possible to, to um, um, put into that? Um, this is, you know, uh, this is, is based on the, uh, you know, the professional expertise advice that we receive from the Internal Drainage Board. Uh, I, we, we, you are the planning authority making the decision, not the Drainage Board. Uh, and so it needs to be based on your plan. In the event that you were the inspector, if this was a matter that went to appeal, yes. would have the IDB's comments, the IDB could, could attend and make representations. Um, but the basis that you could um, uh, indicate your concern, despite the environment agency's satisfactory view of this, would be on the basis of what you have heard from the IDB. But I wouldn't be referencing the IDB and the reason for, for refusal. It's on the basis of your judgment on the application that is in front of you. What about the possibility that um, all these concerns are now, is, would this be a material reason? I don't suppose it will, but uh, would it be a material reason to say that actually um, to give approval with so many um, outstanding concerns uh, will be uh, possibility is that it is going to blight the area. Uh, I don't think that's a reason for refusal. It's a, it is something that reasons for refusal obviously need to be grounded in your local plan policies uh, and um, you do not have a policy on that. I think the re what we would seek to do is to explain in the reasons for refusal the concerns that have been addressed on groundwater and flood risk. And those are the elements of planning harm that the decision or the examination of the matter would need to pivot on rather than concepts of blight and so on, which are, um, uh, in a sense, less grounded in the policies of the plan. Jennifer, sorry, Chairman, if you'll just bear with me for a second. Maybe it's a question to Mr. Reid. If the members of the public, if this is approved this afternoon, and if members of the public hearing this feel that we have blighted their properties, um, and we're talking about a wide range of properties, North Stowe, as is now being built, and Oakington and uh, Longstanton as is, uh, would they have any recourse to law um, for being so blighted by this organisation, this authority? Stephen, I don't know if you have any thoughts. Um, I don't think they would have recourse against... Uh, for an action against local authority. Um, one, one final um, uh, concern that I did pick up was the scale parameters, i.e. Um, heights of, um, of buildings. Obviously, we have just, should we approve, we've decided to implement a condition to reduce them on the, on the edge, but obviously, if it, we were to refuse, that could be a reason for refusal. Again, that's one I'm hoping officers can vocalise for us. Uh, yes, we could we could comment on that. I, I, I mean, my my only advice to you in terms of uh, a planning appeal is that as a reason for refusal, given that every single reason must be it, it, developments and decisions must stand on every yes, reason. Yes, I've got my focus. Um, yes, that reason for refusal, I suspect, is going to be extraordinarily difficult oh. for you to justify, given that the patterns of development in the surrounding villages comprise two and three storey dwellings. Uh, and it isn't something that I suspect uh, we would be able to convincingly sustain. Uh, that exposes you to a 
matter of potential costs in pursuing that reason, but it's a, it's a matter for you as the committee. Our advice as officers is that I think we would find it extraordinarily difficult to defend an appeal on that reason. Councillor Williams. Thank you. I'm happy to, to take that advice because obviously the other impact, you know, reasons for refusal are strong. But in the past, we've been told that if one reason was to fail on appeal, that you'd still have another. Can I just check that is correct? So if the, if the scale didn't, but one other did, or vice versa, then it's not, you don't have to get all of them right. <laughs> sure. So if the sense. scale falls down, are the others strong enough to still refuse? So, so uh, obviously we discussed the uh, relative strength of, the, of, the, of these um, three matters for a large part of today. Um, you're quite right. Um, the appeal, if there is one, would be contested against all three of your reasons, subject to the advice of any barrister. But um, the uh, and if a reason falls uh, or is not able to be contested, of course the other uh, reasons uh, still stand. However, the requirement as a planning authority is that we justify every reason. And you are open to um, uh, claims of costs on the basis of unreasonable behaviour if you cannot substantiate every reason. And so partial awards of costs, for example, uh, have been uh, given to local authorities who, for example, when they get to the appeal, realise they are not able to justify the reason, every single reason for refusal, uh, because there is seen to be unreasonable behaviour in that respect. But of course, if, if ultimately another reason fell away, um, there are three reasons that we have touched upon here. Uh, each one uh, would, would remain, even if one of them was struck out. You just risk um, costs in that, in that okay. space. Councillor Williams? Yeah, I was just going to say, because for, for me, the heights on those edges are, are really important to the sort of quality of life for the existing residents there. Um, so I'd be inclined to... Actually, I think it, it could be defended on, on those grounds, I would, you would hope. Um, but, um, but, yeah, I think I'd, I'd rather have more, more reasons than fewer. Sure, OK, so you're proposing to include that as a reason for refusal? Yeah, I think yeah. so. OK, members, we're going to have to decide this as a committee. So can I ask members, um, how do we do this? Do, are members inclined to include that or does anyone not want to? OK. I'll tell you what, Aaron, we're going to go to a vote, please. Can we, we're going to have to vote on whether to include this as a reason for refusal because we haven't got unanimity. So, members, we're going to have an electronic vote now on the keypads. We're deciding whether to include scale parameters, i.e. building heights, as a reason for refusal. Should we refuse? If you wish to include it, press green. If you don't wish to include it, press red. And, of course, you have the option to abstain as well. We're missing two. So sorry, press the blue button to register and then one of the colours dependent on your preference. One more to go. Okay, so that is it. Everyone's vote is six votes in favour, five votes against. So we will include that as a reason for refusal should, that, should we vote as a committee to refuse. Thank you. Okay, members, I think we're at that, that point in the day uh, when we can now make a decision on this. We've, we've um, rehearsed the, the additional conditions, should we approve, and we've rehearsed the, the reasons for refusal, should we refuse. So members, we're going to go straight back to the keypads, please. Aaron? If you could set up another vote. So, members, we are now voting on whether to agree with the officer's recommendation of approval. If you are in agreement, vote green. If you're not, vote red. And, of course, everyone can abstain. One more person needs to register. Press the blue button first and then the, then the colour. No? Oh, there we go. We're there. So, members, everyone has voted. You can see the results on the screen. Eight votes in favour, three votes against. So that application is approved. Mm -hmm. 
Members, it's four o'clock. I fear we shouldn't really, we're not going to get through the next application, I'm afraid. Um, I was going to confer with. Members, I think, I mean, I'll put it to you, but I don't think we have any option other than to defer the second item as we have no, it's four o'clock now, we're not going to have enough time to do this one justice. So, I mean, I'm proposing that we defer the second item, item five, which is phase 3B of North Stowe, um, until, until we reconvene at a later date to decide it. Members? Can we do next week, Chairman? <laughs> we're going to be not, 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 not sure. I mean, I'm sure we can thrash out the detail, but um, I think in theory, um, everyone's shouting at me one sec. I don't think we're going to get through it in an hour, honestly. No. I think we have to finish in a reasonable time. Um, so, members, I'm going to put that to you that we defer to a later date. Obviously, as soon as we can get it in the diary, we will. So, I'm going to put that forward. Can someone second that, please? Yes, it, absolutely. Abs absolutely. Okay, so that's been seconded. Members, are we in agreement that we defer the second item? A anyone against? No? Okay, so that second item is deferred. And we now come to the end of the meeting, members. Thank you very much for your patience and for all those who have contributed outside of the committee. It's been very helpful. Um, so we will now close the meeting at five minutes past four. Thank you, everyone.